Section 1 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Villines. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. The Great Explorers and Travelers of the 19th Century by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 1. The Dawn of a Century of Discovery. 1. Slackness of Discovery During the Struggles of the Republic and Empire. Seetzen's Voyages in Syria and Palestine. How ran in the Circumnavigation of the Dead Sea. Decapolis. Journey in Arabia. Burkhart in Syria. Expeditions in Nubia upon the two branches of the Nile. Pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina. The English in India. Web at the source of the Ganges. Narrative of a journey in the Punjab. Christie and Pottinger in Sindh. The same explorers crossed Baluchistan into Persia. Elphinstone in Afghanistan. Persia, according to Gardane, A. Dupre, Maurier, MacDonald Kinnear, Price, and Owsley. Guldenstadt and Klaproth in the Caucasus. Lewis and Clark in the Rocky Mountains. Raffles in Sumatra and Java. A sensible diminution in geographical discovery marks the close of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th centuries. We have already noticed the organization of the expeditions sent in search of La Perouse by the French Republic and also Captain Baudin's important crews along the Australian coasts. These are the only instances in which the unrestrained passions and fratricidal struggles of the French nation allowed the government to exhibit interest in geography, a science which is especially favored by the French. At a later period, Bonaparte consulted several savants and distinguished artists, and the materials for that grand undertaking which first gave an idea, incomplete though it was, of the ancient civilization of the land of the pharaohs were collected together. But when Bonaparte had completely given place to Napoleon, the egotistical monarch, sacrificing all else to his ruling passion for war, would no longer listen to explorations, voyages, or possible discoveries. They represented money and men stolen from him, and his expenditure of those materials was far too great to allow of such futile waste. This was clearly shown when he ceded the last remnants of French colonial rule in America to the United States for a few millions. Happily, other nations were not oppressed by the same iron hand. Absorbed, although they might be, in their struggle with France, they could still find volunteers to extend the range of geographical science, to establish archaeology upon scientific bases, and to prosecute linguistic and ethnographical enterprise. The learned geographer Malta Brunn in an article published by him in the Nouvelle Annale des Voyages in 1817, gives a minute account of the condition of French geographical knowledge at the beginning of the 19th century, and of the many desiderata of that science. He reviews the progress already made in navigation, astronomy, and languages. The India Company, far from concealing its discoveries, as jealousy had induced the Hudson Bay Company to do, founded academies, published memoirs, and encouraged travelers. War itself was utilized, for the French army gathered a store of precious material in Egypt. We shall shortly see how emulation spread among the various nations. From the commencement of the century, one country has taken the lead in great discoveries. German explorers have worked so earnestly and have proved themselves possessed of will so strong and instinct so sure that they have left little for their successors to do beyond verifying and completing their discoveries. The first in order of time was Ulrich Jasper Seetzen, born in 1767 in East Friesland. He completed his education at Göttingen and published some essays upon statistics and the natural sciences for which he had a natural inclination. These publications attracted the attention of the government, and he was appointed outlook counselor in the province of Tver. Seetzen's ambition, like that of Burckhardt subsequently, was an expedition to Central Africa. 
but he wished previously to make an exploration of Palestine and Syria, to which country's attention was shortly to be directed by the Palestine Association, founded in London in 1805. Seetzen did not wait for this period, but in 1802 set out for Constantinople, furnished with suitable introductions. Although many pilgrims and travelers had successfully visited the Holy Land in Syria, the vaguest notions about these countries prevailed. Their physical geography was not determined, details were wanting, and certain regions, as for example, the Lebanon and the Dead Sea, had never been explored. Comparative geography did not exist. It has taken the unwearied efforts of the English Association and the science of travelers in connection with it to erect that study into a science. Seetzen, whose studies had been various, found himself admirably prepared to explore a country which, often visited, was still in reality new. Having traveled through Anatolia, Seetzen reached Aleppo in May 1802. He remained there a year, devoting himself to the practical study of the Arabic tongue, making extracts from Eastern historians and geographers, verifying the astronomical position of Aleppo, prosecuting his investigations into natural history, collecting manuscripts, and translating many of those popular songs and legends which are such valuable aids to the knowledge of a nation. Seetzen left Aleppo in 1805 for Damascus. His first expedition led him across the provinces of Hauran and Jalun, situated to the southeast of that town. No traveler had as yet visited these two provinces, which in the days of Roman dominion had played an important part in the history of the Jews, under the names of Auronitis and Gaulonitis. Seetzen was the first to give an idea of their geography. The enterprising traveler explored the Lebanon and Baalbek. He prosecuted his discoveries south of Damascus and entered Judea, exploring the eastern portion of Hermon, the Jordan, and the Dead Sea. This was the dwelling place of those races well known to us in Jewish history, the Ammonites, Moabites, and Gileadites. At the time of the Roman conquest, the western portion of this country was known as Perea, and was the center of the celebrated Decapolis, or Confederacy of Ten Cities. No modern traveler had visited these regions, a fact sufficient to induce Seetzen to begin his exploration with them. His friends at Damascus had tried to dissuade him from the journey by picturing the difficulties and danger of a route frequented by Bedouins, but nothing could stay him. Before visiting the Decapolis region and investigating the condition of its ruins, Seetzen traversed a small district named Ladsha, which bore a bad reputation at Damascus on account of the Bedouins who occupied it, but which was said to contain remarkable antiquities. Leaving Damascus on the 12th of December, 1805, with an Armenian guide who misled him from the first, Seetzen, having prudently provided himself with a passport from the Pasha, proceeded from village to village, escorted by an armed attendant. In a narrative published in the earlier Annal de Voyage, says the traveler, That portion of Lacha which I have seen is, like Hauran, entirely formed of basalt, often very porous, and in many districts forming vast stony deserts. The villages, which are mostly in ruins, are built on the sides of the rocks. The black color of the basalt, the ruined houses, the churches and towers fallen into decay, with the total dearth of trees and verdure, combine to give a somber aspect to this country, which strikes one almost with dread. In almost every village are either Grecian inscriptions, columns, or other remnants of antiquity. Amongst others, I copied an inscription of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Here, as in Hauran, the doors were of basalt. Seetzen had scarcely arrived at the village of Gerasa and enjoyed a brief rest before he was surrounded by half a score of mounted men, who said they had come by order of the vice-governor of Hauran to arrest him. Their master, Omar Aga, having learned that the traveler had been seen in the country the preceding year, and imagining his passports to be forgeries, had sent them to bring him before him. Resistance was useless. Without allowing himself to be disconcerted by an incident which he regarded as a simple contretemps, Seetzen proceeded in the direction of Hauran, 
where after a day and a half's journey he met with Omar Aga, traveling with the Mecca caravan. The travelers, having received a hearty welcome, departed on the morrow, but meeting upon his way with many troops of Arabs, upon whom his demeanor imposed respect, he came to the conclusion that it had been Omar Aga's intention to have him robbed. Returning to Damascus, Seetzen had great trouble in finding a guide who would accompany him in his expedition along the eastern shore of the Jordan and around the Dead Sea. At last, a certain Yusuf al-Milki, a member of the Greek church who for some thirty years had carried on traffic with the Arab tribes and traveled in the provinces which Seetzen desired to visit, agreed to bear him company. The two travelers left Damascus on the 19th of January, 1806. Seetzen's entire baggage consisted of a few clothes, some indispensable books, paper for drying plants, and an assortment of drugs necessary to sustain his assumed character as a physician. He wore the dress of a sheik of second rank. The districts of Rashaya and Hasbaya, at the foot of Mount Hermon, whose summit at the time was hidden by snow, were the first explored by Seetzen for the reason that they were the least known in Syria. He then visited Acha, a village inhabited by the Druzes, upon the opposite side of the mountain. Rashaya, the residence of the Emir, and Hasbaya, where he paid a visit to the Greek bishop of Zur, or Zeta, to whom he carried letters of recommendation. The object which chiefly attracted his attention in this mountainous district was an asphalt mine, whose produce is there used to protect the vines from insects. Leaving Hasbaya, Seetzen proceeded to Benias, the ancient Cassera Philippi, which is now a mere collection of huts. Even if traces of its fortifications were discoverable, not the smallest remains could be found of the splendid temple erected by Herod in honor of Augustus. Ancient authorities hold that the river of Benias is the source of the Jordan, but in reality that title belongs to the river Hasbani, which forms the larger branch of the Jordan. Seetzen recognized it, as he also did the Lake of Meron, or the ancient Semachonitis. Here he was deserted by his muleteers, whom nothing could induce to accompany him so far as the bridge of Yisr Banat Yakub, and also by his guide Yusuf, whom he was forced to send by the open road to await his arrival at Tiberias, while he himself proceeded on foot toward the celebrated bridge, accompanied by a single Arab attendant. He, however, found no one at Yisr Banat Yakub who was willing to accompany him along the eastern shore of the Jordan, until a native, believing him to be a doctor, begged him to go and see his sheik, who was suffering from ophthalmia, and who lived upon the eastern bank of the Lake of Tiberias. Seetzen gladly availed himself of this opportunity, and it was well he did so, for he was thus enabled to study the Lake of Tiberias and also the Wadi Zimak at his leisure. Not, however, without risk of being robbed and murdered by his guide. Finally, he reached Tiberias, called by the Arabs Tabaria, where he found Yusuf, who had been waiting for him for several days. The town of Tiberias, says Seetzen, is situated upon the lake of the same name. Upon the land side, it is surrounded by a good wall of cut basalt rock, but nevertheless, it scarcely deserves to be called a town. No trace of its earlier splendor remains, but the ruins of the more ancient city, which extended to the Thermae, a league to the eastward, are recognizable. The famous Jizar Pasha caused a bath to be erected above the principal spring. If these baths were in Europe, they would rival all those now existing. The valley in which the lake is situated is so sheltered and so warm that dates, lemon trees, oranges, and indigo flourish there, whilst on the high ground surrounding it, the products of more temperate climates might be grown. Southwest of the lake are the remains of the ancient city of Tarkea. There, between two mountain chains, lies the beautiful plain of El Gore, poorly cultivated and overrun by Arab hordes. No incident of moment marked Seetzen's journey to Decapolis, 
during which he was obliged to dress as a mendicant to escape the rapacity of the native tribes. Over my shirt, he relates, I wore an old kambas, or dressing gown, and above that a woman's ragged chemise. My head was covered with rags, and my feet with old sandals. I was protected from cold and wet by an old ragged abaje, which I wore across my shoulders, and a stick cut from a tree served me as a staff. My guide, who was a Greek Christian, was dressed much in the same style, and together we scoured the country for some ten days, often hindered in our journey by chilling rains which wetted us to the skin. For my part, I traveled an entire day in the mud with bare feet, because I could not wear my sandals upon sodden ground. Dra, which he reached a little further on, presented but a mass of desert ruins, and no trace of the monuments which rendered it famous in earlier days were visible. El Botan, the next district, contains hundreds of caverns hewn in the rocks which were occupied by the ancient inhabitants. It was much the same at Seetzen's visit. That Mkes was formerly a rich and important city is proved by its many ruined tombs and monuments. Seetzen identified it with Gadara, one of the minor towns of the Decapolis. Some leagues beyond are the ruins of Abil, or Abila. Seetzen's guide, Aoser, refused to go there, being afraid of the Arabs. The traveler was, therefore, obliged to go alone. This town, he says, is entirely in ruins and abandoned. Not a single building remains, but its ancient splendor is sufficiently proved by ruins. Traces of the old fortifications remain, and also many pillars and arches of marble, basalt, and granite. Beyond the walls, I found a great number of pillars. Two of them were of an extraordinary size. Hence, I concluded that a large temple had formerly existed there. On leaving El Botan, Seetzen entered the district of Edshlun and speedily discovered the important ruins of Jirash, which may be compared with those of Palmyra and Baalbek. It is difficult to conjecture, says Seetzen, how this town, which was formerly so celebrated, has hitherto escaped the attention of antiquarians. It is situated in an open plain, which is fertile, and watered by a river. Several tombs with fine boss reliefs arrested my attention before I entered it. Upon one of them I remarked a Greek inscription. The walls, which were of cut marble, are entirely crumbled away, but their length over three quarters of a league is still discernible. No private house has been preserved but I remarked several public buildings of fine architectural design. I found two magnificent amphitheaters constructed of solid marble, the columns, niches, etc., in good condition, a few palaces, and three temples, one of the latter having a peristyle of twelve large Corinthian pillars, of which eleven were still erect. In one of these temples I found a fallen column of the finest polished Egyptian granite. Beside these, I found one of the city gates, formed of three arches, and ornamented with pilasters, in good preservation. The finest of the remains is a street adorned throughout its length with Corinthian columns on either side, and terminating in a semicircle, which was surrounded by sixty Ionic columns, all of the choicest marble. This street was crossed by another, and at the junction of the two, Large pedestals of wrought stone occupied each angle. Probably in former times these bore statues. Much of the pavement was constructed of hewn stone. Altogether I counted nearly two hundred columns, still in a fair state of preservation. But the number of these is far exceeded by those which have fallen into decay, for I saw only half the extent of the town and in all probability the other half beyond this was also rich in remarkable relics. From Seetzen's description, Jirash would appear to be identical with the ancient Gerasa, a town which up to that time had been erroneously placed on the maps. 
the traveler crossed Gerka, the Jabok of Jewish history, which forms the northern boundary of the country of the Ammonites, and penetrated into the district of El Belka, formerly a flourishing country, but which he found uncultivated and barren, with but one small town, Zalt, formerly known as Amathus. Afterwards, Seetzen visited Amman, a town which, under the name of Philadelphia, is renowned among the Decapolitan cities, and where many antiquities are to be found. Elal, an ancient city of the Amorites, Madaba, called Madba in the time of Moses, Mount Nebo, Diban, Karak, the country of the Moabites, and the ruins of Rabbah, Rabbath, anciently the royal residence. After much fatigue, he reached the region situated at the southern extremity of the Dead Sea, named Gor es Sophia. The heat was extreme and great salt plains, where no watercourses exist, had to be crossed. Upon the 6th of April, Seetzen arrived in Bethlehem, and soon afterwards at Jerusalem, having suffered greatly from thirst, but having passed through most interesting countries, hitherto unvisited by any modern traveler. He also collected much valuable information respecting the nature of the waters of the Dead Sea, refuted many false notions, corrected mistakes upon the most carefully constructed maps, identified several sites of the ancient Perea, and established the existence of numberless ruins, which bore witness to the prosperity of all this region under the sway of the Roman Empire. Upon the 25th of June, 1806, Seetzen left Jerusalem and returned to St. Jean d'Arc by sea. In an article in the Revue Germanique for 1858, Monsieur Venin speaks of his expedition as a veritable journey of discovery. Seetzen, however, was unwilling to leave his discoveries incomplete. Ten months later, he again visited the Dead Sea, and added largely to his observations. From thence he proceeded to Cairo, where he remained for two years, and bought a large portion of the Oriental manuscripts which now enrich the library of Gotha. He collected many facts about the interior of the country, choosing instinctively those only which could be amply substantiated. Seetzen, with his insatiable thirst for discovery, could not remain long in repose, far removed from idleness though it was. In April 1809, he finally left the capital of Egypt and directed his course towards Suez and the peninsula of Sinai, which he resolved to explore before proceeding to Arabia. At this time, Arabia was a little-known country, frequented only by merchants trading in mocha coffee beans. Before Niebuhr's time, no scientific expedition for the study of the geography of the country or the manners and customs of the inhabitants had been organized. This expedition owed its formation to Professor Michaelis, who was anxious to obtain information which would throw light on certain passages in the Bible, and its expenses were defrayed by the generosity of King Frederick V of Denmark. It comprised von Hahnen, the mathematician, Forskall, the naturalist, a physician named Kramer, Brarenfeind, the painter, and Niebuhr, the engineer, a company of learned and scientific men who thoroughly fulfilled all expectations founded upon their reputations. In the course of two years, from 1762 to 1764, they visited Egypt, Mount Sinai, Jeddah, landed at Lohea, and advancing into Arabia Felix, explored the country in accordance with the specialty of each man. But the enterprising travelers succumbed to illness and fatigue, and Niebuhr alone survived to utilize the observations made by himself and his companions. His work on the subject is an inexhaustible treasury, which may be drawn upon in our day with advantage. Seetzen, therefore, had much to achieve to eclipse the fame of his predecessor. He omitted no means of doing so. After publicly professing the faith of Islam, he embarked at Suez for Mecca, and hoped to enter that city disguised as a pilgrim. Tor and Jeddah were the places visited by him before he traveled to the holy city of Mecca. 
he was much impressed by the wealth of the faithful and the peculiar characteristics of that city, which lives for and by the Mohammedan cultus. I was seized, says the traveler, with an emotion which I have never experienced elsewhere. It is alike unnecessary to dwell upon this portion of the voyage and upon that relating to the excursion to Medina. Burckhardt's narrative gives a precise and trustworthy account of those holy places, and besides, there remain of Seetzen's works only the extracts published in Les Annales des Voyages and in the correspondence of the Baron de Zach. The Journal of Seetzen's Travels was published in German, and in a very incomplete manner, only in 1858. The traveler returned from Medina to Mecca, and devoted himself to a secret study of the town, with its religious ceremonies, and to taking astronomical observations, which determined the position of the capital of Islam. Seetzen returned to Jeddah on the 23rd of March, 1810. He then re-embarked, with the Arab who had been his guide to Mecca, for Hodaida, which is one of the principal ports of Yemen. Passing the mountainous district of Bayath el Faki, where coffee is cultivated, after a month's delay at Duran on account of illness, Seetzen entered Sana, the capital of Yemen, which he calls the most beautiful city of the East, on the 2nd of June. Upon the 22nd of July, he reached Aden, and in November he was at Mecca, whence the last letters received from him are dated. Upon re-entering Yemen, he, like Nibur, was robbed of his collection and baggage upon the pretext that he collected animals in order to compose a filter with the intention of poisoning the springs. Seetzen, however, would not quietly submit to be robbed. He started at once for Sana, intending to lay a complaint before the imam. This was in December 1811. A few days later, news of his sudden death arrived at Taus and the tidings soon reached the ears of the Europeans who frequented the Arabian ports. It is little to the purpose now to inquire upon whom the responsibility of this death rests, whether upon the Iman or upon those who had plundered the traveler, but we may well regret that so thorough an explorer, already familiar with the habits and customs of the Arabs, was unable to continue his explorations and that the greater portion of his diaries and observations have been entirely lost. Seetzen, says Monsieur Vivien de Saint-Martin, was the first traveler since Ludovico Barthema, 1503, who visited Mecca, and before his time no European had even seen the holy city of Medina, consecrated by the tomb of the prophet. From these remarks we gather how invaluable the trustworthy narrative of this disinterested and well-informed traveler would have been. Just as an untimely death ended Seetzen's self-imposed mission, Burckhardt set out upon a similar enterprise, and like him commenced his long and minute exploration of Arabia by preliminary travel through Syria. It is seldom in the history of science, says Monsieur Vivien de Saint-Martin, that we see two men of such merit succeed each other in the same career, or rather continue it. For in reality, Burckhardt followed up the traces Seetzen had opened out, and, seconded for a considerable time by favorable circumstances which enabled him to prosecute his explorations, he was enabled to add very considerably to the known discoveries of his predecessor. End of section one. Section 2 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Velines. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. The Great Explorers and Travelers of the 19th Century by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 1. The Dawn of a Century of Discovery, 2. Although John Lewis Burckhardt was not English, for he was a native of Lausanne, he must nonetheless be classed among the travelers of Great Britain. It was owing to his relations with Sir Joseph Banks, the naturalist who had accompanied Cook, and Hamilton, the secretary of the African Association, who gave him ready and valuable support, 
that Burkhart was enabled to accomplish what he did. Burkhart was a deeply learned man. He had passed through the universities of Leipzig and Göttingen, where he attended Blumenbach's lectures, and afterwards through Cambridge, where he studied Arabic. He started for the East in 1809. To inure himself of the hardships of a traveler's life, he imposed long fasts upon himself, accustomed himself to endure thirst, and chose the pavements of London or dusty roads for a resting place. But how trifling were these experiences in comparison with those involved in an apostolate of science. Leaving London for Syria, where he hoped to perfect his knowledge of Arabic, Burkhart intended to proceed to Cairo and to reach Fazan by the route formerly opened up by Horniman. Once arrived in that country, circumstances must determine his future course. Burkhart, having taken the name of Ibrahim ibn Abdallah, intended to pass as an Indian Muslim. In order to carry out this disguise, he had recourse to many expedients. In an obituary notice of him in the Annal de Voyage, it is related that when unexpectedly called upon to speak the Indian language, he immediately had recourse to German. An Italian dragoman, suspecting him of being a Gaior, pulled him by his beard, and thereby offering him the greatest insult possible in his character of Mussulman. But Burkhardt had so thoroughly entered into the spirit of his role that he responded by a vigorous blow, which, sending the unfortunate dragoman spinning to a distance, turned the laugh against him, and thoroughly convinced the bystanders of the sincerity of the traveler. Burkhart remained at Aleppo from September 1809 to February 1812, pursuing his studies of Syrian manners and customs, and of the language of the country, but with one interruption, a six-month's excursion to Damascus, Palmyra, and the Hauran, a country which had hitherto been visited by Seetzen only. It is related that during an excursion into Gore, a district north of Aleppo, upon the shores of the Euphrates, the traveler was robbed of his baggage and stripped of his clothes by a band of robbers. When nothing remained to him but his trousers, the wife of a chief who had not received her share of the spoil wished to relieve him of even those indispensable garments. The Revue Germanique says, We owe a great deal of information to these excursions, respecting a country of which we had only crude notions, gained from Seetzen's incomplete communications. Burkhardt's power of close observation detected a number of interesting facts, even in well-known districts, which had escaped the notice of other travelers. These materials were published by Colonel Martin William Leake, himself a geographer, a man of learning, and a distinguished traveler. Burkhardt had seen Palmyra and Baalbek, the slopes of Lebanon and the valley of the Orontes, Lake Hula, and the sources of the Jordan. He had discovered many ancient sites, and his observations had led especially to the discovery of the site of the far-famed Apamea, although both he and his publisher were mistaken in their application of the data obtained. His excursions in the Aronitis were equally rich, even though coming after Seetzen's, in those geographical and archaeological details which represent the actual condition of a country and throw a light upon the comparative geography of every age. Leaving Damascus in 1813, Burkhardt visited the Dead Sea, the Valley of Aqaba, and the ancient port of Askengatr, districts which in our own day are traversed by parties of English, with their Murray, Cook, or Boudicca in their hands, but which then were only to be visited at the risk of life. In a lateral valley, the traveler came upon the ruins of Petra, the ancient capital of Arabia Petraea. At the end of the year, Burkhardt was at Cairo. Judging it best not to join the caravan, which was just starting for Fazan, he felt a great inclination to visit Nubia, a country rich in attractions for the historian, geographer, and archaeologist. Nubia, the cradle of Egyptian civilization, had only been visited, since the days of the Portuguese Alvares, by Ponset and Lenoir du Roule, both Frenchmen, at the close of the 17th century. At the opening of the 18th, by Bruce, whose narrative had so often been doubted, and by Norden, who had not penetrated beyond Durr. In 1813, Burkhardt explored Nubia proper, including Mahas and Kimajur. This expedition cost him only 42 francs, a very paltry sum in comparison with the price involved in the smallest attempt at an African journey in our own day. But we must not forget that Burkhardt was content to live upon millet seed, 
and that his entire cortege consisted of two dromedaries. Two Englishmen, Mr. Legg and Mr. Smelt, were traveling in the country at the same time, scattering gold and presents as they passed, and thus rendering the visits of their successors costly. Burkhardt crossed the cataracts of the Nile. A little farther on, says the narrative, near a place called Jebel Lamoul, the Arab guides practice a curious extortion. This is their plan of proceeding. They halt, descend from their camels, and arrange a little heap of sand and pebbles in imitation of a Nubian tomb. This they call preparing the grave for the traveler, and follow up the demonstration by an imperious demand for money. Burkhart, having watched his guide commence this operation, began quietly to imitate him, and then said, Here is thy grave. As we are brothers, it is but fair that we should be buried together. The Arab could not help laughing. Both graves were simultaneously destroyed, and remounting the camels, the cavalcade proceeded, better friends than before. The Arab quoted a saying from the Koran, No human being knows in what spot of the earth he will find his grave. Burkhart had hoped to get as far as Dingola, but was obliged to rest satisfied with collecting information about the country and the Mamelukes, who had taken refuge there after the massacre of their army by order of the Viceroy of Egypt. The attention of the traveler was frequently directed to the ruins of temples and ancient cities, than which none are more curious than those of Izambul. The temple on the banks of the Nile is approached by an avenue flanked by six colossal figures, which measure six feet and a half from the ground to the knees. They are representations of Isis and Osiris in various attitudes. The sides and capitals of the pillars are covered with paintings or hieroglyphic carvings in which Burkhart thought a very ancient style was to be traced. All these are hewn out of the rock, and the faces appear to have been painted yellow with black hair. Two hundred yards from this temple are the ruins of a still larger monument consisting of four enormous figures so deeply buried in the sand that it is impossible to say whether they are in a standing or sitting posture. These descriptions of antiquities, which in our own day are accurately known by drawings and photographs, have, however, little value for us, and are merely interesting as indicating the state of the ruins when Burkhardt visited them, and enabling us to judge how far the depredations of the Arabs have since changed them. Burkhardt's first excursion was limited to the borders of the Nile, a narrow space made up of little valleys, which debouched into the river. The traveler estimated the population of the country at 100,000, distributed over a surface of fertile land 450 miles in length by a quarter of a mile in width. The men, says the narrative, are as a rule muscular, rather shorter than the Egyptians, having little beard or mustache usually merely a pointed beard under the chin. They have a pleasant expression, are superior to the Egyptians in courage and intelligence, and naturally inquisitive. They are not thieves. They occasionally pick up a fortune by a dint of hard work, but they have little enterprise. Women share the same physical advantages, are pretty as a rule, and well made. Their appearance is gentle and pleasing, and they are modest in behavior. Monsieur Denon has underrated the Nubians, but it must not be forgotten that their physique varies in different districts. Where there is much land to cultivate, they are well developed, but in districts where arable land is a mere strip, the people diminish in vigor and are sometimes walking skeletons. The whole country groaned under the yoke of the Kashefs, who were descendants of the commander of the Bosniaks, and paid only a small annual tribute to Egypt which, however, was sufficient to serve as a pretext for oppressing the unfortunate Fellahin. Burkhardt cites a curious example of the insolence with which the Kashefs behaved. Hassan Kashef, he says, was in need of barley for his horses. Accompanied by his slaves, he walked into the fields, and there he met the owner of a fine plot of barley. How badly you cultivate your land, said he. Here you plant barley in a field where you might have reaped an excellent crop of watermelons of double the value. See, here are some melon seeds, offering a handful to the peasant proprietor. Sow your field with these, and you, slaves, tear up this bad barley and bring it to me. In March 1814, after a short rest, Burkhart undertook a fresh exploration, not this time of the banks of the Nile, but of the Nubian desert. 
justly conceiving poverty to be his surest safeguard, he dismissed his servant, sold his camel, and contenting himself with one ass, joined a caravan of poor traders. The caravan started from Doral, a village inhabited partly by fellahs and partly by Ababda Arabs. The traveler had good reason to complain of the former, not because they recognized him as a European, but because they imagined him to be a Syrian Turk, come to share the commerce and slaves of which they had the monopoly. It would be useless to enumerate the names of the bridges, hills, and valleys in this desert. We will rather summarize the traveler's report of the physical aspect of the country. Bruce, who had explored it, paints it in two gloomy colors, and exaggerates the difficulties of the route. If Burkhart is to be credited, the country is less barren than that between Aleppo and Baghdad, or Damascus and Medina. The Nubian desert is not merely a plain of sand, where nothing interrupts the dreary monotony. It is interspersed with rocks, some not less than 300 feet in height, and shaded by thickets of acacias, or date trees. The shelter of these trees is, however, unavailing against the vertical rays of the sun, which explains an Arabic proverb, rely upon the favor of the great and the shade of an acacia. At Ankhera, or Wadi Berber, the caravan reached the Nile, after passing Shigra, one of the best mountain springs. One danger only is to be feared in crossing the desert, that of finding the wells at Nedjayim dry and unless the traveler should lose his way, which, however, with trustworthy guides is a little likely to happen, no serious obstacle arises. It would appear, therefore, that the sufferings experienced by Bruce must have been greatly exaggerated, although the narrative of the Scotch traveler is generally trustworthy. The natives of the province of Berber appear to be identical with the Barbarians of Bruce, the Barabas, mentioned by Danville, and the Bararas, spoken of by Ponset. They are a well-made race, and different in feature from the Negroes. They maintain their purity of descent by marrying only with the women of their own or of kindred tribes. Curious as is the picture Burkhart draws of the character and manners of this tribe, it is not at all edifying. It would be difficult to convey an idea of the corruption and degradation of the Berbers. The little town of Wadi Berber, a commercial center, the rendezvous for caravans, and a depot for slaves, is a regular resort of banditti. Burkhardt, who had trusted to the protection of the merchants of Darao, found that he had made a great mistake in doing so. They sought every means of plundering him, chased him out of their company, and forced him to seek refuge with the guides and donkey drivers, who cordially welcomed him. Upon the 10th of April, a fine was levied upon the caravan by the Mech of Damer, which lies a little south of the tributary Magran, called Mareb by Bruce. This is a well-kept and cleanly fakir village, which contrasts agreeably with the ruins and filth of Berber. The fakirs give themselves up to the practices of sorcery, magic, and charlatanism. One of them, it is said, could even make a lamb bleat in the stomach of the man who had stolen and eaten it. These ignorant people have entire faith in such fables, and it must be reluctantly admitted that the fact contributes not a little to the peace of the town and the prosperity of the country. From Damer, Burkhart proceeded to Shendi, where he passed a month, during which time no one suspected him to be an infidel. Shendi had grown in importance since Bruce's visit, and now consisted of about a thousand homes. Considerable trade was carried on grass, slaves, and cattle taking the place of specie. The principal marketable commodities were gum, ivory, gold, and ostrich feathers. According to Burkhart, the number of slaves sold yearly at Shindy amounts to 5,000. 2,500 of these are for Arabia, 400 for Egypt, 1,000 for Dongola and the districts of the Red Sea. The traveler employed his time during his stay at Sennar in collecting information about that kingdom. Amongst other curious things, he was told that the king, having one day invited the ambassador of Mehmet Ali to a cavalry review, which he considered rather formidable, the envoy in his turn begged the king to witness part of the Turkish artillery exercises. But at the outset of the performance, at the discharge of two small mounted guns, 
cavalry, infantry, spectators, courtiers, and the king himself fled in terror. Burkhart sold his wares and then, worn out by the persecutions of the Egyptian merchants who were his companions, he joined the caravan at Swakin, intending to traverse the unknown district between that town and Shindi. From Swakin he meant to set out for Mecca, hoping to find the Haji useful to him in the realization of his projects. The Haji, he says, form one powerful body, and every member is protected, because if one is attacked, the whole number take up arms. The caravan which Burkhart now joined consisted of 150 merchants and 300 slaves. 200 camels were employed to convey heavy bales of Danmur, a stuff manufactured in Sennar, and cargoes of tobacco. The first object of interest to the travelers was the Atbara, a tributary of the Nile, whose banks, with their verdant trees, were grateful to the eye after the sandy desert. The course of the river was followed as far as the fertile district of Taka. During the journey, the white skin of the pretended Sheikh Ibrahim, it will be remembered that this was the name assumed by Burkhart, attracted much attention from the female population, who were little accustomed to the sight of Arabs. One day, relates the traveler, a girl of the country, of whom I had been buying onions, offered to give me an extra quantity if I would remove my turban and show her my head. I demanded eight more onions, which she immediately produced. As I removed my turban and exposed my white and close-shaven head to view, she sprang back in horror and dismay. I asked her jokingly if she would not like a husband with a similar head, to which she replied with much energy and many expressions of disgust that she would prefer the ugliest slave ever brought from Darfur. Just before Gaz Raja was reached, Burkhardt's attention was attracted to a building, which he was told was either a church or temple, the same word having the two meanings. He at once proceeded in that direction, hoping to examine it, but his companions stopped him, saying, It is surrounded by bands of robbers. You cannot go a hundred steps without danger of attack. Burkhardt was unable to decide whether it was an Egyptian temple or a monument of the empire of Aksum. At last the caravan entered the fertile district of Tak, or El Gash, a wide watered plain, whose soil is wonderfully fertile, but which for two months in the year is uninhabited. Grain is plentiful and is sold in Jeddah for 20%, more than the best Egyptian millet. The inhabitants, who are called Hadadonia, are treacherous, dishonest, and bloodthirsty, and their women are almost as degraded as those of Shindi and Berber. Upon leaving Taka, the road to Swakin and the shores of the Red Sea lay over a chain of chalk hills. At Shintarab, granite is found. The hills presented few difficulties, and the caravan reached Swakin in safety upon the 26th of May. But Burkhardt's troubles were not yet at an end. The Amir and Aga combined to plunder him, and treated him as the lowest of slaves, until he produced the firman which he had received from Mehmet Ali and Ibrahim Pasha. This changed the face of affairs. Instead of being thrown into prison, the traveler was invited to the Agas, who offered him a present of a young slave. Monsieur Vivienne de Saint-Martin writes of this expedition, This journey of from 20 to 25 days between the Nile and the Red Sea was the first ever undertaken by a European. The observations collected as to the settled or nomad tribes of these districts are invaluable for Europe. Burkhardt's narrative is of increasing interest, and few can compare with it for instruction and interest. End of section two. Section three of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. The Great Explorers and Travelers of the 19th Century, by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 1. The Dawn of a Century of Discovery, Part 3. Upon the 7th of July, Burkhard succeeded in embarking in a boat, and eleven days later he reached Jeddah, which serves as a harbor to Mecca. 
Jeddah is built upon the seashore, and is surrounded by a wall, which, insufficient as it would be against artillery, protects it perfectly from the attacks of the Wahhabis, who have been nicknamed the Puritans of Islamism. These people are a distinct sect, who claim to restore Mahomedanism to its primitive simplicity. The entrance to the town upon the site nearest the sea, says Burkhardt, is protected by a battery, which overlooks the entire fort, and is surmounted by one enormous piece of artillery, capable of discharging a five-hundred-pound shot, which is so renowned throughout the Arabian Gulf, that its reputation alone is enough to protect Jeddah. The greatest drawback to this city is its want of fresh water, which is brought from small wells two miles distant. Without gardens, vegetables, or date trees, Jeddah, in spite of its population of twelve or fifteen thousand, a number which is doubled in the pilgrimage season, presents a strange appearance. The population is the reverse of autochthonous. It is composed of natives of Hadramut and Yemen, Indians from Surat and Bombay, and Malays, who come as pilgrims and settle in the town. Burkhardt introduces many anecdotes of interest into his account of the manners, mode of living, price of commodities, and number of traders in the place. Speaking of the singular customs of the natives of Jeddah, he says, It is the almost universal custom for everybody to swallow a cup full of ghee or melted butter in the morning. After this they take coffee, which they regard as a strong tonic and they are so accustomed to this habit from their earliest years that they feel greatly inconvenienced if they discontinue it the higher classes are satisfied with drinking the cup of butter but the lower classes add another half cup which they draw up through the nostrils imagining that they thus prevent bad air entering the body by those apertures the traveller left jeddah for taif on the twenty fourth of august the road winds over mountains and across valleys of romantic beauty and luxuriant verdure. Burkhardt was taken for an English spy at Taif, and although he was well received by the Pasha, he had no liberty, and could not carry on his observations. Taif, it appears, is famous for the beauty of its gardens. Roses and grapes are sent from it into all the districts of Hejaz. This town had a considerable trade, and was very prosperous before it was plundered by the Wahhabis. The surveillance to which he was subjected hastened Burkhardt's departure, and upon the 7th of September he started for Mecca. Well versed in the study of the Koran, and acquainted with all the practices of Islamism, he was prepared to act the part of a pilgrim. His first care was to dress himself in accordance with the law prescribed for the faithful who enter Mecca, in the iram, or pieces of cloth without seam, one covering the loins, the other thrown over the neck and shoulders. The pilgrim's first duty is to proceed to the temple, without waiting even to procure a lodging. This Burkhardt did not fail to do, observing at the same time the rites and ceremonies prescribed in such cases, of which he gives many interesting particulars. We cannot, however, dwell upon them here. Mecca, says Burkhardt, may be called a pretty town. As a rule, the streets are wider than in most eastern cities. The houses are lofty and built of stone, and its numerous windows, opening upon the street, give it a more cheerful and European aspect than the cities of Egypt and Syria, whose dwellings generally have few windows on the outside. Every house has a terrace built of stone, and sloping in such a way as to allow water to run down the gutters into the street. Low walls with parapets conceal these terraces for as everywhere else in the east it is not thought right for a man to appear there he would be accused of spying upon the women who spent much of their time upon the terrace of the house engaged in domestic work drying corn hanging out linen etc the only public place in the city is the large court of the grand mosque trees are rare not a garden enlivens the view and the scene depends for animation upon the well-stocked shops which abound during the pilgrimage with the exception of four or five large houses belonging to the administration, two colleges, which have since been converted into warehouses for corn, and the mosque with the few buildings and colleges connected with it, Mecca can boast of no public buildings, and cannot compete in this respect with other cities in the east of the same size. The streets are unpaved, and as drains are unknown, water collects in puddles, and the accumulation of mud is inconceivable. For a water supply the natives trust to heaven, catching the rain in cisterns. 
for that obtained from the wells is so foul that it is impossible to drink it in the centre of the town where the valley widens a little the mosque known as beitullah or el haram is situated this edifice owes its fame to the kaaba which is enclosed in it for other eastern towns can boast a mosque equally large and more beautiful el haram is situated in an oblong space surrounded on the eastern side by a quadruple colonnade and by a triple one on the other the columns are connected by pointed arches upon each four stand little domes constructed of mortar and whitened outside some of these columns are of white marble granite or porphyry but the greater part are of the common stone found among the mountains of mecca the kaaba has been so often ruined and restored that no trace of a remote antiquity remains it was in existence before this mosque was built the traveller says the kaaba is placed upon an inclined base some two feet high and its roof being flat it presents the appearance at a little distance of a perfect cube the only door by which it can be entered and which is opened two or three times a year is on the north side about seven feet above the ground for which reason one cannot enter except by means of a wooden staircase the famous black stone is enshrined at the northeastern corner of the kaaba near the door and forms one of the angles of the building four or five feet above the floor of the court it is difficult to ascertain the exact nature of this stone as its surface has been completely worn and reduced to its present condition by the kisses and worshipping touches bestowed upon it by countless millions of pilgrims the kaaba is entirely covered with black silk which envelops its sides leaving the roof exposed this veil or curtain is called the kesua and is renewed yearly during the pilgrimage it is brought from cairo where it is manufactured at the expense of the viceroy up to the time of burckhardt no such detailed account of mecca and her sanctuary had been given to the world for this reason we shall insert extracts from the original narrative extracts which might indeed be multiplied for they include circumstantial accounts of the sacred well called zemzem water from which is considered as an infallible remedy for every complaint the traveller speaks also of the gate of salvation or the makam ibrahim a monument containing the stone upon which abraham sat when he was engaged in building the kaaba and where the marks of his knees may still be seen and of all the buildings enclosed within the temple precincts judging from burckhardt's minute and complete description these spots still retain their former physiognomy the same number of pilgrims chant the same songs the men only are no longer the same his accounts of the feast of the pilgrimage and the holy enthusiasm of the faithful are followed by a picture which brings before us in the most sombre colours the effects of this great gathering of men attracted from every part of the world the termination of the pilgrimage he says lends a very different aspect to the mosque illness and death consequent upon the great fatigues undergone during the voyage are accelerated by the scanty covering afforded by the ihram the unhealthy dwellings of mecca the bad food and the frequent absolute dearth of provisions the temple is filled with corpses brought thither to receive the prayers of the iman or with sick persons who insist upon being carried as their last hours approach to the colonnade hoping to be saved by the sight of the kaaba or in any case to have the consolation of expiring within the sacred precincts one sees poor pilgrims sinking under illness and hunger dragging their weary bodies along the colonnade and when they no longer have the strength to stretch out a hand to the passer-by they place a little jar beside the mat upon which they are laid to receive what charity may bestow upon them as they feel the last moment approach they cover themselves with their ragged clothes and very often a day passes before it is ascertained that they are dead we will conclude our extracts from burckhardt's account of mecca with his opinion of the inhabitants although the natives of mecca possess grand qualities although they are pleasant hospitable cheerful and proud they openly transgress the koran by drinking gambling and smoking deceit and perjury are no longer looked upon as crimes by them they do not ignore the scandal such vices bring upon them but while each individually exclaims against the corruption of manners none reform themselves 
Upon the 15th of January, 1815, Burckhardt left Mecca with a caravan of pilgrims on their way to visit the tomb of the Prophet. The journey to Medina, like that between Mecca and Jeddah, was accomplished at night, and afforded little opportunity for observation. In the winter, night travelling is less comfortable than travelling by day. A valley called Wadi Fatme, but generally known as El Wadi, was crossed. It abounded in shrubs and date trees, and was well cultivated in the eastern portion. A little beyond it lies the valley of Es Safra, the market of the neighboring tribes, and celebrated for its plantations of dates. The traveller relates that the groves of date trees extend for nearly four miles, and belong to the natives of Safra, as well as to the Bedouins of the neighbourhood, who employ labourers to water the ground, and come themselves to reap the harvest. The date trees pass from one person to another in the course of trade. They are sold separately. A father often receives three date trees as the price of the daughter he gives in marriage. They are all planted in deep sand brought from the middle of the valley, and piled up over their roots. They ought to be renewed every year, and they are generally swept away by the torrents. Each little plot is surrounded by a wall of mud or stone, and the cultivators live in hamlets or isolated cabins among the trees. The principal stream flows through a grove near the market. Beside it rises a little mosque, shaded by large chestnuts. I had seen none before in the Hajjas. Burkhardt was thirteen days in reaching Medina, but this rather long journey was not lost time to him. He collected much information about the Arabs and the Wahhabis. At Medina, as at Mecca, the pilgrim's first duty is to visit the tomb and mosque of Mahomet. But the ceremonies attending the visit are much easier and shorter, and the traveller performs them in a quarter of an hour. Burkhardt's stay at Mecca had already been prejudicial to him. At Medina he was attacked by intermittent fever, which increased in violence and was accompanied by violent sickness. This soon so reduced him that he could no longer rise from his carpet without the assistance of his slave, a poor fellow who by nature and habit was more fit to tend camels than to take care of his worn-out and enfeebled master. Burkhardt being detained at Medina for more than three months by a fever, due to bad climate, the detestable quality of the water, and the prevalence of infectious illnesses, was forced to relinquish his project of crossing the desert to Akaba, in order to reach Yanibo as quickly as possible, and from thence embarked for Egypt. Next to Aleppo, he says, Medina is the best-built town I have seen in the east. It is entirely of stone, the houses being generally three stories high, with flat tops. As they are not whitewashed, and the stone is brown in colour, the streets, which are very narrow, have usually a sombre appearance. They are often only two or three paces wide. At the present time Medina looks desolate enough. The houses are falling into ruins. Their owners, who formerly derived a considerable profit from the inroads of pilgrims, find their revenues diminishing, as the Wahhabis forbid visitors to the tomb of the Prophet, alleging that he was but a mere mortal. The possession which places Medina on a par with Mecca is the Grand Mosque, containing the tomb of Mahomed. This is smaller than that at Mecca, but is built upon the same plan, in a large square courtyard, surrounded on all sides by covered galleries, and having a small building in the centre. The famous tomb, surrounded by an iron railing, painted green, is near the eastern corner. It is of good workmanship, in imitation of filigree, and interlaced with inscriptions in copper. Four doors, of which three lead into this enclosure, are kept constantly shut. Permission to enter is freely accorded to persons of rank. Others can purchase permission of the principal eunuchs, for about fifteen piasters. In the interior are hangings which surround the tomb, and are only a few feet from it. According to the historian of Medina, these hangings cover a square edifice, built of black stones, and supported upon two columns, in the interior of which are the sepulchres of Mahomet and his two eldest disciples, Abu Bekr and Omar. He also states that these sepulchres are deep holes, and that the coffin which contains the ashes of Mahomet is covered with silver, and surmounted by a marble slab with the inscription, In the name of God give him thy pity. 
the fables which were spread throughout europe as to the tomb of the prophet being suspended in mid-air are unknown in the hejaz the mosque was robbed of a great part of its treasures by the wahhabis but there is some ground for believing that they had been forestalled by the successive guardians of the tomb many other interesting details of medina and its inhabitants surroundings and the haunts of the pilgrims are to be found in burkhardt's narrative but we have given sufficient extracts to induce the reader who desires further information respecting the manners and customs of the arabs which have not changed to refer to the book itself upon the twenty first of april eighteen fifteen burkhardt joined a caravan which conducted him to yembo where the plague was raging the traveller at once fell ill and became so weak that it was impossible for him to resort to a country place to embark was equally impossible all the vessels which were ready to start were crowded with soldiers he was compelled to remain eighteen days in the unhealthy little town before he could obtain a passage in a small vessel which took him to kosair and thence to egypt upon his return to cairo burckhardt heard of his father's death the traveller's constitution had been sorely tried by illness and he was unable to attempt the ascent of mount sinai until eighteen sixteen the study of natural history the publication of his diary and his correspondence occupied him until eighteen seventeen at which time he expected to go with a caravan to fezan unfortunately he succumbed to a sudden attack of fever his last words being write and tell my mother that my last thought was of her burckhardt was an accomplished traveller well informed exact to minuteness patient courageous and endowed with an upright and energetic character his writings are of great value the narrative of his voyage in arabia of which he unfortunately could not explore the interior is so complete and precise that owing to it that country was then better known than many in europe in writing to his father from cairo on the thirteenth of march eighteen seventeen he says i have never said a word about what i had seen and met with that my conscience did not entirely justify i did not expose myself to so much danger in order to write a romance the explorers who have succeeded him in the same countries unanimously testify to his exactness and agree in praising his fidelity knowledge and sagacity few travellers says the revue germanique have enjoyed in a like degree of faculty of observation this is a rare gift of nature like all eminent qualities he possessed a sort of intuition which discerned the truth apart from his own observations and thus information given by him from hearsay has a value that seldom attaches to statements of that nature his mind early ripened by reflection and study he was but in his thirty-third year at the time of his death invariably went straight to the point his narrative always sober is filled one may say rather with things than words yet his narrative possesses infinite charm one admires the men in them as much as the savant and observer End of section three. Section four of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume Three the great explorers and travellers of the nineteenth century by jules verne first part chapter one the dawn of a century of discovery four while the biblical countries occupied the attention of zetzen and burckhardt india the birthplace of most of the european languages was about to command the attention of students of language literature and religion as well as of geography for the present our concern is with those problems of physical geography which the conquests and studies of the india company were about to solve by degrees in the preceding volume we have related how the portuguese rule was established in india the union of portugal with spain in fifteen ninety nine led to the fall of the portuguese colonies which came into the possession of the english and the dutch england soon afterwards granted a monopoly of the commerce of india to a company which was destined to play an important part in history 
at this time akbar the great mogul emperor the seventh descendant of timur length had established a vast empire in hindustan and bengal upon the ruins of rajput kingdoms owing to the personal qualities of akbar which had gained for him the surname of the benefactor of men that empire was at the height of its glory the same brilliant course was pursued by shah jahan but akbar's grandson aurungzeb inspired by an insatiable ambition assassinated his brothers imprisoned his father and seized the reins of government while the mogul empire was in the enjoyment of profound peace a clever adventurer laid the foundations of the maratta empire the religious intolerance of aurungzeb and his crafty policy led to the insurrection of the rajputs and a struggle which by draining the resources of the empire shook his power the death of the great usurper was followed by the decadence of the empire up to this period the india company had been unable to add to the narrow strip of territory which they possessed at the ports but it was now to benefit by the conflict between the nabobs and rajas of hindustan it was not however until after the taking of madras in seventeen forty six by la bourdonnais and the struggle against duplay that the influence and dominion of the english company was materially increased the crafty policy of clive and hastings the english governors who successively employed force stratagem and bribery to attain their ends laid the foundations of british greatness in india and at the close of the last century the company were possessors of an immense extent of country with no less than sixty millions of inhabitants their territory included bengal behar the provinces of benares madras and the sirkars tipu Saib alone the sultan of mysore struggled against the english encroachments but he was unable to hold out against the coalition formed against him by the skill of colonel wellesley when rid of their formidable enemies the company overcame such opposition as remained by pensions and under the pretext of protection imposed upon the rajas an english garrison which was maintained at their expense one would imagine from all this that the english rule was detested but that is not the case the company recognizing the rights of individuals did not attempt to change the religion laws or customs of their subjects neither is it surprising that travellers even when they ventured into the districts which properly speaking did not belong to great britain incurred but little danger in fact so soon as the east india company was free from political embarrassment it encouraged explorers throughout its vast domains at the same time travellers were dispatched to the neighbouring territories to collect observations and we propose rapidly to review those expeditions one of the first and most curious was that of webb to the sources of ganges a river concerning which uncertain and contradictory opinions prevailed the government of bengal recognising the great importance of the ganges in the interest of commerce organised an expedition of which messieurs webb roper and hearsay formed part they were to be accompanied by sepoys native servants and interpreters the expedition reached herdwar a small village on the left of the river upon the first of april eighteen o eight the situation of this village at the entrance of the fertile plains of hindustan had caused it to be much frequented by pilgrims and it was at this spot that purifications in the waters of the holy river took place during the hot season as every pilgrimage implies the safe of relics herdwar was the centre of an important market where horses camels antimony asafetida dried fruits shawls arrows muslins cotton and woollen goods from the punjab kabulistan and kashmir were to be had slaves too were to be bought there from three to thirty years of age at prices varying from ten to one hundred and fifty rupees this fair where such different races languages and costumes were to be met with presented a curious spectacle upon the twelfth of april the english expedition set out to gangautri following a road planted with white mulberries and figs as far as burondar a little farther on water-mills of simple construction were at work upon the banks of streams shaded with willows and raspberry trees the soil was fertile but the tyranny of the government prevented the natives from making the best of it the route soon became mountainous but peach apricot nuts and other european trees abounded and at length the expedition found themselves in the midst of a chain of mountains which appeared to belong to the himalaya range 
the bagirati which is known further on as the ganges was met with at the end of a pass to the left the river is bounded by high almost barren mountains to the right stretches a fertile valley at the village of chiavili the poppy is largely cultivated for the preparation of opium here owing probably to the bad quality of the water all the peasants suffer from whence at josvara the travellers had to cross a bridge of rope called a jorila this was a strange and perilous structure on either side of the river says webb two strong poles are driven in at a distance of two feet from each other and across them is placed another piece of wood to this is attached a dozen or more thick ropes which are held down upon the ground by large heaps of wood they are divided into two packets about a foot apart below hangs a ladder of rope knotted to one of these which answers instead of a parapet the flooring of the bridge is composed of small branches of trees placed at intervals of two and a half or three feet from each other as these are generally slender they seem as if they were on the point of breaking every moment which naturally induces the traveller to depend upon the support of the ropes which form the parapet and to keep them constantly under their arms the first step taken upon so shaky a structure is sufficient to cause giddiness for the action of walking makes it swing to either side and the noise of the torrent over which it is suspended is not reassuring moreover the bridge is so narrow that if two persons meet upon it one must draw completely to the side to make room for the other the expedition afterwards passed through the town of baharat where but few of the houses have been rebuilt since the earthquake of eighteen o three this locality has always enjoyed a certain importance from the fact that a market is held there and also on account of the difficulty of obtaining provisions in the towns higher up as well as from its central position the routes to jemauhi kedar nat and sirinagur all meet there beyond bateri the road became so bad that the travellers were obliged to abandon their baggage there was a mere path track by the edge of precipices amid debris of stones and rocks and the attempt to proceed was soon relinquished deva prayaga is situated at the junction of the bagirati and the aluknanda the first coming from the north hurries along with noise and impetuosity the second broader deeper and more tranquil rises no less than forty-six feet above its ordinary level in its rainy season the junction of these two rivers forms the ganges and is a sacred spot from which the brahmins draw considerable profit as they have arranged pools there where for a certain price pilgrims can perform their ablutions without danger of being carried away by the current the aluknanda was crossed by means of a running bridge or dindla which is thus described this bridge consists of three or four large ropes fixed upon either bank and upon these a small seat some eighteen inches square is slung by means of hoops at either end upon this seat the traveller takes his place and is drawn from one side of the river to the other by a rope pulled by the men upon the opposite bank the expedition reached sirinagur upon the thirteenth of may the curiosity of the inhabitants had been so much excited that the magistrates sent a message to the english begging them to march through the town sirinagur which had been visited by colonel hardwick in seventeen ninety six had been almost completely destroyed by the earthquake of eighteen o three and had in the same year been conquered by the gorkalis here webb was joined by the emissaries whom he had sent to the gangautri by the route which he himself had been unable to follow and who had visited the source of the ganges a large rock he says on either side of which water flows and which is very shallow roughly resembles the body and mouth of a cow a cavity at one end of its surface gave rise to its name of gaomoki the mouth of the cow who by its fancied resemblance is popularly supposed to vomit the water of the sacred river a little farther on advance is impossible a mountain as steep as a wall rises in front the ganges appeared to issue from the snow which lay at its feet the valley terminated here no one has ever gone any further the expedition returned by a different route it met with the tributaries of the ganges and of the keliganga or mandakni rivers rising in the mountains of kerdar 
immense flocks of goats and sheep laden with grain were met with numbers of defiles crossed and after passing the towns of badrinat and mana the expedition finally reached the cascade of barson in the midst of heavy snow and intense cold this says webb's narrative is the goal of the devotions of the pilgrims some of them come here to be sprinkled by the sacred spray of the cascade at this spot the course of the aluknanda may be traced as far as the southwestern extremity of the valley but its source is hidden under heaps of snow which have probably been accumulating for centuries webb furnishes some details respecting the women of mana they wore necklaces earrings and gold and silver ornaments which were scarcely in keeping with their coarse attire some of the children wore necklaces and bracelets of silver to the value of six hundred rupees in winter this town which does a great trade with tibet is completely buried in snow and the natives take refuge in neighboring towns the expedition visited the temple of badrinath which is far famed for its sanctity neither its internal nor external structure or appearance give any idea of the immense sums which are expended upon it it is one of the oldest and most venerated sanctuaries of india ablutions are performed there in reservoirs fed with very warm sulphurous water there are says the narrative a great number of hot springs each having their special name and virtue and from all of them doubtless the brahmins derive profit for this reason the poor pilgrim as he gets through the requisite ablutions finds his purse diminish with the number of his sins and the many tolls exacted from him upon the road to paradise might induce him to consider the narrow way by no means the least expensive one this temple possesses seven hundred villages which have either been ceded to it by government given as security for loans or bought by private individuals and given as offerings the expedition reached josima on the first of june there the brahmin who acted as guide received orders from the government of nepal to conduct the travellers back immediately to the territories of the company the government had discovered a little late it must be admitted that the english explorations had a political as well as geographical significance a month afterwards webb and his companions entered delhi having definitely settled the course of the ganges and ascertained the sources of the bagirati and aluknanda in fact having attained the object which the company had had in view End of section four. Section five of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume Three: The Great Explorers and Travelers of the Nineteenth Century by Jules Verne. First Part. Chapter One, The Dawn of a Century of Discovery. Five. In eighteen o eight, the English government decided upon sending a new mission to the Punjab, then under the dominion of Runjit Singh. The anonymous narrative of this expedition, published in the Annales de Voyage, offers some particulars of interest, from which we will extract a few. Upon the sixth of April, eighteen o eight, an English officer in charge of the expedition reached Herdonai which he represents as the rendezvous of a million individuals at the time of the yearly fair. At Borai, which is situated between Jumna and the Setlej, the traveller was an object of much curiosity to the women, who begged permission to come and see him. Their looks and gestures, says the narrative, sufficiently express their surprise. They approached me laughing heartily, the colour of my face amused them extremely, they addressed many questions to me, asking me whether I never wore a hat, whether I exposed my face to the sun, whether I remained continually shut up, or only walked out under shelter, and whether I slept on the table placed in my tent, although my bed occupied one side of it. The curtains were, however, closed. Then they examined it in detail, together with the lining of my tent and everything belonging to it. These women were all good-looking, with mild and regular features. Their complexion was olive, and contrasted agreeably with their white and even teeth, which are a distinguishing feature of all the inhabitants of the Punjab. Mustafabad, Molana, and Umbala were visited in succession by the British officer. The country through which he passed was inhabited by Sikhs, a race remarkable for benevolence, hospitality, and truthfulness. 
The author of the narrative is of opinion that they are the finest race of men in India, Putiala, Mekionara, Fagonara, Udamita, which Lord Lake entered in 1805, in his pursuit of a Maratha chief, and finally Amristur were stages easily passed. Amristur is better built than the generality of towns in Hindustan. It is the largest depot of shawls and saffron, as well as other articles of Deccan merchandise. The traveller says, Upon the 14th, having put white shoes on my feet, I paid a visit to the Amristur, or reservoir, of the elixir of immortality from whence the city derives its name. It is a reservoir of about 135 feet square, built of brick, and in the centre is a pretty temple dedicated to Gurugovind Singh. A footpath leads to it. It is decorated both within and without, and the Raja often adds to its stores by gifts of ornaments. In this sacred receptacle, the Book of the Laws, written by Goran, in the Goran Muktis character, is placed. This temple is called Hermendel, or the Dwelling of God. Some six hundred priests are attached to its service, and comfortable dwellings are provided for them out of the voluntary contributions of the devotees who visit the temple. Although the priests are regarded with infinite respect, they are not absolutely free from vice. When they have money, they spend it as freely as they have gained it. The number of pretty women who daily repair to the temple is very great. They far excel the women of the inferior classes in Hindustan in the elegance of their manners, their fine proportions, and handsome features. Lahore was next visited by the officer. It is interesting to know what remained of that fine city at the commencement of the present century. The narrative says, Its very high walls are ornamented externally with all the profusion of eastern taste, but they are falling into ruins, as are also the mosques and houses inside the town. Time has laid its destructive hand upon this city, as upon Delhi and Agra. The ruins of Lahore are already as extensive as those of that ancient capital. Three days after his arrival, the traveller was received with great politeness by Runjit Singh, who conversed with him principally upon military topics. The Raja was then twenty-seven years of age. His countenance would have been pleasant had not the smallpox deprived him of one eye. His manners were simple, affable, and yet kingly. After paying visits to the tomb of Shah Jihan, to the Shalamar, and other monuments at Lahore, the officer returned to Delhi and the possessions of the company. To his visit was due that better knowledge of the country which could not fail to tempt the ambition of the English government. The following year, 1809, an embassy, consisting of Messrs. Nicholas Hankey Smith, Henry Ellis, Robert Taylor, and Henry Pottinger, was sent to the emirs of Sinda. The escort was commanded by Captain Charles Christie. The mission was transported to Karachi by boat. The governor of that fort refused to allow the embassy to disembark without instructions from the emirs. An interchange of correspondence ensued, as a result of which the envoy, Smith, drew attention to certain improprieties related to the title and respective rank of the governor-general and the emirs. The governor excused himself upon the ground of his ignorance of the Persian language, and said that not wishing a case of misunderstanding to exist, he was quite ready to kill or put out the eyes, as the envoy pleased, of the person who had written the letter. This declaration appeared sufficient to the English, who depreciated the execution of the guilty person. In their letters the emirs affected a tone of contemptuous superiority. At the same time they brought a body of eight thousand men within reach, and put every possible difficulty in the way of the English efforts to procure information. After tedious negotiations, in the course of which British pride was humbled more than once, the embassy received permission to start for Hyderabad. Above Karachi, which is the principal export harbour of Sindh, a vast plain without trees or vegetation exists along the coast. Five days are necessary to cross this and reach Tata, the ancient capital of Sindh, then ruined and deserted. Formerly it was brought into communication by means of canals, with the Sindh an immense river, which is, at its mouth, in reality an arm of the sea. Pottinger collected the most precise, complete, and useful details respecting the Sindh, which were then known. It had been arranged beforehand that the embassy should find a plausible excuse for separating and reaching Hyderabad by two different routes, in order to obtain geographical information on the country. The city was soon reached, and the same difficult negotiations about the reception of the embassy 
who refused to submit to the humiliating exactions of the emirs, had to be gone through. Pottinger thus describes the arrival at Hyderabad. The precipice upon which the eastern façade of the fortress of Hyderabad is situated, the roofs of the houses, and even the fortifications, were thronged by a multitude of both sexes, who testified friendly feeling towards us by acclamation and applause. Upon reaching the palace, where they were to dismount, the English were met by Uli Muhammad Khan and other eminent officers, who walked before us towards a covered platform, at the extremity of which the emirs were seated. This platform being covered with the richest Persian carpet, we took off our shoes. From the moment the envoy took the first step towards the princes, they all three rose and remained standing until he reached the place pointed out to him, an embroidered cloth, which distinguished him from the rest of the embassy. The princes addressed to each of us polite questions respecting our health. As it was a purely ceremonial reception, everything went off well, with compliments and polite expressions. The emirs wore a great number of precious stones, in addition to those which ornamented the hilts and scabbards of their swords and daggers, and emeralds and rubies of extraordinary size shone at their girdles. They were seated according to age, the eldest in the center, the second to his right, the youngest on the left. A carpet of light felt covered the entire circle, and over this was a mattress of silk about an inch thick, exactly large enough to accommodate the three princes. The narrative concludes with a description of Hyderabad, a fortress which would have scarcely been able to offer any resistance to a European enemy, and with various reflections upon the nature of the embassy, which had, amongst other aims, the closing of the entrance of the Sindh against the French. The treaty concluded, the English returned to Bombay. By this expedition, the East India Company gained a better knowledge of one of the neighboring kingdoms, and collected precious documents relating to the resources and productions of a country traversed by an immense river, the Indus of the Ancients, which rises in the Himalayas, and might readily serve to transport the products of an immense territory. The end gained was perhaps rather political than geographical, but science profited, once more, by political needs. Hitherto, the little knowledge that had been gained of the regions lying between Kabulistan, India, and Persia had been as incomplete as it was defective. The company, thoroughly satisfied with the manner in which Captain Christie and Lieutenant Pottinger had accomplished their embassy, resolved to confide to them a delicate and difficult mission. They were to rejoin General Malcolm, ambassador to Persia, by crossing Baluchistan, and in so doing to collect more accurate and precise details of that vast extent of country than had hitherto been acquired. It was useless to think of crossing Baluchistan with its fanatic population, in European dress. Christian Pottinger, therefore, had recourse to a Hindu merchant, who provided horses on behalf of the governments of Madras and Bombay, and accredited them as his agents to Kalat, the capital of Baluchistan. Upon the 2nd of January, 1810, the two officers embarked at Bombay for Somini, the sole seaport of the province of Lhasa, which they reached after a stay at Porbunder, on the coast of Guzarat. The entire country traversed by the travellers before they arrived at Bela was a morass interspersed with jungle. The Jam, or governor of that town, was an intelligent man. He put numerous questions to the English, by which he showed a desire to learn, and then confided the task of conducting the travellers to Kalat, to the chief of the tribe, a Bizenjos, who are Baluchis. The climate had changed since they left Bombay and in the mountains, Pottinger and Christie experienced cold sufficiently keen to freeze the water in the leather bottles. Kilat, says Pottinger, the capital of the whole of Baluchistan, whence it derives its name, Kilat, or the city, is situated upon a height to the west of a well-cultivated plain or valley, eight miles long and three wide. The greater portion of this is laid out in gardens. The town forms a square, it is surrounded on three sides by a mud wall about twenty feet high, flanked at distances of two hundred and fifty feet by bastions, which, like the walls, are pierced with a large number of barbicans for musketry. I had no opportunity of visiting the interior of the palace, but it consisted merely of a confused mass of mud buildings with flat roofs like terraces. The whole is defended by low walls, furnished with parapets and pierced with barbicans, there are about 2,500 houses in the town, and nearly half as many in the suburbs. They are built of half-baked bricks and wood, the whole smeared over with mud. The streets, as a rule, are larger than those in towns inhabited by Asiatics. They usually have a raised footway on either side for pedestrians, 
in the centre an open stream, which is rendered very unpleasant by the filth and rubbish thrown into it, and by the stagnant rainwater which collects, for there is no regulation insisting upon it being cleaned. Another obstacle to the cleanliness and comfort of the town exists in the projection of the upper stories of the houses, which makes the underbuildings damp and dark. The bazaar of Kalat is very large and well stocked with every kind of merchandise. Every day it is supplied with provisions, vegetables, and all kinds of food, which are cheap. According to Pottinger's account, the population is divided into two distinct classes, the Bulikis and the Brahawis, and each of these is subdivided into a number of tribes. The first is related to the modern Persian, both in appearance and in speech. The Brahawi, on the contrary, retains a greater number of Hindu words. Intermarriage between the two has given rise to a third. The Bulikis, coming from the mountains of Mekram, are two knights, that is to say, they consider the first four imams as the legitimate successors of Mohammed. They are a pastoral people, and have faults and virtues of their class. If they are hospitable, they are also indolent, and pass their time in gambling and smoking. As a rule, they content themselves with one or two wives, and are less jealous of their being seen by strangers than are other Muslimen. They have a large number of slaves of both sexes, whom they treat humanely. They are excellent marksmen, and passionately fond of hunting. Brave under all circumstances, they take pleasure in razias, which they call chepeos. As a rule, these expeditions are undertaken by the Neruas, the wildest and most thievish of the Belukis. The Brahuas carry their wandering habits still farther. Few men are more active and strong. They endure the glacial cold of the mountains equally with the burning heat of the plains. They are of a small stature, but as brave, as skillful in shooting, as faithful to their promises as the Belukis, and have not so pronounced a taste for plunder. Pottinger says, I have seen no Asiatic people whom they resemble, for a large number have brown hair and beards. After a short stay at Klat, the two travellers, who still passed as horse-dealers, resolved to continue their journey, but instead of following the high road to Kandahar, they crossed a dreary and barren country, ill-populated, watered by the Kassir, a river which dries up during the summer, and they reached a little town called Noshki, or Nuchki, on the frontier of Afghanistan. At this place, the Baluchis, who appeared friendly, represented to them the great difficulty of reaching Khorasan and its capital, Herat, by way of Sajistan. They advised the travelers to try to reach Kerman by way of Keji and Bempur, or by Sirhed, a village on the western frontier of Baluchistan, and from thence to enter Nirmanchir. At the same moment the idea of following two distinct routes presented itself to both Christie and Pottinger. The course was contrary to their instructions, but, said Pottinger, we found a ready excuse in the unquestionable advantage which would result from our procuring more extensive geographical and statistical knowledge of the country we were sent to explore than we could hope to do by travelling together. Christie set out first, by way of Dukchak. We shall follow his fortunes hereafter. A few days later, while still at Nuch, Pottinger received letters from his correspondent at Kalat, telling him that the emirs of Sindh were searching for them, as they had been recognized, and that his best plan for safety was to set out immediately. Upon the 25th of March, Pottinger started for Sarawan, a very small town near the Afghan frontier. Upon his way thither, Pottinger met with singular altars, or tombs, the construction of which was attributed to the Gerbers, or fire-worshippers, who are known in our day as Parsis. Sarawan is six miles from the Sarawani Mountains, in a sterile and bare district. The town owes its existence to the constant supply of water it derives from the Bili, an inestimable advantage in a country constantly exposed to drought, scarcity, and famine. Pottinger afterwards visited Karan, celebrated for the strength and activity of its camels, and crossed the desert which forms the southern extremity of Afghanistan. The sand of this desert is so fine that its particles are almost impalpable, and the action of the wind causes it to accumulate in heaps ten or twenty feet high, divided by deep valleys. Even in calm weather, a great number of particles float in the air, giving rise to a mirage of a peculiar kind, and getting into the traveler's eyes, mouth, and nostrils, cause an excessive irritation, with an insatiable thirst. In all this territory, Pottinger personated a Prizada, or holy man, for the natives are of a very thievish disposition, and in the character of a merchant he might have been involved in unpleasant adventures. 
After leaving the village of Gol in the district of Dauzak, the traveller passed through the ruined towns of Asmanabad, Hefter, and Pura, where Pottinger was forced to admit that he was a Feringhi, to the great scandal of the guide, who, during the two months they had been together, had never doubted him, and to whom he had given many proofs of sanctity. At last, worn out by fatigue and at the end of his resources, Pottinger reached Bempore, a locality which had been visited in 1808 by Mr. Grant, a captain in the Bengal Sepoy Infantry. Encouraged by the excellent account given by that officer, Pottinger presented himself to the Sirdar, but instead of affording him the necessary help for the prosecution of his journey, that functionary, discontented with the small present Pottinger offered him, found means to extort from him a pair of pistols which would have been of great use to him. Basman is the last inhabited town of Baluchistan. At this spot there is a huge sulphurous spring, which the Baluchis consider a certain cure for cutaneous diseases. The frontiers of Persia are far from scientific. Hence, a large tract of country remains not neutral, but a subject of dispute, and is the scene of sanguinary contests. The little town of Regan, in Nermanshire, is very pretty. It is a fort, or rather a fortified village, surrounded by high walls, in good repair, and furnished with bastions. Further on, in Persia proper, lies Ben, a town which was formerly of importance, as the ruins which surrounded it sufficiently prove. Here Pottinger was cordially received by the governor. On approaching, says Pottinger, he turned to one of his suite and asked where the Feringhi was. I was pointed out to him. Making me a sign to follow him, his fixed look at me, which took me in from head to foot, proclaimed his astonishment at my costume, which, in truth, was strange enough to serve as an excuse for the impoliteness of his staring. I was wearing the long shirt of a Baluchi and a pair of trousers which had once been white, but which in the six weeks I had worn them had become brown, and were all but in rags. In addition to this I had on a blue turban, a piece of rope served me as a girdle, and I carried in my hand a thick stick, which had assisted me greatly in my walking, and protected me from dogs. In spite of the dilapidated appearance of the Tatterdemalion, who thus presented himself before him, the governor received Pottinger with as much cordiality as was to be expected from a Mussulman, and provided him with a guide to Kerman. The traveller reached that town upon the 3rd of May, feeling that he had accomplished the most difficult portion of his journey, and was almost in safety. Kerman is the capital of ancient Karamania. Under Afghan rule it was a flourishing town, and manufactured shawls, which rivalled those of Kashmir. Here Pottinger witnessed one of those spectacles which, common enough to countries where human life is of little value, always fills Europeans with horror and disgust. The governor of this town was both son-in-law and nephew of the Shah, and also the son of the Shah's wife. Upon the 15th of May, says Pottinger, the prince himself judged certain persons who were accused of killing one of their servants. It is difficult to estimate the state of restlessness and alarm which prevailed in the village during the entire day. The gates of the town were shut, and no one might pass out. The government officials did not transact any business. People were cited as witnesses without previous notice. I saw two or three taken to the palace in a state of agitation which could scarcely have been greater had they been going to the scaffold. About three in the afternoon the prince passed sentence upon those who had been convicted. Some had their eyes put out, some their tongues split, some had the ears, nose, and lips cut off, others were deprived of their hands, fingers, or toes. I learnt that whilst these horrible punishments were inflicted, the prince remained seated at the window where I had seen him, and gave his orders without the least sign of compassion or of horror at the scene which took place before him. Leaving Kerman, Pottinger reached Sher Babig, which is equally distant from Yetz, Shiraz, and Kerman, and thence proceeded to Ispahan, where he had the pleasure of finding his companion Christy. At Miraga he met General Malcolm. It was now seven months since they had left Bombay. Christy had traversed 2,250 miles, and Pottinger 2,412. Meanwhile Christie had accomplished his perilous journey much better than he had anticipated. Leaving Nuch upon the 22nd of March, he crossed the Vachuti Mountains and some uncultivated country to the banks of the Helmand, a river which flows into Lake Hamoan. Christie, in his report to the company, says, The Helmand, after passing near Kandahar, flows southwest and west, and enters Sedjistan some four days' march from Duchak, making a detour around the mountains, it finally forms a lake. 
At Peldelec, which we visited, it is about 1,200 feet in width and very deep. The water is very good. The country is cultivated by irrigation for half a mile on either side. Then the desert begins and rises in perpendicular cliffs. The banks of the river abound in tamarind trees and provide pasturage for cattle. Sedjistan, which is watered by this river, comprises only 500 square miles. The portions of this district which are inhabited are those upon the river Helmand, whose bed deepens every year. At Elmendar, Christie sent for a Hindu, to whom he had an introduction. The man advised him to dismiss his Belechi attendants and personate a pilgrim. A few days later, he penetrated to Duchak, now known as Jalalabad. He says, The ruins of the ancient city cover quite as large a space of ground as Ispahan. It was built, like all towns of Sajistan, of half-burned bricks, the houses being two stories high, with vaulted roofs. The modern town of Jalalabad is clean, pretty, and growing. It contains nearly two thousand houses and a fair bazaar. The road from Duchak to Herat was easy. Christie's sole difficulty was in carrying out his personation of a pilgrim. Herat lies in a valley, surrounded by high mountains and watered by a river, to which it is due that gardens and orchards abound. The town covers an area of about four square miles. It is surrounded by a wall, flanked with towers, and a moat full of water. Large bazaars, containing numerous shops, and the Macheta Durjana, or Mosque of Friday, are its chief ornaments. No town has less waste land or a denser population. Christie estimates it at 100,000. Herat is the most commercial of all Asiatic towns under the dominion of native princes. It is the depot for all the traffic between Kabul, Kandahar, Hindustan, Kashmir, and Persia, and itself produces choice merchandise, silks, saffron, horses, and asafoetida. This plant, says Christie, grows to a height of two or three feet. The stalk is two inches thick. It finishes off in an umbel, which at maturity is yellow and not unlike a cauliflower. It is much relished by Hindus and Baluchis. They prepare it for eating by cooking the stalks in ashes and boiling the head like other vegetables, but it always retains its pungent smell and taste. Herat, like so many other eastern towns, possesses beautiful public gardens, but they are only cultivated for the sake of the produce which is sold in the bazaar. After a stay of a month at Herat, disguised as a horse dealer, Christie, announcing that he would return after a pilgrimage to Meshid, which he contemplated, left the town. He directed his course to Yetz, across a country ravaged by the Osbeks, who had destroyed the tanks intended to receive the rainwater. Yetz is a large and populous town on the skirts of a desert of sand. It is called Dar ul Ihabet, or Seat of Adoration. It is celebrated for the security to be enjoyed there, which contributes largely to the development of its trade with Hindustan, Khorasan, Persia, and Baghdad. Christie describes the bazaar as large and well-stocked, the town contains 20,000 houses, apart from those belonging to the Gerbers, who are estimated at 4,000. They are an active and laborious people, although cruelly oppressed. From Yetz to Ispahan, where he alighted at the palace of the Emir Ud Daouli, Christie had traveled a distance of 170 miles upon a good road. At Yetz, as we have seen, he met his companion, Pottinger. The two friends could but exchange mutual congratulations at the accomplishment of their mission, and their escape from the dangers of a fanatical country. Pottinger's narrative, as may perhaps be gathered from the sketch we have given, was very curious. More exact than most of his predecessors, he had collected and offered to the public a mass of most interesting historical facts, anecdotes, and geographical descriptions. Kabulistan had been, from the middle of the 18th century, the scene of a succession of ruinous civil wars. Competitors, with more or less right to the throne, had carried fire and sword everywhere, and converted that rich and fertile province into a desert, where the remains of ruined cities alone bore witness to former prosperity. End of section 5。section 6 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jairus Amar. 
Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. The Great Explorers and Travelers of the 19th Century, by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 1. The Dawn of a Century of Discovery, 6. About the year 1808, the throne of Kabul was occupied by Suja ul Mulk. England, uneasy at the projects formed by Napoleon with a view of attacking her possessions in India, and at the offers of alliance made by him through General Gardin to the Shah of Prussia, resolved to send an embassy to the court of Kabul, hoping to gain the king over to the interests of the East India Company. Mount Swart Elphinstone was selected as envoy, and has left an interesting account of his mission. He collected much novel information concerning this region and to the tribes by which it is peopled. His book acquires a new interest in our own day, and we turn with pleasure to pages devoted to the Khyberis and other mountain tribes, amid the events which are now taking place. Leaving Delhi in October 1808, Elphinstone reached Kanun, where the desert commences, and then the Shekhauti, a district inhabited by Rajputs. At the end of October, the embassy arrived at Tinguana, a pretty town, the Raja of which was an inveterate opium smoker. He is described as a small man, with large eyes, much inflamed by the use of opium. His beard, which was curled up to his ears on each side, gave him a ferocious appearance. Junjunka, whose gardens give freshness in the midst of these desert regions, is not now a dependency on the Raja of Bekanir, whose revenues do not exceed 1,250,000 francs. How is it possible for that prince to collect such revenues from a desert and uncultivated territory, overrun by myriads of rats, flocks of gazelles, and herds of wild asses? The path across the sand hills was so narrow that two camels abreast could scarcely pass it. At the least deviation from the path, those animals would sink in the sand as if it had been snow, so that the smallest difficulty with the head of the column delayed the entire caravan. Those in front could not advance if those in the rear were delayed, and lest they should lose the sight of the guides, trumpets and drums were employed as signals to prevent separation. One could almost fancy it the march of an army. The warlike sounds, the brilliant uniforms and arms, were scarcely calculated to convey the idea of a peaceful embassy. The envoy speaks of a want of water, and the bad quality of that which was procurable was unbearable to the soldiers and servants. Although they quenched their thirst with the abundant watermelons, they could not do so without ill results to their health. Most of the natives of India who accompanied the embassy suffered from low fever and dysentery. Forty persons died during the first week's stay at Bekanir. La Fontaine's description of the floating sticks might be aptly applied to Bekanir. From afar off it is something, Near at hand it is not. The external appearance of the town is pleasant, but it is a mere disorderly collection of cabins enclosed by mud walls. At that time, the country was invaded by five armies, and the belligerents sent a succession of envoys to the English ambassador, hoping to obtain, if not substantial assistance, at least moral support. Elphinstone was received by the Rajah of Bekanir. This court, he says, was different from all I had seen elsewhere in India. 
the men were whiter than the Hindus, resembled Jews in feature, and wore magnificent turbans. The Raja and his relatives wore caps of various colors, adorned with precious stones. The Raja leant upon a steel buckler, the center of which was raised, and the border encrusted with diamonds and rubies. Shortly after our entrance, the Raja proposed that we should retire from the heat and importunity of the crowd. We took our seats on the ground, according to Indian custom, and the Raja delivered a discourse, in which he said he was the vassal of the sovereign of Delhi, and that as Delhi was in the possession of the British, he honored the sovereignty of my government in my person. He caused the keys of the fort to be brought to him, and handed them to me, but having received no instructions regarding such an event, I refused them. After much persuasion, the Raja consented to keep his keys. Shortly afterwards, a troop of bayaders came in, and dancing and singing continued until we took our leave. Upon leaving Bekanir, the travelers entered a desert, in the middle of which stand the cities of Manigur and Bahawulpur, where a compact crowd awaited the embassy. The high faces upon which Alexander's fleet sailed scarcely answered to the idea such a reminiscence inspires. Upon the morrow, Bahawil Khan, governor of one of the eastern provinces of Kabul, arrived, bringing magnificent presents for the English ambassador, whom he conducted by the river high faces as far as Multan, a town famous for its silk manufacturers. The governor of the town had been terror-struck at hearing of the approach of the English, and there had been a discussion as to the attitude it was to assume, and whether the latter intended to take the town by stratagem or to demand its surrender. When these fears were allayed, a cordial welcome followed. Elphinstone's description, if somewhat exaggerated, is not the less curious. After describing how the governor saluted Mr. Strachey, the secretary to the embassy, after the Persian custom, he adds, They took their way together towards the tent, and the disorder increased. Some were wrestling, others on horseback mixed with the pedestrians. Mr. Strachey's horse was nearly thrown to the ground, and the secretary regained his equilibrium with difficulty. The Khan and his suite mistook the road in approaching the tent, and threw themselves upon the cavalry with such impetuosity that the latter had scarcely time to face about and to let them pass. The disordered troops fell back upon the tent. The servants of the Khan fled. The barriers were torn up and trampled underfoot. Even the ropes of the tent broke, and the cloth covering very nearly fell on our heads. The tents were crowded immediately, and all was in darkness. The governor and six of his suite seated themselves. The others stood at arms. The visit was of short duration. The governor took refuge in repeating his rosary with great fervor, and in saying to me, in agitated tones, You are welcome, you are welcome. Then, on the pretext that the crowd inconvenienced me, he retired. The account is amusing, but are all its details accurate? That, however, is of little moment. On the 31st December, the embassy passed the Indus, and entered a country cultivated with a care and method unlike anything to be seen in Hindustan. The natives of this country had never heard of the English, and took them for Mughals, Afghans, or Hindus. 
the strangest reports were current among these lovers of the marvelous. It was necessary to remain a month at Dera to await the arrival of a Menander, a functionary whose duty it was to introduce ambassadors. Two persons attached to the embassy availed themselves of that opportunity to ascend the peak of Tukde Suleiman, or the crown of Solomon, upon which, according to the legend, the Ark of Noah rested after the deluge. The departure from Dera took place upon the 7th of February, and after traveling through delightful countries, the embassy arrived at Peshawar. The king had come to meet them, for Peshawar was not the usual residence of the court. The narrative says, Upon the day of our arrival, our dinner was furnished from the royal kitchen. The dishes were excellent. Afterwards, we had the meat prepared in our own way, but the king continued to provide us with breakfast, dinner, and supper, more than sufficient for two thousand persons, two hundred horses, and a large number of elephants. Our suite was large, and much of this was needed. Still, I had great trouble at the end of a month in persuading his majesty to allow some retrenchment of this useless profusion. As might have been expected, the negotiations preceding presentation at court were long and difficult. Finally, however, all was arranged, and the reception was as cordial as diplomatic customs permitted. The king was loaded with diamonds and precious stones. He wore a magnificent crown, and the Kohinoor sparkled upon one of his bracelets. This was the largest diamond in existence. A drawing of it may be seen in Tavernier's travels. The Kohinoor is now in possession of the Queen of England. Elphinstone, after describing the ceremonies, says, I must admit that if certain things, especially the extraordinary richness of the royal costume, excited my astonishment, there was also much that fell below my expectations. Taking it as a whole, one saw less indication of the prosperity of a powerful state than symptoms of the decay of a monarchy which had formerly been flourishing. The ambassador goes on to speak of the rapacity with which the king's suite quarreled about the presents offered by the English, and gives other details which struck him unpleasantly. Elphinstone was more agreeably impressed with the king at his second interview. He says, It is difficult to believe that an eastern monarch can possess such a good manner, and so perfectly preserve his dignity while trying to please. The plain of Peshawar, which is surrounded on all but the eastern side by high mountains, is watered by three branches of the Kabul River, which meet here, and by many smaller rivers. Hence it is singularly fertile. Plums, peaches, pears, quinces, pomegranates, dates, grow in profusion. The population, so sparsely sprinkled throughout the arid countries which the ambassador had come through, were collected here. And Lieutenant McCartney counted no less than thirty-two villages. At Peshawar, there are one hundred thousand inhabitants, living in brick houses three stories high. Various mosques, not in any way remarkable for architecture, a fine caravanserai, and the fortified castle in which the king received the embassy are the only buildings of importance. The varieties of races, with different costumes, present a constantly changing picture. A human kaleidoscope, which appears made especially for the astonishment of a stranger. Persians, Afghans, Khyberis, Hazaures, 
Goranis, etc., with horses, dromedaries, and Bactrian camels, afford the naturalist much both to observe and to describe respecting bipeds and quadrupeds. But the charm of this town, as of every other throughout India, is to be found in its gardens, with their abundant and fragrant flowers, especially roses. The king's situation at this time was far from pleasant. His brother, whom he had dethroned after a popular insurrection, had now taken arms and just seized Kabul. A longer stay was impossible for the embassy. They had to return to India by way of Atok and the valley of Husum Abdul, which is celebrated for its beauty. There, Elphinstone was to await the result of the struggle between the brothers, which would decide the fate of the throne of Kabul. But he had received letters of recall. Moreover, fate was against Suja, who, after being completely worsted, had been forced to seek safety in flight. The embassy proceeded on its way, and crossed the country of the Six, a rude mountain race, half-naked and semi-barbarous. The Six, who a few years later were to make themselves terribly famous, says Elphinstone, are tall, thin men, and very strong. Their garments consist of trousers which reach only halfway down the thigh. They wear cloaks of skins which hang negligently from the shoulder. Their turbans are not large, but are very high and flattened in front. No scissors ever touch either hair or beard. Their arms are bows and arrows or muskets. Men of rank have very handsome bows, and never pay a visit without being armed with them. Almost the whole Punjab belongs to Ranjit Singh, who, in 1805, was the only one among many chiefs in the country. At the same time of our expedition, he had acquired the sovereignty of the whole country occupied by the Sikhs, and had taken the title of king. No incident of any moment marked the return of the embassy to Delhi. In addition to the narrative of events which had taken place before their eyes, its members brought back invaluable documents concerning the geography of Afghanistan and Kabulistan, the climate, animals, and vegetable and mineral productions of that vast country. Elphinstone devotes several chapters of his narrative to the origin, history, government, legislation, condition of the women, language, and commerce of these countries, facts that were largely appropriated by the best-informed newspapers when the recent English expedition to Afghanistan was undertaken. His work ends with an exhaustive treatise upon the tribes who formed the population of Afghanistan, and a summary of invaluable information respecting the neighboring countries. Elphinstone's narrative is curious, interesting, and valuable for many reasons, and may be consulted in our own day with advantage. The zeal of the East India Company was indefatigable. One expedition had no sooner returned than another was started, with different instructions. It was highly important to be thoroughly au fait of the ever-changing Asiatic policy, and to prevent coalition between the various native tribes against the conquerors of the soil. In 1812, a new idea, and a more peaceful one, gave rise to the journey of Moorcroft and Captain Hearsay to Lake Manasarowar in the province of the Andes, which is a portion of Little Tibet. This time, the object was to bring back a flock of cashmere goats, whose long silk hair is used in the manufacture of the world-famed shawls. In addition, it was proposed 
to disprove the assertion of the Hindus that the source of the Ganges is beyond the Himalayas in Lake Manasarowar, a difficult and perilous task. It was first of all necessary to penetrate into Nepal, whilst the government of that country made such an attempt very difficult, and thence to enter a region from which the natives of Nepal are excluded, and with still greater reason the English. The explorers disguised themselves as Hindu pilgrims. Their suite consisted of twenty-five persons, one of whom pledged himself to walk in strides of four feet. This was certainly a rough method of ascertaining the distance traversed. Messrs. Moorcroft and Hearsay passed through Pereli, and followed Webb's route as far as Josimath, which place they left on the 26th of May, 1812. They soon had to cross the last chain of the Himalayas, with increasing difficulties, owing to the rarity of the villages, which caused a scarcity of provisions and service, and the bad roads, at so great a height above the level of the sea. Nevertheless, they saw Daba, where there is an important lamazery, Gortop, Mysore, and, a quarter of a mile from Tirthapuri, curious hot springs. The original narrative, which appeared in the Annales du Voyages, speaks of this water as flowing from two openings six inches in diameter, in a calcareous plain some three miles in extent, and which is raised in almost every direction from ten to twelve feet above the surrounding country. It is formed by the earthy deposits left by the water in cooling. The water rises four inches above the level of the plain. It is clear, and so warm that one cannot keep a hand in it longer than a few minutes. It is surrounded by a thick cloud of smoke. The water, flowing over a horizontal surface, hollows out basins of various shapes, which as they receive the earthy deposits contract again. When they are filled up, the flow of the water again hollows out a new reservoir, which in its turn becomes full. Flowing thus from one to the other, it finally reaches the plain below. The deposit left by the water is as white as the purest stucco close to the opening. A little further it becomes a pale yellow, and further still, saffron-colored. At the other spring it is first rose-colored, and then dark red. These different colors are to be found in the calcareous plain, and are no doubt the work of centuries. Tirthapuri, the residence of a lama, is of great antiquity, and is a favorite rendezvous of the faithful, as a wall more than four hundred feet long and four wide, formed of stones upon which prayers are inscribed, sufficiently testifies. Upon the first of August, the travelers left this place hoping to reach Lake Manasarowar, and leaving on the right Lake Rowanrod, which is supposed to be the source of the largest branch of the Sutlej. Lake Manasarowar lies at the foot of immense sloping prairies, to the south of the gigantic mountains. This is the most venerated of all the sacred places of the Hindus, which is no doubt owing to its distance from Hindustan the dangers and fatigues of the journey, and the necessity of pilgrims providing themselves with money and provisions. Hindu geographers regard this lake as the source of the Ganges, the Sutlej, and to the Kali rivers. Moorcroft had no doubt as to the error of this assertion as regards the Ganges. Desiring to ascertain the truth as to the other rivers, he explored the steep banks of the lake, and found a number of streams which flowed into it, but none flowing out of it. It is possible that before the earthquake 
which destroyed Srinagar. The lake had an outlet, but Moorcroft found no trace of it. The lake is situated between the Himalayas and the Kailas chain, and is of irregular oblong shape, five leagues long by four wide. The end of the expedition was attained. Moorcroft and Hearsay returned towards India, passed by Kangri and saw Rawanrod, but Moorcroft was too weak, and could not continue the tour. He regained Tirthapuri and Daba, and suffered a great deal in crossing the ghat which separates Hindustan from Tibet. The narrative describes the winds which come from the snow-covered mountains of Bhutan as cold and piercing, and the ascent of the mountain as long and painful, its descent slippery and steep, making precautions necessary. We suffered greatly, says the writer. Our goats escaped by the negligence of their drivers, and climbed up to the edge of a precipice some hundred feet in height. A mountaineer disturbing them from their perilous position, they began the descent, running down a very steep incline. The hinder ones kicked up the stones, which, falling with violence, threatened to strike the foremost. It was curious to know how cleverly they managed to run, and avoid the falling stones. Very soon the Gorkalis, who had hitherto been content to place obstacles in the way of the travellers, approached them with intent to stop them. For some time the firmness displayed by the English kept them at bay, but at last, gaining courage from their numbers, they began an attack. Twenty men, says Moorcroft, threw themselves upon me. One seized me by my neck, and, pressing his knees against me, tried to strangle me by tightening my cravat. Another passed a cord round my legs and pulled me from behind. I was on the point of fainting. My gun, upon which I was leaning, escaped my hold. I fell. They dragged me up by my feet until I was nearly garroted. When at last I rose, nothing could exceed the expression of fierce delight on the faces of my conquerors. Fearing that I should attempt to escape, two soldiers held me by a rope and gave me a blow from time to time, no doubt to remind me of my position. Mr. Hearsay had not supposed that he should be attacked so soon. He was rinsing out his mouth when the hubbub began, and did not hear my cries for help. Our men could not find the few arms we possessed. Some escaped, I know not how. The others were seized, amongst them Mr. Hearsay. He was not bound as I was. They contented themselves with holding his arms. The chief of this band of savages informed the two Englishmen that they had been recognized, and were arrested for having traveled in the country in the disguise of Hindu pilgrims. A fakir, whom Moorcroft had engaged as a goat herd, succeeded in escaping, and took two letters to the English authorities. Aid was sent, and on the 1st of November, the prisoners were released. Not only were excuses offered for their treatment, but what had been taken from them was returned, and the Raja of Nepal gave them permission to leave his dominions. All's well that ends well. To complete our sketch, we must give an account of Mr. Fraser's expedition to the Himalayas, and Hodgson's exploration to the source of the Ganges in 1817. Captain Webb, as we have seen, had traced the course of that river past the valley of Dune, to Kajani, near Raital. Leaving this spot upon the 28th of May, 1817, Captain Hodgson 
reached the source of the Ganges in three days, and proceeded to Gengautri. He found that the river issues from a low arch in the midst of an enormous mass of frozen snow, more than 300 feet high. The stream was already of considerable size, being no less than 27 feet wide and 18 inches deep. In all probability, the Ganges first emerged into the light at this spot. Captain Hodgson wished to solve various questions. For example, what was the length of the river under the frozen snow? Is it the product of the melting of these snows, or did it spring from the ground? But, wishing to explore further upwards than his guides advised, the traveller sank into the snow up to his neck, and had to retrace his steps with great difficulty. The spot from which the Ganges issued is situated 12,914 feet above the level of the sea in the Himalayas. Hodgson also explored the source of the Jumna. At Jamautri, the mass of the snow from which the river makes its escape is no less than 180 feet wide and more than 40 feet deep between two perpendicular walls of granite. This source is situated on the southeast slope of the Himalayas. The extension of the British power in India was necessarily attended by considerable danger. The various native states, many of which could boast of a glorious past, had only yielded in obedience to the well-known political principle, divide and govern, ascribed to Machiavelli. But the day might come when they would merge their rivalries and enmities to make common cause against the invader. There was anything but a cheering prospect for the company, whose policy it was to maintain the system that hitherto worked so well. Certain neighboring states, still powerful enough to regard the growth of the British power with jealousy, might serve as harbors of refuge to the discontented, and become the centers of dangerous intrigues. Of all these neighboring states, that which demanded the strictest surveillance was Persia, not only on account of its contiguity to Russia, but because Napoleon was known to have designs in connection with it, which nothing but his European wars prevented him from putting into execution. In February 1807, General Gardin, who had gained his promotion in the wars of the Republic, and had distinguished himself at Austerlitz, Jena, and Eylau, was appointed minister plenipotentiary to Persia, with instructions to ally himself with Shab Fit Ali against England and Russia. The selection was fortunate, for the grandfather of General Gardin had held a similar post at the court of the Shah. Gardain crossed Hungary, and reached Constantinople and Asia Minor. But when he entered Prussia, Abbas Mirza had succeeded his father Feth Ali. The new Shah received the French ambassador with respect, loaded him with presents, and granted certain privileges to Catholics and French merchants. These were, however, the only results of the mission, which was thwarted by the English general Malcolm, whose influence was then paramount, and Gardain, disheartened by finding all his efforts frustrated, and recognizing that success was hopeless, returned to France the following year. His brother Ange de Gardain, who had acted as his secretary, published a brief narrative of the journey, containing several curious details respecting the antiquities of Persia, which have been, however, largely supplemented by works brought out by Englishmen. The French consul, Adrien Dupré, attached to Gardain's mission, also published a work under the title of 
Voyage en Perse, by Dans Luanis, Mille Huit Cent Huit, à uh, Mille Huit Cent Neuf, en traversant la Natoli, la Mesopotamie, du puy Constantinople, jusqu'à l'extrémité du Golfe Prussique, et de la la Irwan, suivi du details sur le mors, le usages et le commerce du Persans, sur la cour du Tehran et du notice du tribus de la Perse. The book bears out the assertions of its title, and is a valuable contribution to the geography and ethnography of Persia. The English, who made a much longer stay in the country than the French, were better able to collect the abundant materials at hand, and to make a judicious selection from them. Two works were long held to be the chief authorities on the subject. One of these was by James Morier, who availed himself of the leisure he enjoyed as secretary to the embassy to acquaint himself with every detail of Persian manners, and on his return to England published several oriental romances, which obtained a signal success, owing to the variety and novelty of the scenes described, and the fidelity to nature of every feature, however minute. The second of the two volumes alluded to above was the large quarto work by John MacDonald Kinnair on the geography of Persia. This book, which made its mark and left far behind it everything previously published on the subject, not only gives, as its title implies, very valuable information on the boundaries of the country, its mountains, rivers, and climate, but also contains interesting and trustworthy details respecting its government, constitution, army, commerce, animal, vegetable, and mineral productions, population, and revenue. After giving an exhaustive and brilliant picture of the material and moral resources of the Persian Empire, Kinnair goes on to describe its different provinces quoting from the mass of valuable documents accumulated by himself, thus making his work the most complete and impartial yet issued. Kinnair passed the years 1808 to 1814 in traveling about Asia Minor, Armenia, and Kurdistan, and the different posts held by him during that period were such as to give him exceptional opportunities for making observations and comparing their results. In his several capacities as captain in the service of the company, political agent to the Nawab of the Carnatic, or private traveler, his critical acumen was never at fault, and his wide knowledge of Oriental character and Oriental manners enabled him to recognize the true significance of many an event and many a revolution which would have escaped the notice of less experienced observers. At the same time, William Price, also a captain in the East India Company's service, who had been attached as interpreter and secretary to Sir William Gore Ousley's embassy to Persia in 1810, devoted himself to the study of the cuneiform character. Many had previously attempted to decipher it, with results as various as they were ridiculous, and, like those of his predecessors and contemporaries, Price's opinions were mere guesswork, but he succeeded in interesting a certain class of students in this obscure branch of research, and may be said to have perpetuated the theories of Niebuhr and other Orientalists. To Price, we owe an account of the journey of the English embassy to the Persian court, after which he published two essays on the antiquities of Persepolis and Babylon. Mr. Ousley, who had accompanied his brother Sir William as secretary, availed himself of his sojourn at the court of Tehran to study Persian. His works do not, however, bear upon geography or political economy but treat only of inscriptions, coins, 
manuscripts, and literature, in a word, of everything connected with the intellectual and material history of the country. To him we owe an edition of Fridesi and many other volumes, which came out at just the right time to supplement the knowledge already acquired of the country of the Shah. End of section 6「Section 7 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3 the great explorers and travelers of the nineteenth century by jules verne first part chapter one the dawn of a century of discovery seven another semi-asiatic semi-european country was also now becoming known this was the mountainous district of the caucasus as early as the second half of the 18th century, John Anthony Goldenstadt, a Russian doctor, had visited Astrakhan and Kislyar on the Terek at the most remote boundary of the Russian possessions, entered Georgia, where the Tsar Heraclius received him with great respect, and penetrated to Tiflis and the country of the Chukmins finally arriving at Imeratia. The next year, 1773, he visited the Great Kabardia, the Oriental Kumania, examined the ruins of Majuri, visited Shirkask and Asov, discovered the mouth of the Don, and was about to extend his researches to the Crimea when he was recalled to St. Petersburg. Gutenstadt's travels had not been translated into French. Their author's career was cut short by death before he had completed their revision for the press, and they were edited at St. Petersburg by Henry Julius von Klaproth, a young Prussian who afterwards explored the same countries. Klaproth, who was born at Berlin on the 11th October, 1783, gave proof at a very early age of a special aptitude for the study of Oriental languages. At fifteen years old he taught himself Chinese, and he had scarcely finished his studies at the universities of Halle and Dresden, when he began the publication of his Asiatic magazine. Invited to Russia by Count Potoki, he was at once named Professor of Oriental Languages at the Academy of St. Petersburg. Klaproth did not belong to the worthy race of bookworms who shut themselves up in their own studies. He took a wider view of the nature of true knowledge, feeling that the surest way to attain a thorough acquaintance with the languages of Asia and of Oriental manners and customs was to study them on the spot. He therefore asked permission to accompany the ambassador Golokin, who was going to China overland, and the necessary credentials obtained, he started alone for Siberia, making acquaintance with the Samoyeds, the Tunguses, Bashkirs, Yakontes, Kyrgyzes, and other of the Finnic and Tartar hordes which frequent these vast steppes, finally arriving at Yakutsk, where he was soon joined by Golokin. After a halt at Kyakta, the embassy crossed the Chinese frontier on the 1st January, 1806. The viceroy of Mongolia, however, insisted upon the observance by the ambassador of certain ceremonies which were considered by the latter degrading to his dignity, 
and neither being disposed to yield, Golokin set out with his suite to return to St. Petersburg. Klaproth, not caring to retrace his steps, preferred to visit hordes still unknown to him, and he therefore crossed the southern districts of Siberia, and collected during a journey extending over twenty months a large number of Chinese, Manchurian, Tibetan, and Mongolian books, which were of service to him in his great work, Asia Polyglotta. On his return to St. Petersburg, he was invested with all the honors of the academy, and a little later, at the suggestion of Count Potoki, he was appointed to the command of a historical, archaeological, and geographical expedition to the Caucasus. Klaproth now passed a whole year in journeys, often full of peril, amongst thievish tribes, through rugged districts, and penetrated to the country traversed by Guldenstadt at the end of the previous century. Klaproth's description of Tiflis is curious as compared with that of contemporary authors. Tiflis, he says, so called on account of its mineral springs, is divided into three parts. Tiflis properly so called, or the ancient town, Kala, or the citadel, and to the suburb of Isni. This town is built on the Kur, and the greater part of its outer walls is now in ruins. Its streets are so narrow that Arbas, as the lofty carriages so characteristic of oriental places are called, could only pass with difficulty down the widest, whilst in the others a horseman would barely find room to ride. The houses, badly built of flints and bricks cemented with mud, never lasted longer than about fifteen years. In Klaproth's time, Tiflis boasted of two markets, but everything was extremely dear. Shawls and silk scarves manufactured in the neighboring Asiatic countries, bringing higher prices than in St. Petersburg. Tiflis must not be dismissed without a few words concerning its hot springs. Klaproth tells us that the famous hot baths were formerly magnificent, but they are falling into ruins, although some few remain, the floors of which are cased in marble. The waters contain very little sulfur and are most salutary in their effects. The natives, especially the women, use them to excess, the latter remaining in them several days, and even taking their meals in the bath. The chief food of the people of Tiflis, at least in the mountainous districts, is the buri, a kind of hard bread with a very disagreeable taste, prepared in a way repugnant to our Sybarite notions. When the dough is sufficiently kneaded, a bright clear fire of dry wood is made, in earthen vessels four feet high by two wide, which are sunk in the ground. When the fire is burning fiercely, the Georgians shake into it the vermin by which their shirts and red silk breeches are infested. Not until this ceremony has been performed do they throw the dough, which is divided into pieces of the size of two clenched fists, into the pots. The dough once in, the vessels are covered with lids, over which rags are placed to make sure of all the heat being kept in, and the bread being thoroughly baked. It is, however, always badly done, and very difficult of digestion. Having thus assisted at the preparation of the food of the poor mountaineer, let us join Klaproth at the table of a prince. A long striped cloth, about a yard and a half wide, and very dirty, was spread for his party. On this was placed for each guest an oval-shaped wheaten cake, 
three spans long by two wide, and scarcely as thick as a finger. A number of little brass bowls, filled with mutton and boiled rice, roast fowls, and cheese cut in slices, were then brought in. As it was a fast day, smoked salmon with uncooked green vegetables was served to the prince and his subjects. Spoons, forks, and knives are unknown in Georgia. Soup is eaten from the bowl, meat is taken in the hands, and torn with the fingers into pieces the size of a mouthful. To throw a tidbit to another guest is a mark of great friendship. The repast over, grapes and dried fruits are eaten. During the meal, a good red native wine, called Traktir by the Tartars, and Guino by the Georgians, is very freely circulated. It is drunk from the flat silver bowls, greatly resembling saucers. Klaproth's account of the different incidents of his journey is no less interesting and vivid than this description of the manners of the people. Take, for instance, what he says of his trip to the sources of the Terek, the site of which had been pretty accurately indicated by Goldenstadt, although he had not visited them. I left the village of Utsvarskan on the 17th March, on a bright but cold morning. Fifteen ascites accompanied me. After half an hour's march, we began to climb the steep and rugged ascent leading to the junction of the Utsars Don with the Terek. This was succeeded by a still worse road, running for a league alongside of the river, which is scarcely ten paces wide here, although it was then swollen by the melting of snow. This part of the river banks is inhabited. We continued to ascend, and reached the foot of the Koki, also called Easter Koki, finally arriving at a spot where an accumulation of large stones in the bed of the river rendered it possible to cross over to the village of Sirate Khan, where we breakfasted. Here, the small streams forming the Terek meet. I was so glad to have reached the end of my journey that I poured a glass of Hungarian wine into the river, and made a second libation to the genius of the mountain in which the Terek rises. The Ossetes, who thought I was performing a religious ceremony, observed me gravely. On the smooth sides of an enormous block of schist, I engraved in red the date of my journey, together with my name and those of my companions after which I climbed up to the village of Resi. After this account of his journey, from which we might multiply extracts, Klaproth sums up all the information he has collected on the tribes of the Caucasus, dwelling specially on the marked resemblances which exist between the different Georgian dialects and those of the Finns and Laps. This was a new and useful suggestion. Speaking of the Lesgians, who occupy the eastern Caucasus, known as Dagestan or Legistan, Klaproth says their name is a misnomer, just as Scythian or Tartar was used to indicate the natives of northern Asia, adding that they do not form one nation, as is proved by the number of dialects in use, which, however, would seem to have been derived from a common source, though time has greatly modified them. This is a contradiction in terms, implying either that the Lesgians, speaking one language, form one nation, or that forming one nation, the Lesgians speak various dialects derived from the same source. According to Klaproth, Lesgian words have a considerable affinity with the other languages of the Caucasus, and with those of Western Asia, especially the dialects of the Samoyeds and Siberian Finns. 
west and northwest of the Lesgians, dwell the Metzjegis, or Chachenses, who are probably the most ancient inhabitants of the Caucasus. This is not, however, the opinion of Pallas, who looks upon them as a separate tribe of the Alain family. The Chachense language greatly resembles the Samoyeds and other Siberian dialects, as well as those of the Slavs. The Cherkesses, or Circassians, are the six of the Greeks. They firmly inhabited the eastern Caucasus and the Crimea. Their language differs much from other Caucasian idioms, although the Cherkesses proceed with the Wogols and the Osiaks. We have just seen that the Lesgian and Chachense dialects resemble the Siberian, from one common stock, which at some remote date separated into several branches, of which the Huns probably formed one. The Cherkess dialect is one of the most difficult to pronounce, some of the consonants being produced in a manner so loud and guttural that no European has yet been able to acquire it. In the Caucasus also dwell the Abazes, who have never left the shores of the Black Sea, where they have been settled from time immemorial, and the Ascites, or A's, who belong to the Indo-Germanic stock. They call their country Ironistan, and themselves the Irons. Klaproth takes them to be Sarmatic Medes, not only on account of their name, which resembles Iran, but because of the structure of their language, which proves more satisfactorily than historical documents, and in a most conclusive manner, that they spring from the same stock as the Medes and Persians. This opinion, however, appears to us mere conjecture, as in the time of Klaproth, the interpretation of cuneiform inscriptions had not been accomplished, and too little was known of the languages of the Medes for anyone to judge of its resemblance to the Ascete idiom. However, continues Klaproth, after meeting again the Sarmatic Medes of the ancients and this people, it is still more surprising also to recognize the Alains who occupied the district norths of the Caucasus. He adds, It follows from all we have said that the Ossetes, or the Medes, who called themselves Irons, who assumed the name of Irans, and whom Herodotus styles the Arioi. They are, moreover, the Sarmatic Medes of the ancients, and belong to the Median colony founded in the Caucasus by the Scythians. They are the A's or Alains of the Middle Ages. And lastly, they are the E.S.'s of Russian chronicles, from whom some of the Caucasus range took their name of the Iasic Mountains. This is not the place to discuss identifications belonging to the realm of criticism. We will content ourselves with adding to these remarks of Klaproth on the Ossete language, that its pronunciation resembles that of the Low German and Slavonic dialects. The Georgians differ essentially from the neighboring nations, alike in their language and in their physical and moral qualities. They are divided into four principal tribes, the Carthalinians, Mingrelians, and Schwans, or Swanians, inhabiting the southern range of the Caucasus, and the Lazes, a wild robber tribe. As we have seen, the facts collected by Klaproth are very curious, and throw an unexpected light on the migration of ancient races. The penetration and sagacity of the traveler were marvelous, and his memory was extraordinary. The scholar of Berlin rendered signal services to the science of philology. It is to be regretted 
that his qualities as a man, his principles, and his temper were not on a level with his knowledge and acumen as a professor. We must now leave the old world for the new, and give an account of the explorations of the young republic of the United States. So soon as the federal government was free from the anxieties of war, and its position was alike established and recognized, public attention was directed to the fur country, which had in turn attracted the English, the Spanish, and the French. Nootka Sound and the neighboring coasts, discovered by the great Cook, and the talented Quadra, Vancouver, and Marchand, were American. Moreover, the Monroe Doctrine, destined later to excite so much discussion, already existed in embryo, in the minds of the statesmen of the day. In accordance with an act of Congress, Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark were commissioned to trace the Missouri from its junction with the Mississippi to its source, and to cross the Rocky Mountains by the easiest and shortest route, thus opening up communication between the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean. The officers were also to trade with any Indian tribes they might meet. The expedition was composed of regular troops and volunteers, numbering altogether, including the leaders, 43 men. One boat and two canoes completed the equipment. On the 14th May, 1804, the Americans left Wood River, which flows into the Mississippi, and embarked on the Missouri. From what Cass had said in his journal, the explorers expected to have to contend with natural dangers of a very formidable description, and also to fight their way amongst natives of gigantic stature, whose hostility to the white man was invincible. During the first days of this long canoe voyage, only to be compared with those of Orellana and Condamine on the Amazon, the Americans were fortunate enough to meet with some Sioux Indians, an old Frenchman, a Canadian coureur du bois, or trapper, who spoke the languages of most of the Missouri tribes, and consented to accompany the expedition as interpreter. They passed the mouths of the Osage, Kansas, Platte or Nebraska, and White River, all tributaries of the Missouri, successively, and met various parties of Osage and Sui, or Maha Indians, who all appeared to be in a state of other degradation. One tribe of Sui had suffered so much from smallpox that the male survivors, in a fit of rage and misery, had killed the women and children spared by the terrible malady, and fled from the infected neighborhood. A little farther north dwelt the Recaries, or Rex, at first supposed to be the cleanest, most polite, and most industrious of the tribes the expedition met with, but a few thefts soon modified that favorable judgment. It is curious that these people do not depend entirely on hunting, but cultivate corn, peas, and tobacco. This is not, however, the case with the Mandans, who are a more robust race. A custom obtains among them, also characteristic of Polynesia. They do not bury their dead, but expose them on a scaffold. Clark's narrative gives us a few details relating to this strange tribe. The Mandans look upon the Supreme Being only as an embodiment of the power of healing. As a result, they worship two gods, whom they call the Great Medicine, or Physician, and the Great Spirit. 
it would seem that life is so precious to them that they are impelled to worship all that can prolong it. Their origin is strange. They originally lived in a large subterranean village hollowed out under the ground on the borders of a lake. A vine, however, struck its roots so deeply in the earth as to reach their habitations, and some of them ascended to the surface by the aid of this impromptu ladder. The descriptions given by them on their return of the vast hunting grounds, rich in game and fruit, which they had seen, led the rest of the tribe to resolve to reach so favored a land. Half of them had gained the surface, when the vine, bending beneath the weight of a fat woman, gave way, and rendered the ascent of the rest impossible. After death, the Mandans expect to return to the subterranean home, but only those who die with a clear conscience can reach it. The guilty will be flung into a lake. The explorers took up their quarters for the winter amongst the Mandans on the 1st of November. They built huts as comfortable as possible with the materials at their command, and in spite of the extreme cold, gave themselves up to the pleasures of hunting, which soon became a positive necessity of their existence. When the ice should break up on the Missouri, the explorers hoped to continue their voyage, but on their sending the boat down to St. Louis, laden with the skins and furs already obtained, only thirty men were found willing to carry the expedition through to the end. The travelers soon passed the mouth of the Yellowstone River, with a current nearly as strong as that of the Missouri flowing through districts and bounding in game. Cruel was their perplexity when they arrived at a fork where the Missouri divided into two rivers of nearly equal volume, for which was the main stream. Captain Lewis, with a party of scouts, ascended the southern branch and soon came in sight of the Rocky Mountains completely covered with snow. Guided to the spot by a terrific uproar, he beheld the Missouri fling itself into one broad sheet of water over a rocky precipice, beyond which it formed a broken series of rapids, extending for several miles. The detachment now followed this branch, which led them into the heart of the mountains and for three or four miles dashed along between two perpendicular walls of rock, finally dividing itself into three parts, to which were given the names of Jefferson, Madison, and Gallatin, after celebrated American statesmen. The last heights were soon crossed, and then the expedition descended the slopes overlooking the Pacific. The Americans had brought with them a Shoshone woman, who had been protected as a girl by the Indians of the East. And not only did she serve the explorers faithfully as an interpreter, but also, through her recognition of a brother in the chief of a tribe disposed to be hostile, she from that moment secured cordial treatment for the white men. Unfortunately, the country was poor, the people living entirely on wild berries, bark, and the little game they were able to obtain. The Americans, little accustomed to this frugal fare, had to eke it out by eating their horses, which had grown very thin, and buying all the dogs the natives would consent to sell. Hence, they obtained the name of Dog Eaters. As the temperature became milder, so did the character of the natives, whilst food grew more abundant, and as they came down the Oregon, also known as the Columbia, the salmon formed a seasonable addition 
to the bill of fare. When the Columbia, which is dangerous for navigation, approaches the sea, it forms a vast estuary, where the waves from the offing meet the current of the river. The Americans more than once incurred considerable risk of being swallowed up with their frail canoe before they reached the shores of the ocean. Glad to have accomplished the aim of their expedition, the explorers wintered at the mouth of the river, and when the first fine weather set in, they made their way back to St. Louis, arriving there in May 1806, after an absence of two years, four months, and ten days. They had in that time, according to their own estimate, traversed less than 1,378 leagues. The impulse was now given, and reconnoitering expeditions in the interior of the new continents rapidly succeeded each other, assuming, a little later, a scientific character which gives them a position of their own in the history of discovery. A few years later, one of the greatest colonizers of whom England can boast, Sir Stamford Raffles, organizer of the expedition which took possession of the Dutch colonies, was appointed military governor of Java. During an administration extending over five years, Raffles brought about numerous reforms and abolished slavery. Absorbing as was this work, however, it did not prevent him from publishing two huge quarto volumes, which are as interesting as they are curious. They contain, in addition to the history of Java, a vast number of details about the natives of the interior, until then little known together with much circumstantial information respecting the geology and natural history of the country. It is no wonder, therefore, that in honor of the man who did so much to make Java known, the name of Raffolgia should have been given to an immense flower native to it, and of which some specimens measure over three feet in diameter and weighed some ten pounds. Raffles was also the first to penetrate to the interior of Sumatra, of which the coast only was previously known. He visited the districts occupied by the Pasumas, sturdy tillers of the soil, the northern provinces, with Memeng Cabo, the celebrated Malayan capital, and crossed the southern half of the island, from Ben Callan to Palembang. Sir Stamford Raffles' fame, however, rests principally upon his having drawn the attention of the Indian government to the exceptionally favorable position of Singapore, which was converted by him into an open port, and grew rapidly into a prosperous settlement. End of section 7section eight of celebrated travels and travelers volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana celebrated travels and travelers volume three the great explorers and travelers of the nineteenth century by jules verne First Part, Chapter 2, Part 1, The Exploration and Colonization of Africa. 1. Petty and Campbell in the Sudan, Ritchie and Lyon in Fezzan, Denham, Oudine and Clapperton in Fezzan and in the Tibu country, Lake Chad and its tributaries, Kaukka and the chief villages of Bornu, Mandara, 
a razia or raid in the Falata country defeat of the arabs and death of bu kalum logan death of tul in route for cano death of udne cano sakatu sultan bello return to europe the power of napoleon and with it the supremacy of france was scarcely overthrown the titanic contests to gratify the ambition of one man at the expense of the intellectual progress of humanity were scarcely at an end before an honorable rivalry awoke once more and new scientific and commercial expeditions were set on foot a new era had commenced foremost in the ranks of the governments which organized and encouraged exploring expeditions we find as usual that of england it was in central africa the vast riches of which had been hinted at in the accounts given of their travels by horniman and burckhardt that the attention of the english was now concentrated as early as eighteen sixteen major Pedy, starting from senegal reached Kakande on the river nunez succumbing however to the fatigue of the journey and unhealthiness of the climate soon after his arrival in that town major campbell succeeded him in the command of the expedition and crossed the lofty mountains of futa jalion losing in a few days several men and part of the baggage animals arrived at the headquarters of the al Mame, as most of the kings of this part of africa are called the expedition was detained for a long time and only obtained permission to depart on payment of a large sum most disastrous was the return journey for the explorers had not only to recross the streams they had before forded with such difficulty but they were subjected to so many insults annoyances and exactions that to put an end to them campbell was obliged to burn his merchandise break his guns and sink his powder against so many fatigues and mortifications added to the complete failure of his expedition major campbell failed to bear up and he died with several of his officers in the very place where major Pedy had closed his career the few survivors of the party reached sierra leone after an arduous march a little later ritchie and captain george francis leon availing themselves of the prestige which the siege of algiers had brought to the british flag and of the cordial relations which the english consul at tripoli had succeeded in establishing with the principal moorish authorities determined to follow horniman's route and penetrate to the very heart of africa on the twenty fifth march eighteen nineteen the travellers left tripoli with mohammed el mukni bey of fezan who is called sultan by his subjects protected by this escort ritchie and leon reached merzouk without molestation but there the former died on the second november worn out by the fatigue and privations of the journey across the desert Leon, who was ill for some time from the same causes, recovered soon enough to foil the designs of the sultan, who, counting on his death, had already begun to take possession of his property, and also of Ritchie's. The captain could not penetrate beyond the southern boundaries of Fezan, but he had time to collect a good deal of valuable information about the chief towns of that province and the language of its inhabitants to him we likewise owe the first authentic details of the religion customs language and extraordinary costumes of the tauric arabs a wild tribe inhabiting the great sahara desert captain leon's narrative also contains a good deal of interesting information collected by himself on bornu wade and the sudan although he was unable to visit those places in person the results obtained did not by any means satisfy the english government which was most eager to open up the riches of the interior to its merchants consequently the authorities received favorably the proposals made by dr walter Udine, a scotchman whose enthusiasm had been aroused by the travels of mungo park this dr Udine was a friend of hugh clapperton a lieutenant in the navy three years his senior who had distinguished himself in canada and elsewhere but had been thrown out of employment and reduced to half pay by the peace of eighteen fifteen hearing of Udine's scheme 
Clapperton at once determined to join him in it, and Udine begged the minister to allow him the aid of that enterprising officer, whose special knowledge would be of great assistance. Lord Bathurst made no objection, and the two friends, after receiving minute instructions, embarked for Tripoli, where they ascertained that Major Denham was to take the command of their expedition. Denham was born in London on the 31st December, 1783, and began life as an articled pupil to a country lawyer. As the attorney's clerk, he found his duties so irksome and so little suited to his daring spirit that his longing for adventure soon led him to enlist in a regiment bound for Spain. Until 1815 he remained with the army, but after the peace he employed his leisure in visiting France and Italy. Denham, eager to obtain distinction, had chosen the career which would best enable him to achieve it, even at the risk of his life, and he now resolved to become an explorer. With him, to think was to act. He had asked the minister to commission him to go to Timbuktu, by the route Laying afterwards took when he heard of the expedition under Clapperton and Oudiné, and he now begged to be allowed to join them. Without any delay, Denham obtained the necessary equipment, and accompanied by a carpenter named William Hillman, he embarked for Malta, joining his future travelling companions at Tripoli on the 21st November, 1821. The English at this time enjoyed very great prestige, not only in the states of Barbary, on account of the bombardment of Algiers, but also because the British consul at Tripoli had by his clever diplomacy established friendly relations with the government to which he was accredited. This prestige extended beyond the narrow range of the northern states. The nationality of certain travellers, the protection accorded by England to the port, the British victories in India, had all been vaguely rumoured even in the heart of Africa, and the name of Englishman was familiar without any particular meaning being attached to it. According to the English consul, the route from Tripoli to Bornu was as safe as that from London to Edinburgh. This was therefore the moment to seize opportunities which might not occur again. The three travellers, after a cordial reception from the bee, who placed all his resources at their disposal, lost no time in leaving Tripoli, and with an escort provided by the Moorish governor, they reached Merzouk, the capital of Faisan, on the 8th April, 1822, without difficulty, having indeed been received with great enthusiasm in some of the places through which they passed. At Sakna, Denham tells us, the governor came out to meet them, accompanied by the principal inhabitants and hundreds of the country people who crowded round their horses kissing their hands with every appearance of cordiality and delight and shouting inglesi inglesi as the visitors entered the town this welcome was the more gratifying from the fact that the travellers were the first Europeans to penetrate into Africa without wearing a disguise. Denham adds that he feels sure their reception would have been far less cordial had they stooped to play the part of impostors by attempting to pass for Mohammedans. At Merzouk they were harassed by annoyances similar to those which had paralyzed Horniman. In their case, however, circumstances and character were alike different, and without allowing themselves to be blinded by the compliments paid them by the Sultan, the English, who were thoroughly in earnest, demanded the necessary escort for the journey to Bornu. It was impossible, they were told, to start before the following spring, on account of the difficulty of collecting a kafila, or caravan, and the troops necessary for its escort across the desert. A rich merchant, however, Bu Bakarbu Kalum by name, a great friend of the Pacha, gave the explorers a hint that if he received certain presents, he would smooth away all difficulties. He even offered to escort them himself to Bornu, for which province he was bound if he could obtain the necessary permission from the Pacha of Tripoli. Denham, believing Bukalum to be acting honestly, went off to Tripoli to obtain the governor's sanction, but on his arrival there he obtained only evasive answers, and finally threatened to embark for England, where he said he would report the obstacles thrown in his way by the Pacha in carrying out of the objects of the exploring expedition. These menaces produced no effect and Denham actually set sail, and was about to land at Marseilles when he received a satisfactory message from the bee, begging him to return, and authorizing Bu Kalum to accompany him and his companions. 
on the thirtieth october denham rejoined oudinay and clapperton at merzouk finding them considerably weakened by fever and the effects of the climate denham convinced that change of air would restore them to health persuaded them to start and begin the journey by easy stages he himself set out on the twentieth of november with a caravan of merchants from Mizurta, tripoli sakna and merzouk escorted by two hundred and ten arab warriors chosen from the most intelligent and docile of the tribes and commanded by bu kalum the expedition took the route followed by lyon and soon reached tegary which is the most southerly town of fezan and the last before the traveller enters the desert of bilma denham made a sketch of the castle of tegary from the southern bank of a salt lake near the town tegary is entered by a low narrow vaulted passage leading to a gate in a second rampart the wall is pierced with apertures which render the entrance by the narrow passage very difficult above the second gate there is also an aperture through which darts and firebrands may be hurled upon the besiegers a mode of warfare once largely indulged in by the arabs inside the town there are wells of fairly good water denham is of opinion that tegary restored well garrisoned and provisioned could sustain a long siege its situation is delightful it is surrounded by date trees and the water in the neighborhood is excellent a chain of low hills stretches away to the east snipes ducks and wild geese frequent the salt lakes near the town leaving tegary the travellers entered a sandy desert across which it would not have been easy to find the way had it not been marked out by the skeletons of men and animals strewn along it especially about the wells one of the skeletons we saw to-day says denham still looked quite fresh the beard was on the chin the features could be recognized it is my slave exclaimed one of the merchants of the kafila i left him near here four months ago make haste and take him to the market cried a facetious slave merchant lest someone else should claim him here and there in the desert are oases containing towns of greater or lesser importance at which the caravans halt kashi is one of the most frequented of these places and there the money for the right of crossing the desert is paid the sultan of kashi the ruler of a good many of these petty principalities and who takes the title of commander of the faithful was remarkable for a complete disregard of cleanliness a peculiarity in which according to denham his court fully equalled him this sultan paid bu kalum a visit in his tent accompanied by half a dozen taboos some of whom were positively hideous their teeth were of a dark yellow color the result of chewing tobacco of which they are so fond that they use it as snuff as well as to chew their noses look like little round bits of flesh stuck on to their faces with nostrils so wide that they could push their fingers right up them denham's watch compass and musical snuff-box astonished them not a little he defines these people as brutes with human faces a little further on the travellers reached the town of kirby situated in a wadi near the low range of hills of which the highest are not more than four hundred feet above the sea level and between two salt lakes produced by the excavations made for building from the centre of these lakes rise islets consisting of masses of muriate and carbonate of soda the salt produced by these wadis or depressions of the soil form an important article of commerce with Bornu and the whole of the Sudan. It would be impossible to imagine a more wretched place than Kirby. Its houses are empty, containing not as much as a mat. How could it be otherwise with a place liable to incessant raids from the Tuaricks? The caravan now crossed the Tibu country, inhabited by a peaceful, hospitable people, to whom, as keepers of the wells and reservoirs of the desert, the leaders of caravans pay passage money. The Tibus are a strong, active race, and when mounted on their nimble steeds, they display marvelous skill in throwing the lance, which the most vigorous of their warriors can hurl to a distance of 145 yards. Bilma is their chief city, and the residence of their sultan on the arrival of the travellers at bilma the sultan escorted by a number of men and women came out to meet the strangers 
the women were much better looking than those in the smaller towns some of them had indeed very pleasant faces their white regular teeth contrasting admirably with their shining black skins and the three triangular flaps of hair streaming with oil coral ornaments in their noses and large amber necklaces round their throats gave them what denham called a seductive appearance some of them carried fans made of grass or hair with which to keep off the flies others were provided with branches of trees all in fact carried something in their hands which they waved above their heads their costume consisted of a loose piece of sudan cloth fastened on the left shoulder and leaving the right uncovered with a smaller piece wound about the head and falling on the shoulders or flung back in spite of this paucity of clothing there is not the least immodesty in their bearing a mile from bilma and beyond a limpid spring which appears to have been placed there by nature to afford a supply of water to travellers lies a desert which it takes no less than ten days to cross this was probably once a huge salt lake on the fourth february eighteen twenty three the caravan reached lari a town on the northern boundary of bornu in latitude fourteen degrees forty minutes north the inhabitants astonished at the size of the kafila fled in terror at its approach beyond however says denham was an object full of interest to us and the sight of it produced a sensation so gratifying and inspiring that it would be difficult for language to convey an idea of its force or pleasure the great lake chad glowing with the golden rays of the sun in its strength appeared to be within a mile of the spot on which we stood on leaving lari the appearance of the country changed completely the sandy desert was succeeded by a clay soil clothed with grass and dotted with acacias and other trees of various species amongst which grazed herds of antelopes whilst guinea fowls and the turtle doves of barbary flew hither and thither above them towns took the place of villages with huts of the shape of bells thatched with dura straw the travellers continued their journey southwards rounding lake chad which they had first touched at its most northerly point the districts bordering on this sheet of water were of a black firm but muddy soil the waters rise to a considerable height in winter and sink in proportion in the summer the lake is of fresh water rich in fish and frequented by hippopotami and aquatic birds near its centre on the southeast are the islands inhabited by the bitamas a race who live by pillaging the people of the mainland the explorers had sent a messenger to sheik el kaname to ask permission to enter his capital and an envoy speedily arrived to invite bu kalum and his companions to kuka on their way thither the travellers passed through burwa a fortified town which had thus far resisted the inroads of the tariks and crossed the yu a large river in some parts more than five hundred feet in width which rising in the sudan flows into lake chad on the southern shores of this river rises a little town of the same name about half the size of burwa the caravan soon reached the gates of kauka where after a journey extending over two months and a half they were received by a body of cavalry four thousand strong under perfect discipline amongst these troops was a corps of blacks forming the bodyguard of the sheik whose equipments resembled those of ancient chivalry they wore denham tells us suits of chain armor covering the neck and shoulders these were fastened above the head and fell in two portions one in front and one behind so as to protect the flanks of the horse and the thighs of the rider a sort of cask or iron coif kept in its place by red white or yellow turbans tied under the chin completed the costume the horses heads were also guarded by iron plates their saddles were small and light and their steel stirrups held only the point of the feet which were clad in leather shoes ornamented with crocodile skin the horsemen managed their steeds admirably as advancing at full gallop brandishing their spears they wheeled right and left of their guests shouting barca barca blessing blessing surrounded by this brilliant and fantastic escort the english and arabs entered the town where a similar military display had been prepared in their honour 
they were presently admitted to the presence of sheik el kaname who appeared to be about forty-five years old and whose face was prepossessing with a happy intelligent and benevolent expression the english presented the letters of the pacha and when the sheik had read them he asked denham what had brought him and his companions to bornu we came merely to see the country replied denham to study the character of its people its scenery and its productions you are welcome was the reply it will be a pleasure to me to show you everything i have ordered huts to be built for you in the town you may go and see them accompanied by one of my people and when you are recovered from the fatigue of your long journey i shall be happy to see you the travellers soon afterwards obtained permission to make collections of such animals and plants as appeared to them curious and to make notes of all their observations they were thus enabled to collect a good deal of information about the towns near kauka kauka then the capital of bornu boasted of a market for the sale of slaves sheep oxen cheese rice earth nuts beans indigo and other productions of the country there one hundred thousand people might sometimes be seen haggling about the price of fish poultry meat the last sold both raw and cooked or that of brass copper amber and coral linen was so cheap in these parts that some of the men wore shirts and trousers made of it beggars have a peculiar mode of exciting compassion they station themselves at the entrance to the market and holding up the rags of an old pair of trousers they whine out to the passers-by see i have no pantaloons the novelty of this mode of proceeding and the request for a garment which seemed to them even more necessary than food made our travellers laugh heartily until they became accustomed to it hitherto the english had had nothing to do with any one but the sheik who content with wielding all real power left the nominal sovereignty to the sultan an eccentric monarch who never showed himself except through the bars of a wicker cage near the gate of his garden as if he were some rare wild beast curious indeed were some of the customs of this court not the least so the fancy for obesity no one was considered elegant unless he had attained to a bulk generally looked upon as very inconvenient some exquisites had stomachs so distended and prominent that they seemed literally to hang over the pommel of the saddle and in addition to this fashion prescribed a turban of such length and weight that its wearer had to carry his head on one side these uncouth peculiarities rivaled those of the turks of a masked ball and the travellers had often hard work to preserve their gravity to compensate however for the grotesque solemnity of the various receptions a new field for observation was open and much valuable information might now be acquired denham wished to proceed to the south at once but the sheik was unwilling to risk the lives of the travellers entrusted to him by the bee of tripoli on their entry into bornu the responsibility of bu kalum for their safety was transferred to him so earnest however were the entreaties of denham that el kaname at last sanctioned his accompanying bu kalum in a grazi or plundering expedition against the kafirs or infidels the sheik's army and the arab troops passed in succession yeti a large walled city twenty miles from angumu Badagery, and several other towns built on an alluvial soil which had a dark clay-like appearance they entered mandara at the frontier town of delo beyond which the sultan of the province with five hundred horsemen met his guests denham describes mohammed becker as a man of short stature about fifty years old wearing a beard painted of a most delicate azure blue the presentations over the sultan at once turned to denham and asked who he was whence he came what he wanted and lastly if he were a mohammedan on bu kalum's hesitating to reply the sultan turned away his head with the words so the pacha numbers infidels amongst his friends this incident had a very bad effect and denham was not again admitted to the presence of the sultan End of section 8。section 9 of celebrated travels and travelers volume 3 。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org。
Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3, The Great Explorers and Travelers of the Nineteenth Century, by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 2, Part 1, The Exploration and Colonization of Africa, 2. The enemies of the Pacha of Bornu and the Sultan of Mandara were called Falatas. Their vast settlements extended far beyond Timbuktu. They are a handsome set of men, with skins of a dark bronze color, which shows them to be of a race quite distinct from the Negroes. They are professors of Mohammedanism, and mix but little with the blacks. We shall presently have to speak more particularly of the Falatas, Fulas, or Fans, as they are called throughout the Sudan. South of the town of Mora rises a chain of mountains, of which the loftiest peaks are not more than 2,500 feet high, but which, according to the natives, extend for more than two months' journey. The most salient point noticed by Denham in his description of the country is a vast and apparently interminable chain of mountains, shutting in the view on every side. This, though in his opinion, inferior to the Alps, Apennines, Jura, and Sierra Marina, in rugged magnificence and gigantic grandeur, are yet equal to them in picturesque effect. The lofty peaks of Valme, Save, Jagade, Munde, etc., with clustering villages on their stony sides, rise on the east and west, while Horza, exceeding any of them in height and beauty, rises on the south with its ravines and precipices. Dercula, one of the chief Philata towns, was reduced to ashes by the invaders, who lost no time in pressing on to Musfia, a position which, naturally very strong, was further defended by palisades manned by a numerous body of archers. The English travelers had to take part in the assault. The first onslaught of the Arabs appeared to carry all before it. The noise of the firearms, with the reputation for bravery and cruelty enjoyed by Bou Kaloum and his men, threw the Falatas into momentary confusion, and if the men of Mandara and Bornu had followed up their advantage and stormed the hill, the town would probably have fallen. The besieged, however, noticing the hesitation of their assailants, in their turn assumed the defensive, and rallying their archers, discharged a shower of poisoned arrows, to which many an Arab fell a victim, and before which the forces of Bornu and Mandara gave way. Barca, the Bornu general, had three horses killed under him. Bu Kalum and his steed were both wounded, and Denham was in a similar plight, with the skin of his face grazed by one arrow, and two others lodged in his burnous. The retreat soon became a rout. Denham's horse fell under him, and the major had hardly regained his feet when he was surrounded by Falatas. Two fled on the presentation of the Englishman's pistols, a third received the charge in his shoulder. Denham thought he was safe when his horse fell a second time, flinging his master violently against a tree. This time, when the major rose, he found himself with neither horse nor weapons, and the next moment he was surrounded by enemies, who stripped him and wounded him in both hands and the right side, leaving him half dead at last to fight over his clothes, which seemed to them of great value. Availing himself of this lucky quarrel, Denham slipped under a horse standing by, and disappeared in the thicket. Naked, bleeding, wild with pain, he reached the edge of a ravine with a mountain stream flowing through it. His strength was all but gone, and he was clutching at the bough of a tree overhanging the water, with a view of dropping himself into it, as the banks were very steep, and the branches were actually bending beneath his weight when from beneath his hand a gigantic lifa, the most venomous kind of serpent in the country, rose from its coil in the very act of striking. Horror-struck, Denham let slip the branch and tumbled headlong into the water. But fortunately the shock revived him. He struck out almost unconsciously, swam to the opposite bank, and climbing it, found himself safe from his pursuers. Fortunately, the fugitives soon saw a group of horsemen amongst the trees, and in spite of the noise of the pursuit, he managed to shout loud enough to make them hear him. They turned out to be Barkagana and Bukalum with some Arabs, mounted on a sorry steed with no other clothing than an old blanket swarming with vermin. Denham travelled thirty-seven miles. The pain of his wounds was greatly aggravated by the heat, the thermometer being at thirty-two degrees. 
the only results of the expedition which was to have brought in such quantities of booty and numerous slaves were the deaths of bukalum and thirty-six of his arabs the wounding of nearly all the rest and the loss or destruction of all the horses the eighty miles between mora and kula were traversed in six days denham was kindly received in the latter town by the sultan who sent him a native garment to replace his lost wardrobe the major had hardly recovered from his wounds and fatigue before he took part in a new expedition sent to munga a province on the west of bornu by the sheik whose authority had never been fully recognized there and whose claim for tribute had been refused by the inhabitants denham and Udine left kaula on the twenty second may and crossed the ion then nearly dried up but an important stream in the rainy season and visited burney with the ruins of a capital of the same name which was capable of containing two hundred thousand inhabitants the travellers also passed through the ruins of gambaru with its magnificent buildings the favourite residence of the former sultan destroyed by the philatas kabshari basakur Betley, and many other towns or villages whose numerous populations submitted without a struggle to the sultan of bornu the rainy season was disastrous to members of the expedition clapperton fell dangerously ill of fever and Udine, whose chest was delicate even before he left england grew weaker every day denham alone kept up on the fourteenth of december when the rainy season was drawing to a close clapperton and Udine started for cano we shall presently relate the particulars of this interesting part of their expedition seven days later an ensign named tool arrived at kula after a journey from tripoli which had occupied only three months and fourteen days in february eighteen twenty four denham and tool made a trip into lagun on the south of lake chad all the districts near the lake and its tributary the shari are marshy and flooded during the rainy season the unhealthiness of the climate was fatal to young tool who died at angala on the twenty sixth of february at the early age of twenty-two persevering enterprising bright and obliging with plenty of pluck and prudence tool was a model explorer Lagun was then very little known its capital kernuk contained no less than fifteen thousand inhabitants the people of lagoon especially the women who are very industrious and manufacture the finest linens and fabrics of the closest texture are handsomer and more intelligent than those of bornu the necessary interview with the sultan ended after an exchange of complimentary speeches and handsome presents in this strange proposal from his majesty to the travellers if you have come to buy female slaves you need not be at any trouble to go further as i will sell them to you as cheap as possible denham had great trouble in convincing the merchant prince that such traffic was not the aim of his journey but that the love of science alone had brought him to lagun on the second of march denham returned to kauka and on the twentieth of may he was witness to the arrival of lieutenant tyrewit who had come to take up his residence as consul at the court of bornu bearing costly presents for the sultan after a final excursion in the direction of manu the capital of Kanem, and a visit to the dagana who formerly occupied all the districts about lake fitri the major joined clapperton in his return journey to tripoli starting on the sixteenth of april and arriving there in safety at the close of a long and arduous journey whose geographical results important in any case had been greatly enhanced by the labors of clapperton to the adventures and discoveries of the latter we must now turn clapperton and Udine started for cano a large filata town on the west of lake chad on the fourteenth of december eighteen twenty three followed the yo as far as damasac and visited the ruins of burney and those of bera on the shores of a lake formed by the overflowing of the yo dagamu and Bekadarfi, all towns of Husa the people of this province who were very numerous before the invasion of the philatas are armed with bows and arrows and trade in tobacco nuts guro antimony tanned hare skins and cotton stuffs in the piece and made into clothes the caravan soon left the banks of the yu and the gambaru and entered a wooded country which was evidently under water in the rainy season 
the travellers then entered the province of Catagum, where the governor received them with great cordiality assuring them that their arrival was quite an event to him as it would be to the sultan of the Falatas, who like himself had never before seen an englishman he also assured them that they would find all they required in his district just as at cauca the only thing which seemed to surprise him much was the fact that his visitors wanted neither slaves horses nor silver and that the sole proof of his friendship they required was permission to collect flowers and plants and to travel in his country according to clapperton's observations catagum is situated in latitude twelve degrees seventeen minutes eleven seconds north and about twelve degrees east longitude before the Falatas were conquered it was on the borders of the province of borneu it can send into the field four thousand cavalry and two thousand foot soldiers armed with bows and arrows swords and lances wheat and oxen with slaves are its chief articles of commerce the citadel is the strongest the english had seen except that of tripoli entered by gates which are shut at night it is defended by two parallel walls and three dry moats one inside one out and the third between the two walls which are twenty feet high and ten feet wide at the base a ruined mosque is the only other object of interest in the town which consists of mud houses and contains some seven or eight hundred inhabitants there the english for the first time saw cowries used as money hitherto native cloth had been the sole medium of exchange south of catagum is the yacoba country called muche by the mohammedans according to accounts received by clapperton the people of yacuba which is shut in by limestone mountains are cannibals the mohammedans however who have an intense horror of the kaffirs give no other proof of this accusation than the statement that they have seen human heads and limbs hanging against the walls of the houses in yacuba rises the yao a river which dries up completely in the summer but according to the people who live on its banks rises and falls regularly every week throughout the rainy season on the eleventh of january the journey was resumed but a halt had to be made at murmur at noon of the same day as Udine showed signs of extreme weakness and exhaustion that clapperton feared he could not last through another day he had been gradually failing ever since they left the mountains of Obery in Faisan, where he had inflammation of the throat from sitting in a draught when overheated. On the 12th of January, Udine took a cup of coffee at daybreak, and at his request, Clapperton changed camels with him. He then helped him to dress, and leaning on his servant, the doctor left the tent. He was about to attempt to mount his camel when Clapperton saw death in his face. He supported him back to the tent, where to his intense grief he expired at once, without a groan or any sign of suffering. Clapperton lost no time in asking the governor's permission to bury his comrade, and this being obtained, he dug a grave for him himself under an old mimosa tree near one of the gates of the town after the body had been washed according to the custom of the country it was wrapped in some of the turban shawls which were to have served as presents on the further journey the servants carried it to its last resting place and clapperton read the english burial service at the grave when the ceremony was over he surrounded the modest resting place with a wall of earth to keep off beasts of prey and had two sheep killed which he divided amongst the poor thus closed the career of the young naturalist and ship's doctor Udine. his terrible malady whose germs he had brought with him from england had prevented him from rendering so much service to the expedition as the government had expected from him although he never spared himself declaring that he felt better on the march than when resting knowing that his weakened constitution would not admit of any sustained exertion on his part he would never damp the ardor of his companions after this sad event, Clapperton resumed his journey to Cano, halting successively at Daigu, situated in a well-cultivated district, rich in flocks. Katungora, beyond the province of Katagum, Zangia, once, judging from its extent and the ruined walls still standing, an important place, near the end of the Duchi chain of hills, Gurkua, with a finer marketplace than that of Tripoli, and Sachua, surrounded by an imposing earthwork. Cano, the Chana of Edrisi and other Arab geographers, and the great emporium of the kingdom of Husa, was reached on the 20th January. 
clapperton tells us that he had hardly entered the gates before his expectations were disappointed after the brilliant description of the arabs he had expected to see a town of vast extent the houses were a quarter of a mile from the walls and stood here and there in little groups separated by large pools of stagnant water Quote, i might have dispensed with the care i had bestowed on my dress he had donned his naval uniform for the inhabitants absorbed in their own affairs let me pass without remark and never so much as looked at me End quote. Kano, the capital of the province of that name and one of the chief towns of the Sudan, is situated in north latitude 12 degrees, 0 minutes, 19 seconds, and east longitude 9 degrees, 20 minutes. It contains between 30 and 40,000 inhabitants, of whom the greater number are slaves. The market, bounded on the east and west by vast reedy swamps, is the haunt of numerous flocks of ducks, storks, and vultures, which act as scavengers to the town. In this market, stocked with all the provisions in use in Africa, beef, mutton, goats, and sometimes even camel's flesh are sold. Writing paper of French manufacture, scissors and knives, antimony, tin, red silk, copper bracelets, glass beads, coral, amber, steel rings, silver ornaments, turban shawls, cotton cloths, calico, Moorish habiliments, and many other articles are exposed for sale in large quantities in the marketplace of Cano. There, Clapperton bought for three pastries an English cotton umbrella from Gadamese. He also visited the slave market, where the unfortunate human chattels are as carefully examined as volunteers for the Navy are by our own inspectors. The town is very unhealthy, the swamps cutting it in two, and the holes produced by the removal of the earth for building produce permanent malaria. It is the fashion at Cano to stain the teeth and limbs with the juice of a plant called gorgi, and with tobacco, which produces a bright red color. Goru nuts are chewed, and sometimes even swallowed when mixed with trona, a habit not peculiar to Husa, for it extends to Bornu, where it is strictly forbidden to women. The people of Husa smoke a native tobacco. On the 23rd of February, Clapperton started for Sakatu. He crossed the picturesque, well-cultivated country, whose wooded hills gave it the appearance of an English park. Herds of beautiful white and dun-colored oxen gave animation to the scenery. The most important places passed in route by Clapperton were Gadania, a densely populated town, the inhabitants of which had been sold as slaves by the Philatas, Don Cami, Zermia, the capital of Gambra, Kigaria, Kuari, and the wells of Kamun, where he met an escort sent by the Sultan. Sakatu was the most thickly populated city that the explorer had seen in Africa. Its well-built houses form regular streets, instead of clustering in groups as in the other towns of Husa. It is surrounded by a wall between twenty and thirty feet high, pierced by twelve gates, which are closed every evening at sunset, and it boasts of two mosques, with a market and a large square opposite to the sultan's residence. The inhabitants, most of whom are Falatas, own many slaves, and the latter, those at least who are not in domestic service, work at some trade for their master's profit. They are weavers, masons, blacksmiths, shoemakers, or husbandmen. To do honor to his host, and also to give him an exalted notion of the power and wealth of England, Clapperton assumed a dazzling costume when he paid his first visit to Sultan Bello. He covered his uniform with gold lace, donned white trousers and silk stockings, and completed this holiday attire by a Turkish turban and slippers. Bello received him, seated on a cushion in a thatched hut like an English cottage. The sultan, a handsome man, about forty-five years old, wore a blue cotton tobe and a white cotton turban, one end of which fell over his nose and mouth in Turkish fashion. Bello accepted the traveler's presence with childish glee. The watch, telescope, and thermometer, which he naively called a heat watch, especially delighted him, but he wondered more at his visitor than at any of his gifts. 
he was unwearied in his questions as to the manners customs and trade of england and after receiving several replies he expressed a wish to open commercial relations with that power he would like an english consul and a doctor to reside in a port he called raqqa and finally he requested that certain articles of english manufacture should be sent to funda a very thriving seaport of his after a good many talks on the different religions of europe bello gave back to clapperton the books journals and clothes which had been taken from denham at the time of the unfortunate excursion into which bu Kalum lost his life on the third may clapperton took leave of the sultan this time there was a good deal of delay before he was admitted to an audience bello was alone and gave the traveller a letter for the king of england with many expressions of friendship towards the country of his visitor reiterating his wish to open commercial relations with it and begging him to let him have a letter to say when the english expedition promised by clapperton would arrive on the coast of africa clapperton returned by the route by which he had come arriving on the eighth of july at kuuka where he rejoined denham he had brought with him an arab manuscript containing a geographical and historical picture of the kingdom of takrur governed by mohammed bello of Husa, author of the manuscript he himself had not only collected much valuable information on the geology and botany of bornu and Husa, but also drawn up a vocabulary of the languages of Beharmi, mandara bornu Husa, and timbuktu the results of the expedition were therefore considerable the philatas had been heard of for the first time and their identity with the fans had been ascertained by clapperton in his second journey it had also proved that these philatas had created a vast empire in the north and west of africa and also that beyond a doubt they did not belong to the negro race the study of their language and its resemblance to certain idioms not of african origin will some day throw a light on the migration of races lastly lake chad had been discovered and though not entirely examined the greater part of its shores had been explored it had been ascertained to have two tributaries the u part of whose course had been traced whilst its source had been pointed out by the natives and the shari the mouth and lower portion of which had been carefully examined by denham with regard to the niger the information collected by clapperton from his natives was still very contradictory but the balance of evidence was in favour of it flowing into the gulf of benin however clapperton intended after a short rest in england to return to africa and landing on the western coast make his way up the kuara or Jaliba, as the natives call the niger to set at rest once for all the dispute as to whether that river was or was not identical with the nile to connect his new discoveries with those of denham and lastly to cross africa taking a diagonal course from tripoli to the gulf of benin End of section 9。section 10 of celebrated travels and travelers volume 3。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by michelle fry。baton rouge。louisiana。celebrated travels and travelers volume three the great explorers and travelers of the nineteenth century by jules verne first part chapter two part two the exploration and colonization of africa three clapperton's second journey arrival at badagery Yereba and its capital katunga busa Attempts to get at the truth about Mungo Park's fate. Nifei, Yari and Zigzag. Arrival at Cano. Disappointments. Death of Clapperton. Return of Lander to the coast. Tucky on the Congo. Bowditch in Ashante. Moline at the sources of the Senegal and Gambia. Major Gray. Kali at Timbuktu lang at the sources of the niger richard and john lander at the mouth of the niger k laud and latorzek in egypt nubia and the oasis of siwa so soon as clapperton arrived in england he submitted to lord bathurst his scheme for going to koyuka via the bight of benin 
in other words by the shortest way a route not attempted by his predecessors and descending the niger from its mouth to timbuktu in this expedition three others were associated with clapperton who took the command these three were a surgeon named dixon pierce a ship's captain and dr morrison also in the merchant's service the last named well up in every branch of natural history on the twenty sixth november eighteen twenty five the expedition arrived in the bight of benin for some reason unexplained dixon had asked permission to make his way to Sakatu alone and he landed for that purpose at huayda a portuguese named songa and columbus denham's servant accompanied him as far as dahomey seventeen days after he left that town dixon reached char and a little later yowery beyond which place he was never traced footnote dixon quarrelled with a native chief and was murdered by his followers see clapperton's last journey in africa the other explorers sailed up the bight of benin and were warned by an english merchant named houston not to attempt the ascent of the quora as the king of the districts watered by it had conceived an intense hatred of the english on account of their interference with the slave trade the most remunerative branch of his commerce it would be much better urged houston to go to badagery no great distance from sakatu the chief of which well disposed as he was to travellers would doubtless give him an escort as far as the frontiers of yariba houston had lived in the country many years and was well acquainted with the language and habits of its people clapperton therefore thought it desirable to attach him to the expedition as far as katunga the capital of yariba the expedition disembarked at badagery on the twenty ninth november eighteen twenty five ascended an arm of the lagos and then for a distance of two miles the gazee creek which traverses part of dahomey descending the left bank the explorers began their march into the interior of the country through districts consisting partly of swamps and partly of yam plantations everything indicated fertility the negroes were very averse to work and it would be impossible to relate the numerous palavers and negotiations which had to be gone through and the exactions which were submitted to before porters could be obtained the explorers succeeded in spite of these difficulties in reaching jenna sixty miles from the coast here clapperton tells us he saw several looms at work as many as eight or nine in one house a regular manufactory in fact the people of jenna also made earthenware but they prefer that which they get from europe often putting the foreign produce to uses for which it was never intended at jenna the travellers were all attacked with fever the result of the great heat and the unhealthiness of the climate pierce and morrison both died on the twenty seventh december the former soon after he left jenna with clapperton the latter at that town to which he had returned to rest at asanda a town of no less than one thousand inhabitants dafu containing some five thousand and other places visited by clapperton on his way through the country he found that an extraordinary rumor had preceded him to the effect that he had come to restore peace to the districts distracted by war and to do good to the lands he explored at tachau the caravan met a messenger with a numerous escort sent by the king of yariba to meet the explorers and shortly afterwards katunga was entered this town is built round the base of a rugged granite mountain it is about three miles in extent and is both framed in and planted with bushy trees presenting a most picturesque appearance Clapperton remained at Katunga from the 24th January to the 7th March, 1826. He was entertained there with great hospitality by the Sultan, who, however, refused to give him permission to go to Husa or Bornu by way of Nefri or Tapa, urging his reasons that Nefri was distracted by civil war, and one of the pretenders to the throne had called in the aid of the Flatas. It would be more prudent to go through Yauri whether these excuses were true or not clapton had to submit the explorer availed himself of his detention at katunga to make several interesting observations 
this town contains no less than seven markets in which are exposed for sale yams cereals bananas figs the seeds of gourds hares poultry sheep lambs linen cloth and various implements of husbandry the houses of the king and those of his wives are situated in two large parks the doors and the pillars of the verandas are adorned with fairly well executed carvings representing such scenes as a boa killing an antelope or a pig or a group of warriors and drummers according to clapperton the people of yoruba have fewer of the characteristics of the negro race than any natives of africa with whom he was brought in contact their lips are not so thick and their noses are of a more aquiline shape the men are well made and carry themselves with an ease which cannot fail to be remarked the women are less refined looking than the men the result probably of exposure to the sun and the fatigue they endure compelled as they are to do all the work of the fields soon after leaving katanga clapperton crossed the musa a tributary of the kuwara and entered kiama one of the halting places of the caravans trading between husa and vargu and gandhi on the frontiers of the ashante Kiyama consisted of no less than 13,000 inhabitants, who were considered the greatest thieves in Africa. To say a man is from Borghu is to brand him as a blackguard at once. Outside Kiyama, the traveler met the Husa caravan. Some thousands of men and women, oxen, asses, and horses, marching in single file, formed an interminable line presenting a singular and grotesque appearance a motley assemblage truly naked girls alternating with men bending beneath their loads or with ganja merchants in the most outlandish and ridiculous costumes mounted on bony steeds which stumbled at every step clapperton now made for busa on the niger where mungo park was drowned before reaching it he had to cross the ali a tributary of the kuwara and to pass through wow wow a district of borgi the capital of which also called wow wow contained some eighteen thousand inhabitants it was one of the cleanest and best built towns the traveller had entered since he left badagery the streets are wide and well kept and the houses are round with conical thatched roofs drunkenness is a prevalent vice in wow wow governor priests laymen men and women indulge to excess in palm wine in rum brought from the coast and in quote, booza end quote. the latter beverage is a mixture made of dura honey cayenne pepper and the root of a coarse grass eaten by cattle with the addition of a certain quantity of water clapperton tells us that the people of wow wow are famous for their cleanliness they are cheerful benevolent and hospitable no other people whom he had met with had been so ready to give him information about their country and more extraordinary still did not meet with a single beggar the natives say they are not aborigines of borhu but that they are descendants of the natives of husa and nifri they speak a yoruba dialect but the wow wow women are pretty which those of yoruba are not the men are muscular and well made but have a dissipated look their religion is a lax kind of mohammedanism tinctured with paganism since leaving the coast clapperton had met tribes of unconverted falatas speaking the same language and resembling in feature and complexion others who had adopted mohammedanism a significant fact which points to their belonging to one race busa which the traveller reached at last is not a regular town but consists of groups of scattered houses on an island of the Quora, situated in latitude ten degrees fourteen minutes north and longitude six degrees eleven minutes east the province of which it is the capital is the most densely populated of borhu the inhabitants are all pagans even the sultan although his name is mohammed they live upon monkeys dogs cats rats beef and mutton breakfast was served to the sultan whilst he was giving audience to clapperton whom he invited to join him the meal consisted of a large water rat grilled without skinning a dish of fine boiled rice some dried fish stewed in palm oil fried alligators eggs washed down with fresh water from the quora 
Clapperton took some stewed fish and rice, but was much laughed at because he would eat neither the rat nor the alligator's eggs. The sultan received him very courteously, and told him that the sultan of Yauri had his boats ready to take him to that town for the last seven days. Clapperton replied that as the war had prevented his exit from Borneo and Yauri, he should prefer going by way of Kalfu and Nifri. "'You are right,' answered the sultan. "'You did well to come and see me, and you can take whichever route you prefer.' At a later audience, Clapperton made inquiries about the Englishman who had presided in the Quara twenty years before. This subject evidently made the Sultan feel very ill at ease, and he evaded the questions put to him by saying he was too young at the time to remember what happened. Clapperton explained that he only wanted to recover their books and papers and to visit the scene of their death, and the Sultan, in reply, denied having anything belonging to them, adding a warning against his guests going to the place where they died, for it was a very bad place. "'But I understood,' urged Clapperton, "'that part of the boat they were in could still be seen.' "'No, it was a false report,' replied the Sultan. "'The boat has long since been carried down by the stream. It was somewhere amongst the rocks. He didn't know where.' To a fresh demand for Park's papers and journals, the Sultan replied that he had none of them. They were in the hands of some learned men, but as Clapperton seemed to set such store by them, he would have them looked for. Thanking him for this promise, Clapperton begged permission to question the old men of the place, some of whom must have witnessed the catastrophe. No answer whatever was returned to his appeal, by which the Sultan was evidently much embarrassed. It was useless to press him further. This was a check to Clapperton's further inquiries. On every side he was met with embarrassed silence, or such replies as, The affair happened so long ago, I can't remember it, or I was not witness to it. The place where the boat had been stopped and its crew drowned was pointed out to him, but even that was done cautiously. A few days later, Clapperton found out that the former Imawan, who was a Falata, had had Mungo Park's books and papers in his possession. Unfortunately, however, this Amauan had long since left Busa. Finally, when at Kalfu, the explorer ascertained beyond a doubt that Mungo Park had been murdered. Before leaving Borku, Clapperton recorded his conviction of the baselessness of the bad reputation of the inhabitants, who had been branded everywhere as thieves and robbers. He had completely explored their country, traveled and hunted amongst them alone, and never had the slightest reason to complain. The traveller now endeavoured to reach Kano by way of Zauri and Zegzeg, first crossing the Quara. He soon arrived at Fabra, on the Mayaro, the residence of the Queen Mother of Nifri, and then went to visit the King, in camp at a short distance from the town. This King, Clapperton tells us, was the most insolent rogue imaginable, asking for everything he saw, and quite unabashed by any refusal. His ambition and his calling in of the Falatas, who would throw him over as soon as he had answered their purpose, had been the ruin of his country. Thanks indeed to him, nearly the whole of the industrial population of Nafri had been killed, sold into slavery, or had fled the country. Clapperton was detained by illness much longer than he had intended to remain at Kulfo, a commercial town on the northern banks of Mayaro, containing from twelve to fifteen thousand inhabitants. Exposed for the last twenty years to the raids of Falatas, Kulfu had been burnt twice in six years. Clapperton was witness, when there, of the Feast of the New Moon. On that festival every one exchanged visits. The women wear their woolly hair plaited and stained with indigo. Their eyebrows are dyed the same color. Their eyelids are painted with coal, their lips are stained yellow, their teeth red, and their hands and feet are colored with henna. On the day of the Feast of the Moon, they don their gayest garments, with their glass beads, bracelets, copper, silver, steel, or brass. They also turn the occasion to account by drinking as much booza as the men, joining in all their songs and dances. After passing through Katanga, Clapperton entered the province of Gauri, the people of which, though conquered with the rest of Husa by the Falatas, had rebelled against them on the death of Bello I, and since then maintained their independence in spite of all the efforts of their invaders. 
gowry capital of the province of the same name is situated in latitude ten degrees fifty four minutes north and longitude eight degrees one minute east at fatika clapperton entered zegzeg subject to the Falatas, after which he visited zarie a singular looking town laid out with plantations of millet woods of bushy trees vegetable gardens alternating with marshes lawns and houses the population was very numerous exceeding even that of cano being estimated indeed at some forty or fifty thousand nearly all falatas on the nineteenth september after a long and weary journey clapperton at last entered cano he at once discovered that he would have been more welcome if he had come from the east for the war with bornu had broken off all communication with Fezzan and tripoli leaving his luggage under the care of his servant lander clapperton almost immediately started in quest of sultan bello who they said was near sakatu this was an extremely arduous journey and on it clapperton lost his camels and horses and was compelled to put up with a miserable ox to carry part of his baggage he and his servants divided the rest amongst themselves bello received clapperton kindly and sent him camels and provisions but as he was then engaged in subjugating the rebellious province of guber he could not at once give the explorer the personal audience so important to the many interests entrusted by the english government to clapperton bello advanced to the attack of cunia the capital of guber at the head of an army of sixty thousand soldiers nine-tenths of whom were on foot and wore padded armor the struggle was contemptible in the extreme and this abortive attempt closed the war clapperton whose health was completely broken up managed to make his way from sakatu to magaria where he saw the sultan after he had received the presents brought for him bello became less friendly he presently pretended to have received a letter from Sheikh el Khamenei warning him against the traveller, whom his correspondent characterized as a spy, and urging him to defy the English, who meant, after finding out all about the country, to settle in it, raise up sedition, and profit by the disturbances they should create, to take possession of Husa, as they had done of India. The most patent of all the motives of Bello in creating difficulties for Clapperton was his wish to appropriate the presents intended for the Sultan of Borno. A pretext being necessary, he spread a rumor that the traveler was taking cannons and ammunition to Kuka. It was out of all reason Bello should allow a stranger to cross his dominions with a view of enabling his implacable enemy to make war upon him finally bello made an effort to induce clapperton to read him the letter of lord bathurst to the sultan of borno clapperton told him he could take it if he liked but that he would not give it to him adding that everything was of course possible to him as he had force on his side but that he would bring dishonor upon himself by using it to open the letter myself said clapperton is more than my head is worth he had come he urged bringing bello a letter and presents from the king of england relying upon the confidence inspired by the sultan's letter of the previous year and he hoped his host would not forfeit that confidence by tampering with another person's letter on this the sultan made a gesture of dismissal and clapperton retired this was not however the last attempt of a similar kind and things grew much worse later a few days afterwards another messenger was sent to demand the presents reserved for el Kanemi, and on clapperton's refusing to give them up they were taken from him i told the gadado says clapperton that they were acting like robbers towards me in defiance of all good faith that no people in the world would act the same and they had far better have cut my head off than done such an act but i suppose they would do that also when they had taken everything from me an attempt was now made to obtain his arms and ammunition but this he resisted sturdily his terrified servants ran away but soon returned to share the dangers of their master for whom they entertained the warmest affection at this critical moment the entries in clapperton's journal ceased he had now been six months in sakatu without being able to undertake any explorations or to bring to a satisfactory conclusion the mission which had brought him from the coast sick at heart weary and ill he could take no rest and his illness suddenly increased upon him to an alarming degree 
his servant richard lander who had now joined him tried in vain to be all things at once on the twelfth march eighteen twenty seven clapperton was seized with dysentery nothing could check the progress of the malady and he sank rapidly it being the time of the feast of the ramadan lander could get no help not even servants fever soon set in and after twenty days of great suffering clapperton feeling his end approaching gave his last instructions to lander and died in that faithful servant's arms on the eleventh of april i put a large clean mat says lander over the hole the corpse and sent a messenger to sultan bello to acquaint him with the mournful event and ask his permission to bury the body after the manner of my own country and also to know in what particular place his remains were to be interred the messenger soon returned with the sultan's consent to the former part of my request and about twelve o'clock at noon of the same day a person came into my hut accompanied by four slaves sent by bello to dig the grave i was desired to follow them with the corpse accordingly i saddled my camel and putting the body on its back and throwing a union jack over it i bade them proceed travelling at a slow pace we halted at jungavi a small village built on a rising ground about five miles to the southeast of sakatu the body was then taken from the camel's back and placed in a shed whilst the slaves were digging the grave which being quickly done it was conveyed close to it i then opened a prayer book and amid showers of tears read the funeral service over the remains of my valued master not a single person listened to this peculiarly distressing ceremony the slaves being at some distance quarrelling and making the most indecent noise the whole time it lasted this being done the union jack was then taken off and the body was slowly lowered into the earth and i wept bitterly as i gazed for the last time upon all that remained of my generous and intrepid master End quote overcome by heat fatigue and grief poor lander himself now broke down and for more than ten days he was unable to leave his hut bello sent several times to inquire after the unfortunate servant's health but he was not deceived by these demonstrations of interest for he knew they were only dictated by a wish to get possession of the traveller's baggage which was supposed to be full of gold and silver the sultan's astonishment may therefore be imagined when it came out that lander had not even money enough to defray the expenses of his journey to the coast he never found out that the servant had taken the precaution of hiding his own gold watch and those of pierce and clapperton about his person lander saw that he must at any cost get back to the coast as quickly as possible by dint of the judicious distribution of a few presents he won over some of the sultan's advisers who represented to their master that should lander die he would be accused of having murdered him as well as clapperton although clapperton had advised lander to join an arab caravan for fazan the latter fearing that his papers and journals might be taken from him resolved to go back to the coast on the third may lander at last left sakatu en route for cano during the first part of this journey he nearly died of thirst but he suffered less in the second half as the king of jacoba who had joined him was very kind to him and begged him to visit his country this king told him that the niam niams were his neighbors that they had once joined him against the sultan of bornu and that after the battle they had roasted and eaten the corpses of the slain this i believe is the first mention since the publication of hornman's travellers of this cannibal race who were to become the subjects of so many absurd fables End of section ten. Section eleven of Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume three. The Great Explorers and Travellers of the Nineteenth Century by Jules Verne first part chapter two part two the exploration and colonization of africa four 
lander entered cano on the twenty fifth may and after a short stay there started for funda on the niger whose course he proposed following to benin this route had much to recommend it being not only safe but new so that lander was enabled to supplement the discoveries of his master Kanfu, Carifo, Gauji, and Gates were visited in turns by Lander, who says that the people of these towns belong to the Huso race and pay tribute to the Fulatas. He also saw Damoy, Dramalik, and Kodonia, passed a wide river flowing towards the Kuara, and visited Katap, a huge slave and cattle market, Kuji and Dunrora, with a long chain of lofty mountains running in an easterly direction beyond. At Dunrora, just as Lander was superintending the loading of his beasts of burden, four horsemen, their steeds covered with foam, dashed up to the chief, and with his aid forced Lander to retrace his steps to visit the king of Zegzeg, who, they said, was very anxious to see him. This was by no means agreeable to Lander, who wanted to get to the Niger, from which he was not very far distant, and down it to the sea. He was, however, obliged to yield to force. His guides did not follow exactly the same route as he had taken on his way to Dunrora, and thus he had an opportunity of seeing the village of Agibi, governed by one of the chief of the warriors of the sovereign of Zegzeg. He paid his respects as required, excusing the small value of the presents he had to give, on the ground of his merchandise having been stolen, and soon obtained permission to leave the place. Yauri, Wamba, Kalfu, Busa, and Wauwau were the halting places on Lander's return journey to Badagery, where he arrived on the 22nd November, 1827. Two months later he embarked for England. Although the commercial project, which had been the chief aim of Clapperton's journey, had fallen through, owing to the jealousy of the Arabs, who opposed it in their fear that the opening of a new route might ruin their trade, a good deal of scientific information had rewarded the efforts of the English explorer. In his History of Maritime and Island Discovery, Desborough Cooley thus sums up the results obtained by the travellers whose work we have just described. Quote, the additions to our geographical knowledge of the interior of Africa, which we owe to Captain Clapperton, far exceed in extent and importance those made by any preceding traveler. The limit of Captain Leon's journey southward across the desert was in latitude 24 degrees, while Major Denham, in his expedition to Mandara, reached latitude 9 degrees 15 minutes, thus adding 14 and 3 quarters degrees, or 900 miles, to the extent explored by Europe. Europeans. Hornman, it is true, had previously crossed the desert, and had proceeded as far southwards as Nefay, in latitude 10 degrees 30 minutes, but no account was ever received of his journey. Park, in his first expedition, reached Scylla, in longitude 1 degree 34 minutes west, a distance of 1,100 miles from the mouth of the Gambia denham and clapperton on the other hand from the east side of lake chad in longitude seventeen degrees to sakatu in longitude five degrees thirty minutes explored a distance of seven hundred miles from east to west in the heart of africa a line of only four hundred miles remaining unknown between scylla and sakatu the second journey of Captain Clapperton added tenfold values to these discoveries, for he had the good fortune to detect the shortest and most easy road to the populous countries of the interior, and he could boast of being the first who had completed an itinerary across the continent of Africa from Tripoli to Benin. End quote. We need add but little to so skillful and sensible a summary of the work done. The information given by Arab geographers, especially by Leo Africanus, had been verified, and much had been learnt about a large portion of the Sudan. Although the course of the Niger had not yet been actually traced, that was reserved for the expeditions of which we are now to write, it had been pretty fairly guessed at. It had been finally ascertained that the Quora, or Jaliba, or Niger, or whatever else the great river of northwest Africa might be called, and the Nile were totally different rivers with totally different sources. In a word, a great step had been gained. 
In 1816, it was still an open question whether the Congo was not identical with the Niger. To ascertain the truth on this point, an expedition was sent out under Captain Tuckey, an English naval officer who had given proof of intelligence and courage. James Kingston Tuckey was made prisoner in 1805 and was not exchanged until 1814. When he heard that an expedition was to be organized for the exploration of the Zaire, he begged to be allowed to join it and was appointed to the command. Two able officers and some scientific men were associated with him. Tuckey left England on the 19th March, 1816, with two vessels, the Congo and the Dorothea, a transport vessel under his orders. On the 20th June, he cast anchor off Malembe, on the shores of the Congo, in latitude 4 degrees, 39 minutes south. The king of that country was much annoyed when he found that the English had not come to buy slaves, and spread all manner of injurious reports against the Europeans who had come to ruin his trade. On the 18th July, Tuckey entered the vast estuary formed by the mouths of the Zaire on board the Congo, but when the height of the river banks rendered it impossible to sail farther, he embarked with some of his people in his boats. On the 10th August, he decided, on account of the rapidity of the current and the huge rocks bordering the stream, to make his way partly by land and partly by water. Ten days later, the boats were brought to a final stand by an impassable fall. The explorers therefore landed and continued their journey on foot, but the difficulties increased every day, the Europeans falling ill and the Negroes refusing to carry the baggage. At last, when he was some 280 miles from the sea, Tuckey was compelled to retrace his steps. The rainy season had set in, the number of sick increased, and the commander, miserable at the lamentable result of his trip, himself succumbed to fever, and only got back to his vessel to die on the 4th October, 1816. An exact survey of the mouth of the Congo and the rectification of the coastline, to which there had previously been a considerable error, were the only results of this unlucky expedition. In 1807, not far from the scene of Clapperton's landing a few years later, a brave but fierce people appeared on the Gold Coast. The Ashantes, coming none knew exactly whence, flung themselves upon the Fontes, and after horrible massacres in 1811 and 1816, established themselves in the whole of the country between the Kong Mountains and the sea. As a necessary result, this led to a disturbance in the relations between the Fontes and the English, who owned some factories and counting houses on the coast. In 1816, the Ashante king ravaged the Fante territories in which the English had settled, reducing the latter to famine. The governor of Cape Coast Castle therefore sent a petition home for aid against the fierce and savage conqueror. The bearer of the governor's dispatches was Thomas Edward Bowditch, a young man who, actuated by a passion for traveling, had left the parental roof thrown up his business, and having married against the wishes of his family, had finally accepted a humble post at Cape Coast Castle, where his uncle was second in command. The English minister at once acceded to the governor's request, and sent Bowditch back in command of an expedition, but the authorities at Cape Coast considered him too young for the post, and superseded him by a man whose long experience and thorough knowledge of the country and its people seemed to fit him for the important task to be accomplished. The result showed that this was an error. Bowditch was attached to the mission as scientific observer, his chief duty being to take the latitude and longitude of the different places visited. Frederick James and Bowditch left the English settlement on 22nd August, 1817, and arrived at Kumasi, the Ashante capital, without meeting with any other obstacle than the insubordination of the bearers. The negotiations with a view to the conclusion of a treaty of commerce and the opening of a road between Kamasi and the coast were brought to something of a successful issue by Bowditch, but James proved himself altogether wanting in either the power of making or enforcing suggestions. The wisdom of Bowditch's conduct was fully recognized, and James was recalled. 
it would seem that geographical science had little to expect from a diplomatic mission to a country already visited by bosman lawyer desmarchais and many others and on which meredith and dalzell had written but bowditch turned to account his stay of five months at Coumassay, which is but ten days march from the atlantic to study the country manners customs and institutions of one of the most interesting races of africa we will now briefly describe the pompous entry of the english mission into kumase the whole population turned out on the occasion and all the troops whose numbers bowditch estimated at thirty thousand at least were under arms before they were admitted to the presence of the king the english witnessed a scene well calculated to impress upon them the cruelty and barbarity of the ashantes a man with his hands tied behind him his cheeks pierced with wire one ear cut off the other hanging by a bit of skin his shoulders bleeding from cuts and slashes and a knife run through the skin above each shoulder blade was dragged by a cord fastened to his nose through the town to the music of bamboos he was on his way to be sacrificed in honor of the white men our observations en passant says bowditch had taught us to conceive a spectacle far exceeding our original expectations but they had not prepared us for the extent and display of the scene which here burst upon us an area of nearly a mile in circumference was crowded with magnificence and novelty the king his tributaries and captains were resplendent in the distance surrounded by attendants of every description fronted by a mass of warriors which seemed to make our approach impervious the sun was reflected with a glare scarcely more supportable than the heat from the massive gold ornaments which glistened in every direction more than a hundred bands burst at once on our arrival into the peculiar airs of their several chiefs the horns flourished their defiances with the beating of innumerable drums and metal instruments and then yielded for a while to the soft harmonious breathings of their long flutes with which a pleasing instrument like a bagpipe without the drone was happily blended at least a hundred large umbrellas and canopies which could shelter thirty persons were sprung up and down by the bearers with brilliant effect being made of scarlet yellow and the most showy cloths and silks and crowned on the top with crescents pelicans elephants barrels and arms and swords of gold the king's messengers with gold breastplates made way for us and we commenced our round preceded by the canes and the english flag we stopped to take the hand of every cabousier which as their household suites occupied several spaces in advance delayed us long enough to distinguish some of the ornaments in the general blaze of splendor and ostentation the cabousiers as did their superior captains and attendants wore ashante cloths of extravagant price from the costly foreign silks which had been unravelled to weave them in all the varieties of color as well as pattern they were of an incredible size and weight and thrown over the shoulder exactly like a roman toga a small silk fillet generally encircling their temples and massy gold necklaces intricately wrought suspended moorish charms enclosed in small square cases of gold silver and curious embroidery some wore necklaces reaching to the navel entirely of agare beads a band of gold and beads encircled the knee from which several strings of the same depended small circles of gold like guineas rings and casts of animals were strung round their ankles their sandals were of green red and delicate white leather manilas and rude lumps of rock gold hung from their left wrists which were so heavily laden as to be supported on the head of one of the handsomest boys gold and silver pipes and canes dazzled the eye in every direction wolves and rams heads as large as life cast in gold were suspended from their gold-handled swords which were held around them in great numbers the blades of which shaped like round bills and rested in blood the sheaths were of leopard skin or the shell of a fish like chagrin 
the large drums supported on the head of one man and beaten by two others were braced around with the thigh bones of their enemies and ornamented with their skulls the kettle drums resting on the ground were scraped with wet fingers and covered with leopard skin the wrists of the drummers were hung with bells and curiously shaped pieces of iron which jingled loudly as they were beating the smaller drums were suspended from the neck by scarves of red cloth the horns the teeth of young elephants were ornamented at the mouthpiece with gold and the jawbones of human victims the war caps of eagle's feathers nodded in the rear and large fans of the wing feathers of the ostrich played around the dignitaries immediately behind their chairs which were of a black wood almost covered by inlays of ivory and gold embossment stood their handsomest youths with corslets of leopard skin covered with gold cockle shells and stuck full of small knives sheathed in gold and silver and the handles of blue agate cartouche boxes of elephant's hide hung below ornamented in the same manner a large gold-handled sword was fixed behind the left shoulder and silk scarves and horses tails generally white streamed from the arms and waist cloth their long danish muskets had broad rims of gold at small distances and the stocks were ornamented with shells finely grown girls stood behind the chairs of some with silver basins their stools of the most laborious carved work and generally with two large bells attached to them were conspicuously placed on the heads of favorites and crowds of small boys were seated around flourishing elephants tails curiously mounted the warriors sat on the ground close to these and so thickly as not to permit of our passing without treading on their feet to which they were perfectly indifferent their caps were of the skin of the pangolin and leopard the tails hanging down behind their cartouche belts composed of small gourds which hold the charges and covered with leopards or pig skin were embossed with red shells and small brass bells thickly hung to them on their hips and shoulders was a cluster of knives iron chains and collars dignified the most daring who were prouder of them than of gold their muskets had rests affixed of leopard skin and the locks of a covering of the same the sides of their faces were curiously painted in long white streaks and their arms also striped having the appearance of armor we were suddenly surprised by the sight of moors who afforded the first general diversity of dress there were seventeen superiors arrayed in large cloaks of white satin richly trimmed with spangled embroidery their shirts and trousers were of silk and a very large turban of white muslin was studded with a border of different colored stones their attendants wore red caps and turbans and long white shirts which hung over their trousers those of the inferiors were of dark blue cloth they slowly raised their eyes from the ground as we passed and with a most malignant scowl the prolonged flourishes of the horns a deafening tumult of drums and the fuller concert at the intervals announced that we were approaching the king we were already passing the principal officers of his household the chamberlain the gold horn-blower the captain of the messengers the captain for royal executions the captain of the market the keeper of the royal burying-ground and the master of the bands sat surrounded by a retinue and splendor which bespoke the dignity and importance of their offices the cook had a number of small services covered with leopard skin held behind him and a large quantity of massy silver plate was displayed before him punch bowls waiters coffee pots tankards and a very large vessel with heavy handles and clawed feet which seemed to have been made to hold incense i observed a portuguese inscription on one piece and they seemed generally of that manufacture the executioner a man of immense size wore a massy gold hatchet on his breast and the execution stool was held before him clotted in blood and partly covered with a caul of fat the king's four linguists were encircled by a splendor inferior to none and their peculiar insignia gold canes were elevated in all directions tied in bundles like fasces 
the keeper of the treasury added to his own magnificence by the ostentatious display of his service the blow-pan boxes scales and weights were of solid gold a delay of some minutes whilst we severally approached to receive the king's hand afforded us a thorough view of him his deportment first excited my attention native dignity in princes we are pleased to call barbarous was a curious spectacle his manners were majestic yet courteous and he did not allow his surprise to beguile him for a moment of the composure of the monarch he appeared to be about thirty-eight years of age inclined to corpulence and of a benevolent countenance End quote. this account is followed by a description extending over several pages of the costume of the king the filing past of the chiefs and troops the dispersing of the crowd and the ceremonies of reception which lasted far on into the night reading bowditch's extraordinary narrative we are tempted to ask if it be not the outcome of the traveller's imagination for we can scarcely credit what he says with the wonderful luxury of this barbarous court the sacrifice of thousands of persons at certain seasons of the year the curious customs of this warlike and cruel people this mixture of barbarism and civilization hitherto unknown in africa we could not acquit bowditch of great exaggeration had not later travellers as well as contemporary explorers confirmed his statements we can therefore only express our astonishment that such a government founded on terror alone could have endured so long end of section eleven Section 12 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3, The Great Explorers and Travelers of the Nineteenth Century, by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 2, Part 2, The Exploration and Colonization of Africa. 5. It is a pleasure to us Frenchmen when we can quote the name of a fellow countryman amongst the many travelers who have risked their lives in the cause of geographical science. Without abating our critical acumen, we feel our pulse quicken when we read of the dangers and struggles of such travelers as Molien, Callier, de Calio, and Le Torzec. Gaspar Molien was nephew to Napoleon's Minister of the Treasury. He was on board the Medusa, but was fortunate enough to escape when that vessel was shipwrecked, and to reach the coast of the Sahara in a boat, whence he made his way to Senegal the dangers from which Molien had just escaped would have destroyed the love of adventure and exploration in a less ardent spirit they had no such effect upon him he left st louis as soon as ever he obtained the assent of the governor Florio, to his proposal to explore the sources of the great rivers of senegambia and especially those of the joliba Morin started from Jeddah on the 29th January, 1818, and taking an easterly course between the 15th and 16th parallels of north latitude, crossed the kingdom of Domel and entered the districts peopled by the Yaloufs. Unable to go by way of Wuli, he decided in favor of the Futatoro route, and in spite of the jealousy of the natives and their love of pillage, he reached Bandu without accident. It took him three days to traverse the desert between Bandu and the districts beyond the Gambia, after which he penetrated into Neocolo, a mountainous country inhabited by the all but wild Pules and Jalans. Leaving Bandia, Molien entered Fauta Jalan and reached the sources of the Gambia and the Rio Grande, which are in close proximity. A few days later he came to those of the Falame, and in spite of the repugnance and fear of his guide, he made his way into Timbo, the capital of Fauta. The absence of the king and most of the inhabitants probably spared him from a long captivity abbreviated only by torture. Fauta is a fortified town. The king owns houses with mud walls between three and four feet thick and fifteen high. 
at a short distance from timbo molien discovered the sources of the senegal at least what were pointed out to him as such by the blacks but it was impossible for him to take astronomical observations the explorer did not however look upon his work as done he had ever before him the still more important discovery of the sources of the niger but the feeble state of his health the setting in of the rainy season the swelling of the rivers the fears of his guides who refused to accompany him into Corenco and sulemano though he offered them guns amber beads and even his horse compelled him to give up the idea of crossing the kong mountains and to return to st louis Molien had, however, opened several new lines in a part of Senegambia not before visited by any European. It is to be regretted, says M. de la Renardiere, that, worn out with fatigue, scarcely able to drag himself along, in a state of positive destitution, Molien was unable to cross the lofty mountains separating the basin of the Senegal from that of the Joliba, and that he was compelled to rely upon native information respecting the most important objects of his expedition it is on the faith of the assertions of the natives that he claims to have visited the sources of the rio grande falame gambia and senegal if he had been able to follow the course of those rivers to their fountainheads his discoveries would have acquired certainty which is unfortunately now wanting to them however when we compare the accounts of other travellers with what he says of the position of the source of the bafing or senegal which cannot be that of any other great stream we are convinced of the reality of this discovery at least it also seems certain that the two last springs are higher up than was supposed and that the joliba rises in a yet loftier locality the country rises gradually to the south and southeast in parallel terraces these mountain chains increase in height towards the east attaining their greatest elevation between latitude eight degrees and ten degrees north such were the results of Molien's interesting journey in the French colony of Senegal. The same country was the starting point of another explorer, René Callier. Callier, who was born in 1800 in the department of the seine oise had only an elementary education. But reading Robinson Crusoe had fired his youthful imagination with a zeal for adventure, and he never rested until, in spite of his scanty resources, he had obtained maps and books of travel. In 1816, when he was only 16 years old, he embarked for Senegal in the transport ship La Loire at this time the english government was organizing an inland exploring expedition under the command of major gray to avoid the terrible al mame of timbu who had been so fatal to pedi the english made for the mouth of the gambia by sea Wooly and the gaboon were crossed and the explorers penetrated into bandu which molien was to visit a few years later a district inhabited by a people as fanatic and fierce as those of the fauta jalan the extortions of the almami were such that under pretext of there being an old debt left unpaid by the english government major gray was mulched of nearly all his baggage and had to send an officer to the senegal for a fresh supply Callier, knowing nothing of this disastrous beginning, and aware that Gray was glad to receive new recruits, left St. Louis with two Negroes and reached Gorey. But there some people, who took an interest in him, persuaded him not to take service with Gray, and got him an appointment at Guadeloupe. He remained, however, but six months in that island, and then returned to Bordeaux, whence he started for the Senegal once more parterre one of gray's officers was just going back to his chief with the merchandise he had procured and callier asked and obtained leave to accompany him without either pay or a fixed engagement the caravan consisted of seventy persons black and white and thirty-two richly laden camels it left Gandiole in Kayor on the 5th february eighteen nineteen and before entering jalouf a desert was crossed where great suffering was endured from thirst. The leader, in order to carry more merchandise, had neglected to take a sufficient supply of water. At Buli Baba, a village inhabited by Fula shepherds, the travelers were enabled to recruit and to fill their leathern bottles for a journey across a second desert. 
avoiding foe to toro whose inhabitants are fanatics and thieves parterreau entered bondu he would gladly have evaded visiting boulibane the capital and residence of the almame but was compelled to do so owing to the refusal of the people to supply grain or water to the caravan and also in obedience to the strict orders of major gray who thought the almame would let the travellers pass after paying tribute the terrible almame began by extorting a great number of presents and then refused to allow the english to visit bacal on the senegal they might he said go through his states those of kerita to clego or they might take the fu to toro route both these alternatives were equally impossible as in either case the caravan would have to travel among fanatic tribes the explorers believed that almame's object was to have them robbed and murdered without incurring the personal responsibility they resolved to force their way preparations were scarcely begun for a start when the caravan was surrounded by a multitude of soldiers who taking possession of the wells rendered it impossible for the travellers to carry out their intentions at the same time the war drum was beaten on every side to fight was impossible a palaver had to be held in a word the english had to own their powerlessness the alma may dictated the conditions of peace mulched the whites of a few more presents and ordered them to withdraw by way of fu to toro yet more and this was a flagrant insult to british pride the english found themselves escorted by a guard which prevented their taking any other route when night fell they revenged themselves by setting fire to all their merchandise in the very sight of the faulas who had intended to get possession of them the crossing of the fauta toro among hostile natives was terribly arduous the slightest pretext was seized for a dispute and again and again violence seemed inevitable food and water were only to be obtained at exorbitant prices at last one night parterreau to disarm the suspicion of the natives gave out that he could not carry all his baggage at once and having first filled his coffers and bags with stones he decamped with all his followers for the senegal leaving his tents pitched and his fires alight his path was strewn with bales arms and animals thanks to this subterfuge and the rapidity of their march the english reached bacal in safety where the french welcomed the remnant of the expedition with enthusiasm callier attacked by a fever which nearly proved fatal returned to st louis but not recovering his health there was obliged to go back to france not until eighteen twenty four was he able to return to senegal which was then governed by baron roger who was anxious paris passu to extend our geographical knowledge with our commercial relations roger supplied callier with means to go and live among the Bracknes, there to study arabic and the mussulman religion life amongst the suspicious and fanatic moorish shepherds was by no means easy the traveller who had great difficulty in keeping his daily journal was obliged to resort to all manner of subterfuges to obtain permission to explore the neighbourhood of his house he gives us some curious details of the life of the Bracknas, of their diet, which consists almost entirely of milk, of their habitations, which are nothing more than tents unfitted for the vicissitudes of the climate, of their guerriers, or itinerant minstrels, their mode of producing the excessive embonpoint, which they consider the height of female beauty, the aspect of the country, the fertility and productions of the soil, etc., the most remarkable of all the facts collected by Callier are those relating to the five distinct classes into which the Moorish Bracknas are divided. These are the Hassanes, or warriors, whose idleness, slovenliness, and pride exceed belief, the Marabouts, or priests, the Zenagues, tributary to the Hassanes, the Laratines, and the slaves the zenagues are a miserable class despised by all the others but especially by the hassanes to whom they pay a tribute which is of variable amount and is never considered enough they do all the work both industrial and agricultural and rear all the cattle in spite of my efforts says callier i could find out nothing about the origin of this people or ascertain how they came to be reduced to pay tribute to the moors when i asked them any questions about this they said it was god's will 
can they be a remnant of a conquered tribe and if so how is it that no tradition on the subject is retained amongst them i do not think they can be for the moors proud as they are of their origin never forget the names of those who have brought credit to their families and were such the case the zenigues who form the majority of the population and are skilful warriors would rise under the leadership of one of their chiefs and fling off the yoke of servitude End quote. Laratine is the name given to the offspring of a Moor and a Negro slave. Although they are slaves, the Laratines are never sold, but while living in separate camps are treated very much like the Zenigues. Those who are the sons of Hassanes are warriors, whilst the children of Marabouts are brought up to the profession of their father. The actual slaves are all Negroes, ill-treated, badly fed, and flogged on the slightest pretext. There is no suffering which they are not called upon to endure. In May 1825, Callier returned to St. Louis. Baron Roger was absent, and his representative was by no means friendly. The explorer had to content himself with the pay of a common soldier until the return of his protector, to whom he sent the notes he had made when amongst the Brachnas, but all his offers of service were rejected. He was promised a certain sum on his return from Timbuktu, but how was he even to start without private resources? The intrepid Callier was not, however, to be discouraged. As he obtained neither encouragement nor help from the colonial government, he went to Sierra Leone where the governor, who did not wish to deprive Major Lang of the credit of being the first to arrive at Timbuktu, rejected his proposals. In the management of an indigo factory, Callier soon saved money to the extent of 2,000 francs, a sum which appeared to him sufficient to carry him to the end of the world. He lost no time in purchasing the necessary merchandise, and joined some Mandingos and Saracolettes, or wandering African merchants. He told them, under the seal of secrecy, that he had been born in Egypt of Arab parents, taken to France at an early age, and sent to Senegal to look after the business of his master, who, satisfied with his services, had given him his freedom. He added that his chief desire was to get back to Egypt and resume the Mohammedan religion. On the 22nd of March, 1827, Callier left Freetown for Kakande, a village on the Rio Nunez, where he employed his leisure in collecting information respecting the Landamas and the Nalus, both subject to the Fulas of Fauta Jalan, but not Mohammedans, and as a necessary result, both much given to spiritous liquors. They dwell in the districts watered by the Rio Nunez, side by side with the Bagos, an idolatrous race who dwell at its mouth. The Bagos are light-hearted, industrious, and skillful tillers of the soil. They make large profits out of the sale of their rice and salt. They have no king, no religion, but a barbarous idolatry, and are governed by the oldest man in their village, an arrangement which answers very well. On the 19th April, 1827, Callier, with but one bearer and a guide, at last started for Timbuktu. He speaks favorably of the Fulas and the people of Fouta Jalan, whose rich and fertile country he crossed. The Bafing, the chief affluent of the Senegal, was not more than a hundred paces across, and a foot and a half deep where he passed it, but the force of the current and the huge granite rocks encumbering its bed render it very difficult and dangerous to cross the river. After a halt of nineteen days in the village of Kambaya, the home of the guide who had accompanied him thus far, Callier entered Cancan, crossing a district intersected by rivers and large streams, which were then beginning to inundate the whole land. On the 30th May, the explorer crossed the Tanquiso, a large river with a rocky bed belonging to the system of the Niger, and reached the latter on 11th June at Kuranasa. Even here, says Callier, so near to its source, the Niger is 900 feet wide, with a current of two miles and a half. Before we enter Cancan with the French explorer, it will be well to sum up what he says of the Fulas of Fuota. They are mostly tall, well-made men, with chestnut-brown complexions, curly hair, lofty foreheads, aquiline noses, features in fact very like those of Europeans. They are bigoted Mohammedans and hate Christians. Unlike the Mandingos, they do not travel, but love their home. They are good agriculturalists and clever traders, warlike and patriotic, and they leave none but their old men and women in their villages when they go to war. 
the town of cancan stands in a plain surrounded by lofty mountains the bombax baobab and butter tree also called the say and the shay of mungo park are plentiful callier was delayed in cancan for twenty-eight days before he could get on to the sembatacala and during that time he was shamefully robbed by his host and could not obtain from the chief of the village restitution of the goods which had been stolen cancan says the traveller is a small town near the left bank of the milo a pretty river which comes from the south and waters the kissi district where it takes its rise flowing thence in a northwesterly direction to empty itself into the niger two or three days journey from cancan surrounded by a thick quick-set hedge this town which does not contain more than six thousand inhabitants is situated in an extensive and very fertile plain of grey sand on every side are pretty little villages called warundas where the slaves live these habitations give interest to the scene and are surrounded by very fine plantations yams rice onions pistachio nuts etc are exported in large quantities between cancan and wasolo the road led through well cultivated and at this time of year nearly submerged districts the inhabitants struck callier as being of a mild cheerful and inquiring disposition they gave him a cordial welcome several tributaries of the niger including the serrano were passed before a halt was made at sigala the residence of baranusa the chief of wasolo he was of slovenly habits like his subjects and used tobacco both as snuff and for smoking he was said to be very rich in gold and slaves his subjects paid him a tribute in cattle he had a great many wives each of whom owned a hut of her own their houses forming a little village with well cultivated environs here callier for the first time saw the ramus lotus mentioned by park on leaving wasolo callier entered fulu whose inhabitants like those of the former district are idolaters of slovenly habits they speak the mandingo tongue at San Batacala, the traveller paid a visit to the Almame. We entered, he says, a place which served him as a bedroom for himself and a stable for his horse. The prince's bed was at the further end. It consisted of a little platform raised six inches from the ground, on which was stretched an ox hide with a dirty mosquito curtain to keep off the insects. There was no other furniture in this royal abode. Two saddles hung from stakes driven into the wall, a large straw hat, a drum only used in wartime, a few lances, a bow, a quiver, and some arrows were the only ornaments. A lamp made of a piece of flat iron set on a stand of the same metal stood on the ground. This lamp was fed by a kind of vegetable matter, not thick enough to be made into candles. End quote. The Almame soon informed Callier of an opportunity for him to go to Tima, whence a caravan was about to start for Jenna. The travellers then entered the province of Bambara and quickly arrived at the pretty little village of Tima, inhabited by Mohammedan Mandingos, and bounded on the east by a chain of mountains about 350 fathoms high. When he entered this village at the end of July, Callier little dreamt of the long stay he would be compelled to make in it he had hurt his foot and the wound became very much inflamed by walking in wet grass he therefore decided to let the caravan for jenna go on without him and remain at Tima until his foot should be completely healed it would have been too great a risk for him in this state to travel through bambara where the idolatrous inhabitants of the country would be pretty sure to rob him the bambaras he says have few slaves, go almost naked, and are always armed with bows and arrows. They are governed by a number of petty independent chiefs who are often at war with one another. They are in fact rude and wild creatures as compared with the tribes who have embraced Mohammedanism. End quote. Callier was detained at Tima by the still unhealed wound in his foot until the 10th November. At that date he proposed starting for Jenna, but, to quote his own words, I was now seized with violent pains in the jaws, warning me that I was attacked with scurvy, a terrible malady, all the horrors of which I was to realize. My palate was completely skinned, 
part of the bone came away my teeth seemed ready to fall out of the gums my sufferings were terrible i feared that my brain might be affected by the agony of pain in my head i was more than a fortnight without an instant's sleep End quote. To make matters worse, the wound broke out afresh, and he would have been cured neither of it nor of the scurvy, had it not been for the energetic treatment of an old negress, who was accustomed to doctor the scorbutic affections so common in that country. End of section 12section thirteen of celebrated travels and travelers volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana celebrated travels and travelers volume three the great explorers and travelers of the nineteenth century by jules verne first part chapter two part two the exploration and colonization of africa six on the ninth january eighteen twenty eight Callier left Timay and reached Kimba, a little village where the caravan for Jenna was assembled. Near to this village rises the chain erroneously called Kong, which is the general name for mountain amongst the Mandingos. The names of the villages entered by the travelers and the incidents of the journey through Bambara are of no special interest. The inhabitants are accounted great thieves by the Mandingos, but are probably not more dishonest than their critics. The Bambara women all wear a thin slip of wood embedded in the lower lip, a strange fashion exactly similar to that noticed by Cook amongst the natives of the northwestern coast of America. The Bambaras speak Mandingo, though they have a dialect of their own called Kisur, about which the traveler could obtain no trustworthy written information. Jenna was formerly called the Golden Land. The precious metal is not, however, found there, but a good deal is imported by the Burech merchants and the Mandingos of Kong. Jenna, two miles and a half in circumference, is surrounded by a mud wall ten feet high. The houses, built of bricks baked in the sun, are as large as those of European peasants. They have all terraces, but no outer windows. Numbers of foreigners frequent Jenna. The inhabitants, as many as eight or ten thousand, are very industrious and intelligent. They hire out their slaves, and also employ them in various handicrafts. The Moors, however, monopolize the more important commerce. Not a day passes that they do not dispatch huge boats laden with rice, millet, cotton, honey, vegetable butter, and other native products. In spite of this great commercial movement, the prosperity of Jenna was threatened. Sago Amadou, chief of the country, impelled by bigoted zeal, made fierce war upon the Bambaras of Sago, whom he wished to rally round the standard of the Prophet. This struggle did a great deal of harm to the trade of Jenna, for it interrupted intercourse with Yamana, Sansanding, Bamako, and Boreh, which were the chief marts for its produce. The women of Jenna would not be true to their sex if they did not show some marks of coquetry. Those who aim at fashion pass a ring or a glass ornament through the nostrils, whilst their poorer sisters content themselves with a bit of pink silk. During Callier's long stay at Jenna, he was loaded with kindness and attentions by the Moors, to whom he had told the fabulous tale about his birth in Egypt and abduction by the army of occupation. On the 23rd March, the traveler embarked on the Niger for Timbuktu, on which the sheriff, won over by the gift of an umbrella, had obtained a passage for him. He carried with him letters of introduction to the chief persons in Timbuktu. Callier now passed in succession the pretty villages of Kira, Taguisha, Sanka Gorbilla, Daibeh, and Issaka, near to which the river is joined by an important branch, which makes a great bend beyond Sago, catching sight also of Wandakora, Wanga, Korakuila, and Kona, finally reaching on the 2nd of April the mouth of the important Lake Debo. 
land says callier is visible on every side of this lake except on the west where it widens out like a vast inland sea following its northern coast in a west-northwest direction for a distance of fifteen miles you leave on the left a tongue of level ground which runs several miles to the south seeming to bar the passage of the lake and form a kind of strait beyond this barrier the lake stretches away out of sight in the west the barrier i have just described cuts lake debo into two parts the upper and lower that navigable to boats contains three islands and is very wide it stretches away a short distance on the east and is supplemented by an immense number of huge marshes one after the other callier now passed the fishing village of gabibi tangoon in the diraman country a district stretching far away on the east kadosa an important commercial town barkanga lelub garfolo barakandi tirsi tabakiola salakiola kora koratu where the tuaricks exact a toll from passing boats and finally reached cabra built on a height out of reach of the overflowing of the niger and serving as the port of timbuktu on the twentieth callier disembarked and started for that city which he entered at sundown i at last cries our hero saw the capital of the soudan which had so long been the goal of my desires as i entered that mysterious town an object of curiosity to the civilized nations of europe i was filled with indescribable exultation i never experienced anything like it and my delight knew no bounds but i had to moderate my transports and it was to god alone i confided them with what earnestness i thanked him for the success which had crowned my enterprise and the signal protection he had accorded me in so many apparently insurmountable difficulties and perils my first emotions having subsided i found that the scene before me by no means came up to my expectations i had conceived a very different idea of the grandeur and wealth of this town at first sight it appeared nothing more than a mass of badly built houses whilst on every side stretched vast plains of arid yellowish shifting sands the sky was of a dull red colour on the horizon all nature seemed melancholy profound silence prevailed not so much as the song of a bird was heard and yet there was something indescribably imposing in the sight of a large town rising up in the midst of the sandy desert and the beholder cannot but admire the indomitable energy of its founders i fancy the river formerly passed nearer the town of timbuktu it is now eight miles north of it and five of cabra End quote. timbuktu which is neither so large nor so well populated as callier expected is altogether wanting in animation there are no large caravans constantly arriving in it as at jenna nor are there so many strangers there as in the latter town whilst the market held at three o'clock in the morning on account of the heat appears deserted timbuktu is inhabited by kisur negroes who seem of mild dispositions and are employed in trade there is no government and strictly speaking no central authority each town and village has its own chief the mode of life is patriarchal a great many moorish merchants are settled in the town and rapidly make fortunes there they receive consignments of merchandise from adrar tafile Ghat, gadams algiers tunis and tripoli to timbuktu is brought all the salt of all the mines of tudeni packed on camels it is imported in slabs bound together by ropes made from grass in the neighborhood of tandie timbuktu is built in the form of a triangle and measures about three miles in circumference the houses are large but not lofty and are built of round bricks the streets are wide and clean there are seven mosques each surmounted by a square tower from which the muezzin calls the faithful to prayer counting the floating population the capital of the sudan does not contain more than from ten to twelve thousand inhabitants timbuktu situated in the midst of a vast plain of shifting white sand trades in salt only the soil being quite unsuitable to any sort of cultivation the town is always full of people who come to exact what they call presents but what might with more justice be styled forced contributions 
it is a public calamity when the tuareg chief arrives he remains in the town a couple of months living with his numerous followers at the expense of the inhabitants until he has wrung costly presents from them terror has extended the domination of these wandering tribes over all the neighboring peoples whom they rob and pillage without mercy the Tuareg costume is the same as that of the Arabs, with the exception of the headdress. Day and night they wear a cotton band which covers the eyes and comes down over the nose, so that they are obliged to raise the head in order to see. The same band goes once or twice around the head and hides the mouth, coming down below the chin, so that the tip of the nose is all that is visible. The Tuareks are perfect riders, and mounted on first-rate horses or on fleet camels, each man is armed with a spear, a shield, and a dagger. They are the pirates of the desert, and innumerable are the caravans they have robbed or blackmailed. Four days after Callier's arrival at Timbuktu, he heard that a caravan was about to start for Talafet. And as he knew that another would not go for three months, fearing detection, he resolved to join this one it consisted of a large number of merchants and six hundred camels starting on the fourth of may eighteen twenty eight he arrived after terrible sufferings from the heat and a sandstorm in which he was caught at el arawan a town of no private resources but important as the emporium for the tudani salt exported at san sanding on the banks of the niger and also as the halting place of caravans from taflet mogador gat drat and tripoli the merchants here exchanging european wares for ivory gold slaves wax honey and sudan stuffs on the 19th May, the caravan left El Arwan for Morocco by way of the Sahara. To the traveler's usual sufferings from heat, thirst, and privations of all kinds was now added the pain of a wound incurred in the fall from his camel. He was also taunted by the Moors and even by their slaves, who ridiculed his habits and his awkwardness, and even sometimes threw stones at him when his back was turned towards them. Often, says Callier, one of the moors would say to me in a contemptuous tone you see that slave well i prefer him to you so you may guess in what esteem i hold you this insult would be accompanied with roars of laughter under these miserable circumstances callier passed the wells of tarzas in whose vicinity salt is found also those of amul gamil amul taf el ikrif surrounded by date trees wood willows and rushes and reached marabouti and el harib districts whose inhabitants are disgustingly dirty in their habits el harib lies between two chains of low hills dividing it from morocco to which it is tributary its inhabitants divided into several nomad tribes employ themselves chiefly in the breeding of camels they would be rich and contented but for the ceaseless exactions of the berber arabs on the twelfth july the caravan left el harib and eleven days later entered the province of talafet famous for its majestic date trees at Gorland, Callier was welcomed with some kindness by the Moors, though he was not admitted to their houses, lest the women, who are visible only to the men of their own families, should be seen by the irreverent eyes of a stranger. Callier visited the market, which is held three times a week, near the little village called Bohem, three miles from Gorland, and was surprised at the variety of articles exposed for sale in it. Vegetables, native fruits, fodder for cattle, poultry sheep etc etc all in large quantities water in leather bottles was carried about for sale to all who cared to drink in the exhausting heat by men who announced their approach by ringing a small handbell moorish and spanish coins alone passed current the province of tafilet contains several large villages and small towns gorland el exeba soso Bohem and Resant, which our travellers visited, contained some twelve hundred inhabitants each, all merchants and owners of property. The soil is very productive. Corn, vegetables, dates, European fruits, and tobacco are cultivated in large quantities. Among the sources of wealth in Tafilet, we may name very fine sheep, whose beautifully white wool makes very pretty coverlets, oxen, first-rate horses, donkeys, and mules. 
as at eldra a good many jews live in the villages together with mohammedans they lead a miserable life go about half naked and are constantly struck and insulted whether brokers shoemakers blacksmiths porters or whatever their ostensible occupation they all lend money to the moors on the second august the caravan resumed its march and after passing afelech taniera marka deira rahaba el Irak, tamarac ain zeland el guim guigo and sapporo Callier arrived at fez where he made a short stay and then pressed on to rabat the ancient salah exhausted by his long march with nothing to eat but a few dates obliged to depend on the charity of the mussulmans who as often as not declined to give him anything and finding at fez no representative of france but an old jew named ismail who acted as consular agent and who being afraid of compromising himself would not let callier embark on a portuguese brig bound for gibraltar the traveller eagerly availed himself of a fortunate chance for going to tangiers there he was kindly received by the vice-council m de la porte who wrote at once to the commandant of the french station at cadiz and sent him off bound for that port disguised as a sailor in a corvette the landing at toulon of the young frenchman fresh from timbuktu was a very unexpected event in the scientific world with nothing to aid him but his own invincible courage and patience he had brought to a satisfactory conclusion an exploit for which the french and english geographical societies had offered large rewards alone without any resources to speak of without the aid of government or of any scientific society by sheer force of will he had succeeded in throwing a flood of new light on an immense tract of africa callier was not indeed the first european who had visited timbuktu in the preceding year major laying had penetrated into that mysterious city but he had paid for his expedition with his life and we shall presently relate the touching details of his fatal trip Callier had returned to Europe, and brought back with him the curious journal from which our narrative is taken. It is true his profession of the Mohammedan faith had prevented him from taking astronomical observations, and from making sketches and notes freely, but only at the price of his seeming apostasy could he have passed through the region where the very name of a Christian is held in abhorrence how many strange observations how many fresh and exact details did callier add to our knowledge of northwest africa it had cost clapperton two journeys to traverse africa from tripoli to benin callier had crossed from senegal to morocco in one but at what a price how much fatigue how much suffering how many privations had the frenchman endured timbuktu was known at last as well as the new caravan route across the sahara by way of the oasis of tafilet and el harib was callier compensated for his physical and mental sufferings by the aid which the geographical society sent to him at once by the prize of ten thousand francs adjudged to him by the cross of the legion of honor and the fame and glory attached to his name we suppose he was he says more than once in his narrative that nothing but his wish to add by his discoveries to the glory of france his native country could have sustained him under the trying circumstances and insults to which he was constantly subjected all honor then to the patient traveller the sincere patriot the great discoverer we have still to speak of the expedition which cost alexander gordon laying his life but before giving our necessarily brief account for his journals were all lost we must say a few words about his early life and an interesting excursion made by him to timini kuran and sulemana when he discovered the sources of the niger laying was born in edinburgh in seventeen ninety four entered the english army at the age of sixteen and soon distinguished himself in eighteen twenty he had gained the rank of lieutenant and was serving as aide-de-camp to sir charles mccarthy then governor-general of western africa at this time war was raging between amara the mandingo almame and sanasi one of his principal chiefs trade had never been very flourishing in sierra leone and this state of things dealt it its death blow 
mccarthy anxious to put matters on a better footing determined to interfere and bring about a reconciliation between the rival chiefs he decided on sending an embassy to cambia on the border of the scarces and from thence to malacuri and the mandingo camp the enterprising character intelligence and courage of laing led to his being chosen by the governor as his envoy and on the seventh january eighteen twenty two he received instructions to report on the manufacturers and topography of the provinces mentioned and to ascertain the feeling of the inhabitants on the abolition of slavery the first interview with yaradi leader of the sulemana troops accompanying the alamame proved that the negroes of the districts under notice had only the vaguest idea on european civilization and that they had had but little intercourse with the whites every article of our dress says liang was a subject of admiration observing me pull off my gloves yaredi stared covered his widely opened mouth with his hands and at length exclaimed allah akbar he has pulled the skin off his hands by degrees and as he became more familiar he alternately rubbed down dr mackey's hair and mine then indulging himself in a loud laugh he would exclaim they are not men they are not men he repeatedly asked my interpreter if we had bones End quote these preliminary excursions during which lang ascertained that many sulemanas owned a good deal of gold and ivory led to his asking the governor's sanction to explore the districts to the east of the colony with a view to increasing the trade of sierra leone by admitting their productions mccarthy liked lang's proposal and submitted it to the council it was decided that lang should be authorized to penetrate into sulemana by the most convenient route for future communications lang left sierra leone on the sixteenth april eighteen twenty four and rode up the rocal river to rakan the chief town of Temeni. his interview with the king of rakan was extremely amusing to do him honor lang had a salvo of ten charges fired as he came into the court in which the reception was to be held at the noise the king stopped drew back darted a furious look at his visitor and ran away it was with great difficulty that the cowardly monarch was induced to return at last he came back and seating himself with great dignity in his chair of state he questioned the major he wished to know says lang why he had been fired at and was with some difficulty persuaded that it had been done out of honor to him why did you point your guns to the ground that you might see our intention was to show you respect but the pebbles flew in my face why did you not point in the air because we feared to burn the thatches on your houses well then give me some rum End quote. needless to add that the interview became more cordial after the major had complied with his request the portrait of the timony monarch deserves a place in our volume for more than one reason it is a case of ab uno disciomnes ba samira to quote laying again the principal chief or king of this part of the timony country is about ninety years of age with a mottled shriveled up skin resembling in color that of an alligator more than that of a human being with dim greenish eyes far sunk in his head and a bleached twisted beard hanging down about two feet from his chin like the king of the opposite district he wore a necklace of coral and leopard's teeth but his mantle was brown and dirty as his skin his swollen legs like those of an elephant were to be observed from under his trousers of baft which might have been originally white but from the wear of several years had assumed a greenish appearance End quote. End of section thirteen section fourteen of celebrated travels and travelers volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana celebrated travels and travelers volume three the great explorers and travelers of the nineteenth century by jules verne first part chapter two part two the exploration and colonization of africa seven like his predecessors in africa 
laying had to go through many discussions about the right of passage through the country and bearers wages but thanks to his firmness he managed to escape the extortions of the negro kings the chief halting places on the route taken by the major were toma where a white man had never before been seen balandico rokechnik which he ascertained to be situated in north latitude eight degrees thirty minutes and west longitude twelve degrees eleven minutes a being beyond a very broad stream flowing north of the raquel and mayaso the chief frontier town of timini in timini lang made acquaintance with a singular institution a kind of freemasonry known as pura the existence of which on the borders of the rio nunez had already been ascertained by callier their power that of the pura says liang supersedes even that of the headmen of the districts and their deeds of secrecy and darkness are as little called in question or inquired into as those of the inquisition were in europe in former years i have endeavoured in vain to trace the origin or cause of formation of this extraordinary association and have reason to suppose that it is now unknown to the generality of the timonese and may possibly be even so to the pura themselves in a country where no traditionary records are extant either in writing or in song end quote so far as laing could ascertain timini is divided into three districts the chief of each arrogates to himself the title of king the soil is fairly productive and rice yams guavas earth nuts and bananas might be grown in plenty but for the lazy vicious and avaricious character of the inhabitants who vie with each other in roguery i think says lane that a few hoes flails rakes shovels etc would be very acceptable to them when their respective uses were practically explained and that they would prove more beneficial both to their interest and ours than the guns cocked hats and mountebank coats with which they are at present supplied in spite of our traveller's philanthropic wish things have not changed since his time the negroes are just as fond of intoxicating drinks and their petty kings still go about wearing on grand occasions hats the shape of an accordion and blue coats with copper buttons with no shirts underneath the maternal sentiment did not seem to laying to be very fully developed amongst the people of timini for he was twice roundly abused by women for refusing to buy their children of them a few days later there was a great tumult raised against laying the white man who had inflicted a fatal blow on the prosperity of the country by checking its trade the first town entered in Caranco was Maboum, and it is interesting to note en passant what liang says of the activity of the inhabitants Quote, i entered the town about sunset and received a first impression highly favorable to its inhabitants who were returning from their respective labors of the day every individual bearing about him proofs of his industrious occupation some had been engaged in preparing the fields for the crops which the approaching rains were to mature others were penning up cattle those whose sleek sides and good condition denoted the richness of their pasturages the last clink of the blacksmith's hammer was sounding the weaver was measuring the quantity of cloth he had woven during the day and the garange or worker in leather was tying up his neatly stained pouches shoes knife scabbards etc the work of his handicraft in a large kotako or bag while the crier at the mosque with the melancholy call of allah akbar uttered at measured intervals summoned the devots moslems to their evening devotions had a marahat or henri renault transferred to canvas a scene like this when the dazzling light of the sun is beginning to die away in green and rose tints might he not aptly name his painting the rateur de chance a title so often given to landscapes in our misty climate this scene adds laying both by its nature and the sentiment which it inspired formed an agreeable contrast with the noise confusion and the dissipation which pervaded a timony town at the same hour but one must not trust too much to appearances and i regret to add that the subsequent conduct of the Korenko natives did not confirm the good opinion which i had formed of them End quote. 
the traveller now passed through kufala where he was very kindly received crossed a pleasant undulating district shut in by the korango hills and halted at samira where the chief ordered his gorarat to celebrate in song the arrival of his guest a welcome neutralized by the fact that the house assigned to laying let in the rain through its leaky roof and would not let out the smoke so that to use his own words he was more like a chimney sweeper than the white guest of the king of samira laying afterwards visited the source of the tangolet a tributary of the roquel and then left coranco to enter sulemana coranco into which our traveller did not penetrate beyond the frontier is of vast extent and divided into a great number of small states the inhabitants resemble the mandingos in language and costume but they are neither so well looking nor so intelligent they do not profess mohammedanism and have implicit confidence in their grigri they are fairly industrious they know how to sew and weave their chief object of commerce is rosewood or cam which they send to the coast the products of the country are much the same as those of tibani Comia, north latitude nine degrees twenty two minutes is the first town in sulemana Lang then visited Semba, a wealthy and populous city, where he was received by a band of musicians, who welcomed him with a deafening, if not harmonious, flourish of trumpets, and he finally reached Falaba, the capital of the country. The king received Lang with special marks of esteem. He had assembled a large body of troops, whom he passed in review, making them execute various maneuvers, accompanied by the blowing of trumpets, beating of tambourines, and the playing of violins and other native instruments. This fantasia almost deafened the visitor. Then came a number of guirats, who sang of the greatness of the king, the happy arrival of the major, with the fortunate results which were to ensue from his visit for the prosperity of the country and the development of commerce. Laying profited by the king's friendliness to ask his permission to visit the source of the Niger, but was answered by all manner of objections on the score of the danger of the expedition. At last, however, his majesty yielded to the persuasions of his visitor, telling him that, quote, as his heart panted after the water, he might go to it, end quote. The major had not, however, left Falaba two hours before the permission was rescinded, and he had to give up an enterprise which had justly appeared to him of great importance. A few days later he obtained leave to visit the source of the Raquel, or Sail Congo, a river of which nothing was known before his time beyond Rokon. From the summit of a lofty rock, Laing saw Mount Loma, the highest of the chain of which it forms part. The point, says the traveller, from which the Niger issues was now shown to me. It appeared to be at the same level on which I stood, viz. 1,600 feet above the level of the Atlantic, the source of the Raquel, which I had already measured, being 1,470 feet. The view from this hill amply compensated for my lacerated feet, having ascertained correctly the situation of the Concadigor and that of the hill upon which I was at this time, the first by observation and the second by account, and having taken the bearings of Loma from both, I cannot err much in laying down its position in 9 degrees 25 minutes north and 9 degrees 45 minutes west. End quote. Laing had now spent three months in Sulamama and had made many excursions. It is a very picturesque country in which alternate hills, valleys, and fertile plains, bordered by woods and adorned with thickets of luxuriant trees. The soil is fertile and requires very little cultivation. The harvests are abundant and rice grows well oxen sheep goats and a small species of poultry with a few horses are the chief domestic animals of the people of sulimama the wild beasts of which there are a good many are elephants buffaloes a kind of antelope monkeys and leopards falaba which takes its name from the falaba river on which it is situated is about a mile and a half long by one broad 
the houses are closer together than in most african towns and it contains some six thousand inhabitants its position as a fortified town is well chosen built on an eminence in the centre of a plain which is under water in the rainy season it is surrounded by a very strong wooden palisade proof against every engine of war except artillery strange to say in sulimama the occupations of men and women seem to be reversed the latter work in the fields except at seed time and harvest build the houses act as masons barbers and surgeons whilst the men attend to the dairy milk the cows sew and wash the linen on the seventeenth september laying started on his return journey to sierra leone bearing presents from the king and escorted for several miles by a vast crowd he finally reached the english colony in safety laying's trip through timini Coranco, and sulimana was not without importance it opened up districts hitherto unknown to europeans and introduced us to the manners occupations and trade of the people as well as to the products of the country at the same time the course was traced and a source discovered of the raquel whilst for the first time definite information was obtained as to the sources of the niger for although our traveller had not actually visited them he had gone near enough to determine their position approximately the results obtained by laying on this journey only fired his ambition for further discoveries he therefore determined to make his way to timbuktu on the seventeenth june eighteen twenty five he embarked at malta for tripoli where he joined a caravan with which hatita the tuareg chief who had made such friends with leon was also travelling as far as Ghat. after two months halt at gadamiz lang again started in october and reached insala which he places a good deal further west than his predecessors had done here he remained from november eighteen twenty five to january eighteen twenty six and then made his way to the wadi ghat intending to go from thence at once to timbuktu making a tour of lake jenna or debi visiting the mali country and tracing the niger to its mouth he would then have retraced his steps as far as sakatu visited lake chad and attempted to reach the hill outside ghat the caravan with which lang was travelling was attacked some say by tuareks others by berber arabs a tribe living near the niger lang says callier who got his information at timbuktu was recognized as a christian and horribly ill-treated he was beaten with a stick until he was left for dead i suppose that the other christian whom they told me was beaten to death was one of the major's servants the moors of lang's caravan picked him up and succeeded by dint of great care in recalling him to life so soon as he regained consciousness he was placed on his camel to which he had to be tied he was too weak to be able to sit up the robbers had left him nothing the greater part of his baggage had been rifled laying arrived at timbuktu on the eighteenth august eighteen twenty six and recovered from his wounds his convalescence was slow but he was fortunately spared the extortions of the natives owing to the letters of introduction he had brought with him from tripoli and to the sedulous care of his host a native of that city according to callier who quotes this remarkable fact from an old native laying retained his european costume and gave out that he had been sent by his master the king of england to visit timbuktu and describe the wonders it contained it appears adds the french traveller that laying drew the plan of the city in public for the same moor told me in his naive and expressive language that he had written the town and everything in it after a careful examination of timbuktu lang who had good reason to fear the chiraks paid a visit by night to cabra and looked down on the waters of the niger instead of returning to europe by way of the great desert he was very anxious to go past jenna and sago to the french settlements in senegal but at the first hint of his purpose to the fowlers who crowded to stare at him he was told that a nazarene could not possibly be allowed to set foot in their country and that if he dared attempt it they would make him repent it lang was therefore driven to go by way of el arwan where he hoped to join a caravan of moorish merchants taking salt to san sanding 
but five days after he left Timbuktu, his caravan was joined by a fanatic sheik named Hamed Ul Habib, chief of the Zawat tribe, and Laying was at once arrested under pretense of his having entered their country without authorization. The major, being urged to profess Mohammedanism, preferring death to apostasy, a discussion then took place between the sheik and his hired assassins as to how the victim should be put to death, and finally Laying was strangled by two slaves. His body was left unburied in the desert. This was all Callier was able to find out when he visited Timbuktu, but one year after Major Laying's death. We have supplemented his accounts by a few details gathered from the reports of the Royal Geographical Society, for the Traveler's Journal and the notes he took are alike lost to us. We have already told how Laying managed to fix pretty accurately the position of the sources of the Niger. We have also described the efforts made by Mungo Park and Clapperton to trace the middle portion of the course of that river. We have now to narrate the journeys made in order to examine its mouth and the lower part of its course. The earliest and most successful of that was Richard Lander, formerly Clapperton's servant. Richard Lander and his brother John proposed to the English government that they should be sent to explore the Niger to its mouth. Their offer was accepted, and they embarked on a government vessel for Badagery, where they arrived on the 19th March, 1830. The king of the country, Aduli, of which Richard Lander retained a friendly remembrance, was in low spirits. His town had just been burnt, his generals and his best soldiers had perished in a battle with the people of Lagos, and he himself had had a narrow escape when his house and all his treasures were destroyed by fire. He determined to retrieve his losses, and to do so at the expense of the travelers, who could not get permission to penetrate into the interior of the country until they had been robbed of their most valuable merchandise, and compelled to sign drafts in payment for a gunboat with a hundred men, for two puncheons of rum, twenty barrels of powder, and a large quantity of merchandise, which they knew perfectly well would never be delivered by this monarch, who was as greedy of gain as he was drunken. As a matter of course, the natives followed the example of their chief, vied with him in selfishness, greed, and meanness, regarded the English as fair spoil, and fleeced them on every opportunity. At last, on the 31st March, Richard and John Lander succeeded in getting away from Badagery, and, preceded by an escort sent in advance by the king, arrived at Katunga on the 13th May, having halted by the way at Wauwau, a good-sized town, Bidgey, where Pierce and Morrison had been taken ill, Jenna, Chow, Ega, all towns visited by Clapperton, Angua, where Pierce died, Asanara, the first walled city they saw, Bohu, formerly capital of Yoruba, Jaguta, Liaguada, and Icho, where there is a famous market. At Katanga, according to custom, the travelers halted under a tree before they were received by the king. But being tired of waiting, they presently went to the residence of Ebo, the chief eunuch, and the most influential man about the person of the sovereign. A diabolical noise of cymbals, trumpets, and drums, all played together, announced the approach of the white men, and Mansola, the king, gave them a most hearty welcome, ordering Ebo to behead every one who should molest them. The landers, fearful of being detained by Mansola until the rainy season, acted on Ebo's advice and said nothing about the Niger, but merely spoke of the death of their fellow countrymen at Busa twenty years before, adding that the King of England had sent them to the Sultan of Yari to recover his papers. Although Mansola did not treat the brothers Lander quite as graciously as he had treated Clapperton, he allowed them to go eight days after their arrival. Of the many details given in the original account of the lander's journey, of Katunga and the province of Yoruba, we will only quote the following. Quote, Katunga has by no means answered the expectations we had been led to form of it, either as regards its prosperity or the number of its inhabitants. 
the vast plain on which it stands although exceedingly fine yields in verdure and fertility and simple beauty of appearance to the delightful country surrounding the less celebrated city of Buhu. its market is tolerably well supplied with provisions which are however exceedingly dear insomuch that with the exception of disgusting insects reptiles and vermin the lower classes of the people are almost unacquainted with the taste of animal food mansola's carelessness and the imbecile cowardice of his subjects had enabled the philatas to establish themselves in Yeriba, to entrench themselves in its fortified towns and to obtain the recognition of their independence until they became sufficiently strong to assume an absolute sovereignty over the whole country from katunga the landers travelled to borgo by way of atupa bumbum a town much frequented by the merchants of Husa, Borghu, and other provinces trading with Ganja, Kisha, on the frontiers of Yoruba, and Musa, on the river of the same name, beyond which they were met by an escort sent to join them by the Sultan of Borghu. Sultan Yarrow received them with many expressions of pleasure and kindness, showing special delight at seeing Richard Lander again. Although he was a convert to Mohammedanism, Yarrow evidently put more faith in the superstitions of his forefathers than in his new creed. Fetishes and grigories were hung over his door, and in one of his huts there was a square stool supported on two sides by four little wooden effigies of men. The character, manners, and costumes of the people of Borku differ essentially from those of the natives of Yoruba. Perhaps no two people in the universe residing so near each other, says the narrative, differ more widely than the natives of Yoruba and Borku. The former are perpetually engaged in trading with each other from town to town. The latter never quit their towns except in case of war or when engaged in predatory excursions. The former are pusillanimous and cowardly. The latter are bold and courageous full of spirit and energy and never seem happier than when engaged in martial exercises the former are generally mild unassuming humble and honest but cold and passionless the latter are proud and haughty too vain to be civil and too shrewd to be honest yet they appear to understand somewhat of the nature of love and social affections are warm in their attachments and keen in their resentments end quote on the seventeenth june our travellers at last came in sight of the city of busa great was their surprise at finding that town on the mainland and not as clapperton had said on an island in the niger they entered busa by the western gate and were almost immediately introduced to the presence of the king and of the mediki or queen who told them that they had both that very morning shed tears over the fate of clapperton the niger or Quora, which flows below the city, was the first object of interest visited by the brothers. This morning, writes the traveller, we visited the far-famed Niger or Quora, which flows by the city about a mile from our residence, and were greatly disappointed at the appearance of this celebrated river. Bleak, rugged rocks rose abruptly from the centre of the stream, causing strong ripples and eddies on its surface. It is said that a few miles above Busa, the river is divided into three branches by two small fertile islands, and that it flows from hence in one continued stream to Funda. The Niger here, in its widest part, is not more than a stone's throw across at present. The rock on which we sat overlooks the spot where Mr. Park and his associates met their unhappy fate. End quote. Richard Lander made his preliminary inquiries respecting the books and papers belonging to Mungo Park's expedition with great caution, but presently, reassured by the Sultan's kindness, he determined to question him as to the fate of the explorer. Yarrow was, however, too young at the time of the catastrophe to be able to remember what had occurred. It had taken place two reigns back, but he promised he would have a search instituted for relics of the illustrious traveller in the afternoon says richard lander the king came to see us followed by a man with a book under his arm which was said to have been picked up in the niger after the loss of our countrymen it was enveloped in a large cotton cloth and our hearts beat high with expectation as the man was slowly unfolding it for by its size we guessed it to be mr park's journal 
but our disappointment and chagrin were great when on opening the book we discovered it to be an old nautical publication of the last century there was then no further hope of recovering park's journal end of section fourteen Section 15 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3, The Great Explorers and Travelers of the Nineteenth Century, by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 2, Part 2, The Exploration and Colonization of Africa, 8. On the 23rd June, the landers left Busa, filled with gratitude to the king, who had given them valuable presents, and warned them to accept no food, lest it should be poisoned, from any but the governors of the places they should pass through. They traveled alongside of the Niger as far as the Kagogi, where they embarked in a wretched native canoe, whilst their horses were sent on by land to Yaori. We had proceeded only a few hundred yards, said Lander, when the river gradually widened to two miles, and continued as far as the eye could reach. It looked very much like an artificial canal, the steep banks confining the water like low walls, with vegetation beyond. In most places the water was extremely shallow, but in others it was deep enough to float a frigate. During the first two hours of the day the scenery was as interesting and picturesque as can be imagined. The banks were literally covered with hamlets and villages, fine trees bending under the weight of their dark and impenetrable foliage everywhere relieved the eye from the glare of the sun's rays and contrasted with the lively verdure of the little hills and plains produced the most pleasing effect all of a sudden came a total change of scene to the banks of dark earth clay or sand succeeded black rugged rocks and that wide mirror which reflected the skies was divided into a thousand little channels by great sandbanks a little further on the stream was barred by a wall of black rocks a single narrow opening through which its waters rushed furiously down at this place there is a portage above which the niger flows on restored to its former breadth repose and grandeur after three days navigation the landers reached a village where they found horses and men waiting for them and whence they quickly made their way through a continuously hilly country to the town of yaori where they were welcomed by the sultan a stout dirty slovenly man who received them in a kind of farmyard cleanly way the sultan who was disappointed that clapperton had not visited him and that richard lander had omitted to pay his respects on his return journey was very exacting to his present guests he would give them none of the provisions they wanted and did all he could to detain them as long as possible we may add that food was very dear at yaori and that richard lander had no merchandise for barter except a quantity of quote, white chapel sharps warranted not to cut in the eye, end quote, for the very good reason, he tells us, that most of them had no eyes at all, so that they were all but worthless. They were able, however, to turn to account some empty tins which had contained soups. The labels, although dirty and tarnished, were much admired by the natives, one of whom strutted proudly about for some days wearing an empty tin on his head, bearing four labels of, quote, concentrated essence of meat. Quote. the sultan would not permit the englishmen to enter naife or bornu and told them there was nothing for them but to go back to busa richard lander at once wrote to the king of that town asking permission to buy a canoe in which to go to funda as the road by land was infested by plundering falatas at last on the twenty sixth july a messenger arrived from the king of busa to inquire into the strange conduct of the sultan of yaori and the cause of his detention of the white men after an imprisonment of five weeks the landers were at last allowed to leave yaori which was now almost entirely inundated 
the explorers now ascended the niger to the confluence of the cubby and then went down it again to busa where the king who was glad to see them again received them with the utmost cordiality they were however detained longer than they liked by the necessity of paying a visit to the king of wauwau as well as by the difficulty of getting a boat moreover there was some delay in the return of the messengers who had been sent by the king of busa to the different chiefs on the banks of the river and lastly back in rawa the dark water had to be consulted in order to ensure the safety of the travellers in their journey to the sea on taking leave of the king the brothers were at a loss to express their gratitude for his kindness and hospitality his zeal in their cause and the protection he was ever ready to extend during their stay of nearly two months in his capital the natives showed great regret at losing their visitors and knelt in the path of the brothers praying with uplifted hands to their gods on their behalf now began the descent of the niger a halt had to be made at the island of melali whose chief begged the white men to accept a very fine kid we may be sure that they were too polite to refuse it the landers next passed the large town of congi the sanga of clapperton and then inguazilagi the rendezvous of merchants travelling between nuaf and the districts northeast of borghu below inguazilagi they halted at patashi a large fertile island of great beauty planted with palm groves and magnificent trees as this place was not far from wauwau richard lander sent a message to the king of that town who however declined to deliver the canoe which had been purchased of him the messenger failing in his purpose the brothers were compelled themselves to visit the king but as they expected they got only evasive answers they had now no choice if they wished to continue their journey but to make off with the canoes which had been lent them at patashi on fourth october after further delays they resumed their course and being carried down by the current were soon out of sight of lever or laeba and its wretched inhabitants the first town the brothers came to was bajibu a large and spacious city which for dirt noise and confusion could not be surpassed next came lichi inhabited by nuf people and the island of madj where the niger divides into three parts just beyond the travellers suddenly found themselves opposite a remarkable rock two hundred and eighty feet high called mount kessa which rises perpendicularly from the centre of the stream this rock is greatly venerated by the natives who believe it to be the favourite home of a beneficent genius at Bali, a little above Raba, the brothers received a visit from the king of the dark waters, chief of the island of Zagashi, who appeared in a canoe of great length and unusual cleanliness, decked with scarlet cloth and gold lace. On the same day they reached the town of Zagashi, opposite Raba, and the second Philata town beyond Sakatu. Malam Dendo, chief of Zagashi, was a cousin of Bello, he was a blind and very feeble old man in very bad health who knew he had but a few years longer to reign and his one thought was how best to secure the throne to his son although he had received very costly presents malam dendo was anything but satisfied and declared that if the travellers did not make him other and more valuable gifts he would require their guns pistols and powder before he allowed them to leave zagashi Richard Lander did not know what to do, when the gift of the tobe, or robe, of Mungo Park, which had been restored by the king of Busa, threw Malam Dendo into such ecstasies of joy that he declared himself the protector of the Europeans, promised to do all he could to help them to reach the sea, made them a present of several richly colored plaited mats, two bags of rice, and a bunch of bananas. These stores came just in time for the whole stock of cloth looking-glasses razors and pipes was exhausted and the english had nothing left but a few needles and some silver bracelets as presents for the chiefs on the banks of the niger Raba, says lander seen from zagashi appears to be a large compact clean and well-built town though it is unwalled and is not otherwise fenced it is irregularly built on the slope of a gently rising hill at the foot of which runs the niger and in point of rank population and wealth it is the second city in the Falata dominions sakatu alone being considered as its superior 
it is inhabited by a mixed population of philatas nafians and immigrants and slaves from various countries and is governed by a ruler who exercises sovereign authority over rabbah and its dependencies and is styled sultan or king rabbah is famous for milk oil and honey the market when our messengers were there appeared to be well supplied with bullocks horses mules asses sheep goats and abundance of poultry rice and various sorts of corn cotton cloth indigo saddles and bridles made of red and yellow leather besides shoes boots and sandals were offered for sale in great plenty although we observed about two hundred slaves for sale none had been disposed of when we left the market in the evening Raba is not very famous for the number or variety of its artificers, and yet in the manufacture of mats and sandals it is unrivaled. However, in all other handicrafts, Raba yields to Zagoshi. The industry and love of labor displayed by the people of the latter town were an agreeable surprise in this lazy country. Its inhabitants, who are hospitable and obliging, are protected by the situation of their island against the Falatas they are independent too and recognize no authority but that of the king of the dark waters whom they obey because it is to their interest to do so on the sixteenth october the landers at last started in a wretched canoe for which the king had made them pay a high price with paddles they had stolen because no one would sell them any this was the first time they had been able to embark on the niger without help from the natives they went down the river whose width varies greatly avoiding large towns as much as possible for they had no means of satisfying the extortions of the chiefs no incident of note occurred before ega was reached if we accept a terrible storm which overtook the travellers when unable to land in the marshes bordering the river they had allowed their boat to drift with the current and during which they were all but upset by the hippopotami playing about on the surface of the water all this time the niger flowed in an east-southeast direction now eight now only two miles in width the current was so rapid that the boat went at a rate of four or five miles an hour on the nineteenth october the landers passed the mouth of the kudonia which richard had crossed near cutup on his first expedition and a little later they came in sight of ega the landing place was soon reached by way of a bay encumbered with an immense number of large and heavy canoes full of merchandise with the prows daubed with blood and covered with feathers as charms against thieves the chief to whom the travellers were at once conducted was an old man with a long white beard whose appearance would have been venerable and patriarchal had he not laughed and played in quite a childish manner the natives assembled in hundreds to see the strange-looking visitors, and the latter had to place three men as sentinels outside their door to keep the curious at a distance. Lander says that Benin and Portuguese cloths are sold at Ega by many of its inhabitants, so that it would appear that some kind of communication is kept up between the sea coast and this place. The people are very speculative and enterprising, and numbers of them employ all their time solely in trading up and down the Niger. They live entirely in their canoes, over which they have a shed that answers completely every purpose for which it is intended, so that in their constant peregrinations they have no need of any other dwelling or shelter than that which their canoes afford them their belief says lander that we possessed the power of doing anything we wished was at first amusing enough but their importunities went so far that they became annoying they applied to us for charms to avert wars and other national calamities to make them rich to prevent the crocodiles from carrying off the people and for the chief of the fishermen to catch a canoe load of fish every day each request being accompanied with some sort of present such as country beer gora nuts coconuts lemons yams rice and in quantity proportionate to the value of their request the curiosity of the people to see us is so intense that we dare not stir out of doors and therefore we are compelled to keep our door open all day long for the benefit of the air and the only exercise which we can take is by walking round and round our hut like wild beasts in a cage the people stand gazing at us with visible emotions of amazement and terror we are regarded in fact in just the same light as the fiercest tigers in europe 
if we venture to approach too near the doorway they rush backwards in a state of the greatest alarm and trepidation but when we are at the opposite side of the hut they draw as near as their faces will permit them in silence and caution Ega is a town of vast extent, and its population must be immense. Like all the towns on the banks of the Niger, it is inundated every year. We can but conclude that the natives have their own reasons for building their houses in situations which, in our eyes, are alike so inconvenient and unhealthy. Perhaps it may be because the soil of the surrounding districts consists of a black, greasy mold of extraordinary fertility, supplying all the necessaries of life at the cost of very little trouble although the king of ega looked more than a hundred years old he was very gay and light-hearted the chief people of the town met in his hut and spent whole days in conversation this company of greybeards for they are all old laugh so heartily at the sprightliness of their own wit that it is an invariable practice when any one passes by to stop and listen outside and they add to their noisy merriment so much good will that we hear nothing from the hut in which the aged group are revelling during the day but loud peals of laughter and shouts of applause End quote. One day the old chief wished to show off his accomplishments of singing and dancing, expecting to astonish his visitors. He frisked, said Lander, beneath the burden of five score, and shaking his hoary locks, capered over the ground to the manifest delight of the bystanders, whose plaudits, though confined as they always are to laughter, yet tickled the old man's fancy to that degree that he was unable to keep up his dance any longer without the aid of a crutch with its assistance he hobbled on a little while but his strength failed him he was constrained for the time to give over and he set himself down at our side on the threshold of the hut he would not acknowledge his weakness to us for the world but endeavoured to pant silently and suppress loud breathings that we might not hear him how ridiculous yet how natural is this vanity he made other unavailing attempts to dance and also made an attempt to sing but nature would not second his efforts and his weak piping voice was scarcely audible the dancers singers and musicians continued their noisy mirth till we were weary of looking at and listening to them and as bedtime was drawing near we desired them to depart to the infinite regret of the frivolous but merry old chief End quote. Malam Dendo, however, tried to dissuade the English from continuing the descent of the river. Ega, he said, was the last Nuf town, the power of the Philatas extended no further, and between it and the sea dwelt none but savage and barbarous races, always at war with each other. These rumors and the stories told by the natives to the landers' people of the danger they would run of being murdered or sold as slaves so terrified the latter that they refused to embark, declaring their intention of going back to Cape Coast Castle by the way that they came. Thanks to the firmness of the brothers, this mutiny was quelled, and on the 22nd October the explorers left Ega, firing a parting salute of three musket shots. A few miles further down, a seagull flew over their heads, a sure sign that they were approaching the sea, and with it, it appeared all but certain the end of their wearisome journey. Several small and wretched villages, half under water, and a large town at the foot of a mountain, which looked ready to overwhelm it, the name of which the travelers could not learn, were passed in succession. They met a great number of canoes built like those on the Bonnie and Calabar rivers. The crews stared in astonishment at the white men who they dared not address. The low marshy banks of the Niger were now gradually exchanged for loftier, richer, and more fertile districts. Kakunda, where the people of Ega had recommended Lander to halt, is on the western bank of the river. From a distance, its appearance is singularly picturesque. The natives were at first alarmed at the appearance of the travelers. An old Malam, acting as Mohammedan priest and schoolmaster, took them under his protection, and, thanks to him, the brothers received a warm welcome in the capital of the independent kingdom of Nuf. The information collected in this town, or rather in this group of four villages, coincided with that obtained at Ega. Richard Lander therefore resolved to make the rest of the voyage by night, and to load his four remaining guns and two pistols with balls and shot. To the great astonishment of the natives, who could not understand such contempt of danger, the explorers left Kakunda with three loud cheers, committing their cause to the hands of God. 
they passed several important towns which they avoided the river now wound a great deal flowing from the south to southeast and then to the southwest between lofty hills on twenty fifth october the english found themselves opposite the mouth of a large river it was the chahada or benu at its junction with the niger is an important town called kutum karafi after a narrow escape from being swallowed up in a whirlpool and crushed against the rocks lander having found a suitable spot showing signs of habitation determined to land that this place had been visited a little time previously was proved by two burnt-out fires with some broken calabashes fragments of earthenware vessels, coconut shells, staves of powder barrels, etc., which the travelers picked up with some emotion, for they proved that the natives had had dealings with Europeans. Some women ran away out of the village, which three of the lander's men entered with a view to get the materials for a fire. The exhausted explorers were resting on mats when they were suddenly surrounded by a crowd of half-naked men armed with guns, bows and arrows, cutlasses, iron barbs, and spears. The coolness and presence of mind of the brothers alone averted a struggle, the issue of which could not be dubious. As we approached, says Lander, we made all the signs and motions we could with our arms to deter the chief and his people from firing on us. His quiver was dangling at his side, his bow was bent, and an arrow which was pointed at our breasts already trembled on the string, when we were within a few yards of his person. This was a highly critical moment. The next might be our last. But the hand of providence averted the blow, for just as the chief was about to pull the fatal cord, a man that was nearest him rushed forward and stayed his arm. At that instant we stood before him, and immediately held forth our hands. All of them trembled like aspen leaves. The chief looked up full in our faces, kneeling on the ground. Light seemed to flash from his dark rolling eyes. His body was convulsed all over, as though he were enduring the utmost torture, and with a timorous yet undefinable expression of countenance, in which all the passions of our nature were strangely blended, he drooped his head, eagerly grasped our proffered hands, and burst into tears. This was a sign of friendship. Harmony followed, and war and bloodshed were thought of no more. It was happy for us that our white faces and calm behavior produced the effect it did on these people. In another minute, our bodies would have been as full of arrows as a porcupine's is full of quills. I thought you were children of heaven fallen from the skies, said the chief, in explanation of this sudden change. End quote. This scene took place in the famous market town of Bokwa, of which the travelers had so often heard, whither the people come up from the coast to exchange the merchandise of the whites for slaves brought in large numbers from Funda on the opposite bank. The information obtained at Bokwa was most satisfactory. The sea was only ten days' journey off. There was no danger of going down the river, the chief said, though the people on the banks were a bad lot. End of section 15Section 16 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. The Great Explorers and Travelers of the Nineteenth Century by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 2, Part 2. The Exploration and Colonization of Africa. 9. Following the advice of this chief, the travelers passed the fine town of Atta without stopping and halted at Abagaka, where the river divides into several branches and whose chief showed insatiable greed. Refusing to halt at several villages whose inhabitants begged for a sight of the white strangers, they were finally obliged to land at the village of Demugo, where a little man wearing a waistcoat, which had once formed part of a uniform, hailed them in English, crying out, Halloa, ho! You English, come here! He was an emissary from the king of Bonnie, come to buy slaves for the master. The chief of Demugo, who had never before seen white men, received the explorers very kindly, held public rejoicings in their honor, and detained them with constant fetes until the 4th November. 
although the fetish consulted by him presaged that they would meet with a thousand dangers before reaching the sea this monarch supplied them with an extra canoe some rowers and a guide the sinister predictions of the fetish were soon fulfilled john and richard lander were embarked in different boats as they passed a large town called Curie, they were stopped by war canoes, each containing forty men wearing European clothes, minus the trousers. Each canoe carried what at first sight appeared to be the Union Jack flying from a long bamboo cane fixed in the stern. A four- or six-pounder was lashed to each prow, and every black sailor was provided with a musket. The two brothers were taken to Kiri, where a palaver was held upon their fate. Fortunately, the Malams, or Mohammedan priests, interfered in their favor, and some of their property was restored to them, but the best part had gone to the bottom of the river with John Lander's canoe. To my great satisfaction, says Lander, I immediately recognized the box containing our books and one of my brother's journals. The medicine chest was by its side, but both were filled with water. A large carpet bag containing all our wearing apparel was lying cut open and deprived of its contents with the exception of a shirt, a pair of trousers, and a waistcoat. Many valuable articles which it had contained were gone. The whole of my journal, with the exception of a notebook with remarks from Raba to this place, was lost. Four guns, one of which had been the property of the late Mr. Park, four cutlasses, and two pistols were gone nine elephants tusks the finest i had seen in the country which had been given to us by the kings of wow wow and busa a quantity of ostrich feathers some handsome leopard skins a great variety of seeds all our buttons cowries and needles which were necessary for us to purchase provisions with all were missing and said to have been sunk in the river this was like going down in port after crossing Africa from Badagery to Busa, escaping all the dangers of navigating the Niger, getting free from the hands of so many rapacious chiefs, to be shipwrecked six days' journey from the sea, to be made slaves of or condemned to death just on the eve of making known to Europe the results of so many sufferings endured, so many dangers escaped, so many obstacles happily surmounted to have traced the course of the niger from busa to be on the point of determining the exact position of its mouth and then to find themselves stopped by wretched pirates was really too much and bitter indeed were the reflections of the brothers during the interminable palaver upon their fate although their stolen property was partially restored to them and the negro who had begun the attack upon them was condemned to be beheaded the brothers were none the less regarded as prisoners and they were marched off to obi king of the country who would decide what was to be done with them it was evident that the robbers were not natives of the country but had only entered it with a view to pillage they probably counted on trading in two or three such market towns as Kiri, if they did not meet with any boats but such as were too strong to be plundered for the rest all the tribes of this part of the niger seemed to be at daggers drawn with each other and the trade in provisions was carried on under arms after two days row the canoes came in sight of ibo at a spot where the stream divided into three rivers of great width with marshy level banks covered with palm trees an hour later one of the boatmen a native of ebo cried there is my country here fresh difficulties awaited the travellers obi king of ebo a young man with a refined and intelligent countenance received the white men with cordiality his dress which reminded his visitors of that of the king of yoruba was adorned with such a quantity of coral that he might have been called the coral king obi seemed to be affected by the account the english gave of the struggle in which they had lost all their merchandise but the aid he gave them was by no means proportioned to the warmth of the sentiments which he expressed indeed he let them all but die of hunger the ibo people says the narrative like most Africans, are extremely indolent, and cultivate yams, Indian corn, and plantains only. They have abundance of goats and fowls, but few sheep are to be seen, and no bullocks. The city, which has no other name than the Ibo country, is situated on an open plain. It is immensely large, contains a vast population, and is the capital of a kingdom of the same name. 
it has for a series of years been the principal slave mart for native traders from the coast between the bonny and old calabar rivers and for the production of its palm oil it has obtained equal celebrity hundreds of men from the rivers mentioned above come up for the purpose of trade and numbers of them are at present residing in canoes in front of the town most of the oil purchased by englishmen at the bonny and adjacent rivers is brought from thence as are nearly all the slaves which are annually exported from those places by the french spaniards and portuguese it has been told us by many that the ebo people are confirmed anthropophagi and this opinion is more prevalent among the tribes bordering on that kingdom than with the natives of more remote districts End quote from what the travelers could learn it was pretty certain that obi would not let them go without exacting a considerable ransom he may doubtless have been driven to this by the importunity of his favorites but it was more likely the result of the greed of the people of bonnie and brass who quarreled as to which tribe should carry off the english to their country a son of the chief of bonnie king pepper a native named gunn brother of king boy and their father king forday who with king jacket governed the whole of the brass country were the most eager in their demands and produced as proofs of their honorable intentions the testimonials given to them by the european captains with whom they had business relations one of these documents signed james dow captain of the brig susan of liverpool and dated from the most important river of the brass country september eighteen thirty ran thus quote, captain dow states that he never met with a set of greater scoundrels than the natives generally and the pilots in particular End quote. it goes on in a similar strain heaping curses upon the natives and charging them with having endeavored to wreck dow's vessel at the mouth of the river with a view to dividing his property amongst them king jacket was designated as an errant rogue and a desperate thief boy was the only one of common honesty and trustworthiness after an endless palaver obi declared that according to the laws and customs of the country he had a right to look upon the landers and their people as his property but that not wishing to abuse his privileges he would set them free in exchange for the value of twenty slaves in english merchandise this decision which richard lander tried in vain to shake plunged the brothers into the depths of despair a state of mind soon succeeded by an apathy and indifference so complete that they could not have made the faintest effort to recover their liberty add to these mental sufferings the physical weakness to which they were reduced by want of food and we shall have some idea of their state of prostration without resources of any kind robbed of their needles cowries and merchandise they were reduced to the sad necessity of begging their bread but we might as well have addressed our petitions to the stones or trees says lander we might have spared ourselves the mortification of a refusal we never experienced a more stinging sense of our own humbleness and imbecility than on such occasions and never had we greater need of patience and lowliness of spirit in most african towns and villages we had been regarded as demigods and treated in consequence with universal kindness civility and veneration but here alas what a contrast we were classed with the most degraded and despicable of mankind and are become slaves in a land of ignorance and barbarism whose savage natives have treated us with brutality and contempt End quote. It was Boy who finally achieved the rescue of the landers, for he consented to pay the O.B. the ransom he demanded for them and their people. Boy himself was very moderate, asking for nothing in return for his trouble, and the risk he ran in taking the white men to brass, but fifteen bars or fifteen slaves, and a barrel of rum. Although this demand was exorbitant, Lander did not hesitate to write an order on Richard Lake, captain of an English vessel at anchor in Brass River, for thirty-six bars. The king's canoe, on which the brothers embarked on 12th November, carried sixty persons, forty of whom were rowers. It was hollowed out of a single tree trunk, measured more than fifty feet long, carried a four-pounder in the prow, an arsenal of cutlasses and grape-shot, and was laden with merchandise of every kind the vast tracts of cultivated land on either side of the river showed that the population was far more numerous than would have been supposed 
the scenery was flat open and varied and the soil a rich black mold produced luxuriant trees and green shrubs of every shade at seven p m on the eleventh november the canoe left the chief branch of the niger and entered the brass river an hour later richard lander recognized with inexpressible delight tidal waves a little further on boy's canoe came up with those of gunn and forday the latter was a venerable-looking old man in spite of his wretched semi-european semi-native clothing and a very strong predilection for rum of which he consumed a great quantity although his manners and conversation betrayed no signs of excessive drinking that was a strange escort which accompanied the two englishmen as far as the town of brass the canoes says lander were following each other up the river in tolerable order each of them displaying three flags in the first was king boy standing erect and conspicuous his headdress of feathers waving with the movements of his body which had been chalked in various fantastic figures rendered more distinct by its natural color his hands were resting on the barbs of two immense spears which at intervals he darted violently into the bottom of the canoe as if he were in the act of killing some formidable wild animal under his feet in the bows of all the other canoes fetish priests were dancing and performing various extraordinary antics their persons as well as those of the people with them being chalked over in the same manner as that of king boy and to crown the whole mr gunn the little military gentleman was most actively employed his canoe now darting before and now dropping behind the rest adding not a little to the imposing effect of the whole scene by the repeated discharges of his cannon End quote. Brass consists of two towns, one belonging to Forday, the other to King Jacket. The priests performed some curious ceremonies before disembarking, evidently having reference to the whites. Was the result of this consultation of the fetish of the town favorable or not to the visitors? The way the natives treated them would answer that question before he set foot on land richard lander to his great delight recognized a white man on the banks he was the captain of the spanish schooner at anchor in the river the narrative goes on to say quote, of all the wretched filthy and contemptible places in this world of ours none can present to the eye of a stranger so miserable an appearance or can offer such disgusting and loathsome sights as this abominable brass town dogs goats and other animals run about the dirty streets half starved whose hungry looks can only be exceeded by the famishing appearance of the men women and children which bespeaks the penury and wretchedness to which they are reduced whilst the persons of many of them are covered with odious boils and their huts are falling to the ground from neglect and decay another place called pilot town by the europeans on account of the number of pilots living in it is situated at the mouth of the river nun seventy miles from brass king forday demanded four bars before the landers left the town saying it was customary for every white man who came to brass by the river to make that payment it was impossible to evade compliance and lander drew another bill on captain lake at this price richard lander obtained permission to go down in boy's royal canoe to the english brig stationed at the mouth of the river his brother and his servants were not to be set free until the return of the king on his arrival on the brig lander's astonishment and shame was extreme when he found that lake refused to give him any help whatever the instructions given to the brothers from the ministry were read to prove that he was not an impostor but the captain answered quote, if you think that you have a blank fool to deal with you are mistaken i'll not give a blank flint for your bill i would not give a blank for it End quote overwhelmed with grief at such unexpected behavior from a fellow countryman richard lander returned to boy's canoe not knowing to whom to apply and asked his escort to take him to bonny where there were a number of english vessels the king refused to do this and the explorer was obliged to try once more to move the captain begging him to give him at least ten muskets which might possibly satisfy for day i have told you already answered lake that i will not let you have even a flint so bother me no more 
but i have a brother and eight people at brasstown rejoined lander and if you do not intend to pay king boy at least persuade him to bring them here or else he will poison or starve my brother before i get any assistance from a man of war and sell all my people if you can get them on board replied the captain i will take them away but as i have told you before you do not get a flint from me at last lander persuaded boy to go back and fetch his brother and his people the king at first declined to do so without receiving some payment on account and it was only with difficulty that he was induced to forego this command when lake found out that lander's servants were able-bodied men who could replace the sailors he had lost by death or who were down with fever he relented a little this yielding mood did not however last long for he declared that if john and his people did not come in three days he would start without them in vain did richard prove to him beyond a doubt that if he did so the white men would be sold as slaves the captain would not listen to him only answering i can't help it i shall wait no longer such inhumanity as this is fortunately very rare and a wretch who could thus insult those not merely his equals but so much his superiors ought to be pilloried at last on the twenty fourth november after weathering a strong breeze which made the passage of the bar very rough and all but impossible john lander arrived on board he had had to bear a good many reproaches from boy for whom it must be confessed there was some excuse for had he not at his own cost rescued the brothers and their people from slavery brought them down in his own canoe and fed them although very badly all on the strength of their promise to pay him with as much beef and rum as he could consume whereas he was after all roughly received by lake told that his advances would never be refunded and treated as a thief certainly he had cause to complain and any one else would have made his prisoners pay dearly for the disappointment of so many hopes and the loss of so much money for all this however boy brought john lander safely to the brig captain lake received the travellers pretty cordially but declared his intention of making the king go back without so much as an obelus poor boy was full of the most gloomy forebodings his haughty manner was exchanged for an air of deprecating humility an abundant meal was placed before him but he scarcely touched it richard lander disgusted with the stinginess and bad faith of lake and unable to keep his promises ransacked all his possessions and finding at last five silver bracelets and a saber of native manufacture which he had brought from yoreba he offered these to boy who accepted them finally the king screwed up courage enough to make his demand to the captain who in a voice of thunder which it was difficult to believe could have come from such a feeble body declined to accede to it enforcing his refusal with a shower of oaths and threats such as made boy who saw moreover that the vessel was ready to sail beat a hasty retreat and hurry off to his canoe thus ended the vicissitudes of the brothers lander's journey they were in some danger in crossing the bar but that was their last they reached fernando po and then the calabar river where they embarked on the caravan for rio janeiro at which port admiral baker then commanding the station got them a passage on board a transport ship on the ninth june they disembarked at portsmouth their first care after sending an account of their journey to lord goderich then colonial secretary was to inform that official of the conduct of captain lake conduct which was of a nature to compromise the credit of the english government orders were at once given by the minister for the payment of the sums agreed upon which were perfectly just and reasonable thus was completed and finally resolved the geographical problem which had for so many centuries occupied the attention of the civilized world and been the subject of so many different conjectures the niger or as the natives called it the jaliba or kuora is not connected with the nile and does not lose itself in the desert sands or in the waters of lake chad it flows in a number of different branches into the ocean on the coast of the gulf of guinea at the point known as cape formosa the entire glory of this discovery foreseen though it was by scientific men belongs to the brothers lander the vast extent of country traversed by the niger between yaori and the sea was completely unknown before their journey 
so soon as the discoveries made by lander became known in england several merchants formed themselves into a company for developing the resources of the new districts in july eighteen thirty two they equipped two steamers the cura and the alberca which under the command of messrs laird oldfield and richard lander appended the niger as far as bakua the results of this commercial expedition were deplorable not only was there absolutely no trade to be carried on with the natives but the crews of the vessels were decimated by fever finally richard lander who had so often gone up and down the river was mortally wounded by the natives on the twenty seventh january eighteen thirty four and died on the morning of fifth february at fernando po to complete our account of the exploration of africa during the period under review we have still to speak of the various surveys of the valley of the nile the most important of which were those by caliaud rusiger and rupel frederick caliaud was born at nance in seventeen eighty seven and arrived in egypt in eighteen fifteen having previously visited holland italy sicily part of greece and european or asiatic turkey where he traded in precious stones his knowledge of geology and mineralogy won for him a cordial reception from mehemet ali who immediately on his arrival commissioned him to explore the course of the nile and the desert this first trip resulted in the discovery of emerald mines at labara mentioned by arab authors which had been abandoned for centuries in the excavations in the mountain caliaud found the lamps crowbars ropes and tools used in working these mines by men in the employ of ptolemy near the quarries the traveller discovered the ruins of a little town which was probably inhabited by the ancient miners to prove the reality of his valuable discovery he took back ten pounds weight of emeralds to mehemet ali another result of this journey was the discovery by the french explorer of the old road from coptus to berenice for the trade of india from september eighteen nineteen to the end of eighteen thirty two caliode accompanied by a former midshipman named latorzek was occupied in exploring all the known oases east of egypt and in tracing the nile to ten degrees north latitude on his first journey he reached wade halfa and for his second trip he made that place his starting point a fortunate accident did much to aid his researches this was the appointment of ismail pacha son of mehemet ali to the command of an expedition to nubia to this expedition caliode attached himself leaving daru in november eighteen twenty caliard arrived on the fifth january in the ensuing year at dongala and reached mount barca in the chagai country where are a vast number of ruins of temples pyramids and other monuments the fact of this district bearing the name of Meroe had given rise to an opinion that in it was situated the ancient capital of ethiopia caliard was enabled to show this to be erroneous the french explorer accompanying ismail pacha in the character of a mineralogist beyond berber on a quest for gold mines arrived at shendi he then went with latorzek to determine the position of the junction of the adbara with the nile and at assur not far from seventeen degrees north latitude he discovered the ruins of an extensive ancient town it was Meroe pressing on in a southerly direction between the fifteenth and sixteen degrees of north latitude caliode next identified the mouth of the bar el abyad or white nile visited the ruins of saba the mouth of the rahad the ancient Astus saba senar the river gologa the fesiol country and the tomat a tributary of the nile finally reaching the singwe country between the two branches of the river caliard was the first explorer to penetrate from the north so near to the equator brown had turned back at sixteen degrees ten minutes bruce at eleven degrees to caliard and latorzek we owe many observations on latitude and longitude some valuable remarks on the variation of the magnetic needle and details of the climate temperature and nature of the soil together with a most interesting collection of animals and botanical specimens lastly the travellers made plans of all the monuments beyond the second cataract the two frenchmen had preluded their discoveries by an excursion to the oasis of Sahua. 
at the end of eighteen nineteen they left fayum with a few companions and entered the libyan desert in fifteen days and after a brush with the arabs they reached sahwa having on their way taken measurements of every part of the temple of jupiter amman and determined as brown had done its exact geographical position a little later a military expedition was sent to this same oasis in which dravetti collected new and very valuable documents supplementing those obtained by caliode and latorzec they afterwards visited successively the oasis of falafre never before explored by a european that of dekel and karg the chief place of the theban oasis the documents collected on this journey were sent to france to the care of m jamard who founded on them his work called voyage à l'oasis de soa a few years later edward rupel devoted seven or eight years to the exploration of nubia senar cordophan and abyssinia in eighteen twenty four he ascended the white nile for more than sixty leagues above its mouth lastly in eighteen thirty six and eighteen thirty eight joseph rusiger superintendent of the austrian mines visited the lower portion of the course of the bar el abid this official journey was followed by the important and successful surveys afterwards made by order of mehemet ali in the same regions End of section sixteen. Section 17 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avaii in November 2014. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3. The Great Explorers and Travelers of the Nineteenth Century by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 3 The Oriental Scientific Movement and American Discoveries. 1. The decipherment of cuneiform inscriptions and the study of Assyrian remains up to 1840. Ancient Iran and the Avesta. The Survey of India and the Study of Hindustani. The exploration and measurement of the Himalaya mountains, the Arabian Peninsula, Syria and Palestine, Central Asia and Alexander von Humboldt, Pike at the sources of the Mississippi, Arkansas and Red River, Major Long's two expeditions, General Cass, Schoolcraft at the sources of the Mississippi, the exploration of New Mexico, archaeological expeditions in Central America, scientific expeditions in Brazil, Spix and Martin, Prince Maximilian of Wied Neuwied, D'Orbigny and American Man. Although the discoveries which we are now to relate are not strictly speaking geographical, they nevertheless throw such a new light on several early civilizations and have done so much to extend the domain of history and ideas that we are compelled to dedicate a few words to them. The reading of cuneiform inscriptions and the decipherment of hieroglyphics are events so important in their results they reveal to us so vast a number of facts hitherto unknown or distorted in the more or less marvellous narratives of the ancient historians Diodorus, Stasius and Herodotus, that it is impossible to pass over scientific discoveries of such value in silence. Thanks to them we form an intimate acquaintance with a whole world, with an extremely advanced civilization with manners, habits, and customs differing essentially from our own. How strange it seems to hold in our hands the accounts of the steward of some great lord or governor of a province, or to read such romances as those of Setna and the Two Brothers, or stories such as that of the Predestined Prince. Those buildings of vast proportions, those superb temples, magnificent hypogea and sculptured obelisks, were once nothing more to us than sumptuous monuments, but now that the inscriptions upon them have been read, they relate to us the life of the kings who built them, 
and the circumstances of their erection. How many names of races not mentioned by Greek historians, how many towns now lost, how many of the smallest details of the religion, art and daily life, as well as of the political and military events of the past, are revealed to us by the hieroglyphic and cuneiform inscriptions. Not only do we now see into the daily life of these ancient peoples, of whom we had formerly but a very superficial knowledge, but we get an idea even of their literature. The day is perhaps not far distant when we shall know as much of the life of the Egyptians in the 18th century before Christ as that of our forefathers in the 7th and 18th century of our own era. Carsten Niebuhr was the first to make and bring to Europe an exact and complete copy of inscriptions at Persepolis in an unknown character. Many attempts had been made to explain them, but all had been vain, until in 1802 Grotefend, the learned Hanoverian philologist, succeeded, by an inspiration of genius, in solving the mystery in which they were enveloped. Truly these cuneiform characters were strange and difficult to decipher. Imagine a collection of nails variously arranged and forming groups horizontally placed. What did these groups signify? Did they represent sounds and articulations, or, like the letters of our alphabet, complete words? Had they the ideographic value of Chinese written characters? What was the language hidden in them? These were the problems to be solved. It appeared probable that the inscriptions brought from Persepolis were written in the language of the ancient Persians, but Rask, Bob, and Lassen had not yet studied the Iranian idioms and proved their affinity with Sanskrit. It would be beyond our province to give an account of the ingenious deductions, the skilful guesses, and the patient groping through which Grotefend finally achieved the recognition of an alphabetic system of writing, and succeeded in separating from certain groups of words what he believed to be the names of Darius and Xerxes, thus attaining the knowledge of several letters, by means of which he made out other words. It is enough for us to say that the key was found by him, and to others was left the task of completing and perfecting his work. More than thirty years passed by, however, before any notable progress was made in these studies. It was our learned fellow countryman Eugène Burnoff who gave them a decided impulse. Turning to account his knowledge of Sanskrit and Zend, he found that the language of the inscriptions of Persepolis was but a Zend dialect used in Bactriana, which was still spoken in the 6th century, and in which the books of Zoroaster were written. Burnoff's pamphlet bears the date 1836. At the same period Lassen, a German scholar of Bonn, came to the same conclusion on the same grounds. The inscriptions already discovered were soon all deciphered, and with the exception of a few signs, on the meaning of which scholars were not quite agreed, the entire alphabet became known. But the foundations alone were laid, the building was still far from finished. The Persepolitan inscriptions appeared to be repeated in three parallel columns. Might not this be a triple version of the same inscription of the three chief languages of the Archimedean Empire, namely the Persian, Median, and Assyrian or Babylonian? This guess proved correct, and owing to the decipherment of one of the inscriptions, a test was obtained, and the same plan was followed as that of Champollion with regard to the Rosetta Stone, on which was the trilingual inscription in Greek, Demotic or Enchorial, and hieroglyphic characters. In the second and third inscriptions were recognized syro chaldee which, like Hebrew, Himyaric, and Arabic, belonged to the Semitic group, and a third idiom to which the name of Medic was given, resembling the dialects of the Turks and Tartars. But it would be presumptuous of us to enlarge upon these researches. That was to be the task of the Danish scholar Vestergaard, of the Frenchmen de Solcy and Oper, and of the Englishmen Morris and Rawlinson, not to mention others less celebrated. We shall have to return to this subject later. 
The knowledge of Sanskrit and the investigation of Brahmanic literature had inaugurated a scientific movement which has gone on ever since with increasing energy. Long before Nineveh and Babylon were known as nations, a vast country called Iran by Orientalists, which included Persia, Afghanistan and Baluchistan, was the scene of an advanced civilization, with which is connected the name of Zoroaster, who was at once a conqueror, a lawgiver and the founder of a religion. The disciples of Zoroaster, persecuted at the time of the Mohammedan conquest and driven from their ancient home, where their mode of worship was still preserved, took refuge under the name of Parsis in the northwest of India. At the end of the last century, the Frenchman Aquetil du Perron brought to Europe an exact copy of the religious books of the Parsis, written in the language of Zoroaster. He translated them, and for sixty years all the savants had found in them the source of all their religious and philological notions of Iran. These books are known under the name of Zend Avesta, a word which compromises the name of the language, Zend, and the title of the book, Avesta. As the knowledge of Sanskrit increased, however, that branch of science required to be studied afresh by the light of the new method. In 1826, the Danish philologist Rask, and later Eugène Bournoff, with his profound knowledge of Sanskrit and by the help of a translation in that language recently discovered in India, turned once more to the study of the Zend. In 1834, Burnoff published a masterly treatise on the Yakna, which marked an epoch. From the resemblance between the archaic Sanskrit and the Zend came the recognition of the common origin of the two languages and the relationship, or rather, the identity of the races who speak them. Originally, the names of the deities, the traditions, the generic appellation, that of Aryan, of the two peoples, are the same, to say nothing of the similarity of their customs. But it is needless to dwell on the importance of this discovery, which has thrown an entirely new light on the infancy of the human race, of which for so many centuries nothing was known. From the close of the 18th century, that is to say from the time when the English first obtained a secure footing in India, the physical study of the country was vigorously carried on, outstripping of course for a time that of ethnology and kindred subjects, which require for their prosecution a more settled country and less exciting times. It must be owned, however, that knowledge of the races of the country to be controlled is as essential to the government as it is to commercial enterprise, and in 1801 Lord Wellesley, as governor for the company, recognizing the importance of securing a good map of the English territories, commissioned Brigadier William Lambton to connect, by means of a trigonometrical survey, the eastern and western banks of the Indus with the observatory of Madras. Lambton was not content with the mere accomplishment of this task. He laid down with precision one arc of the meridian from Cape Comorin to the village of Takur Kera, 15 miles southeast of Elijpur. The amplitude of this are exceeded 12 degrees. With the aid of competent officers, amongst whom we must mention Colonel Everest, the government of India would have hailed the completion of the task of its engineers long before 1840, if the successive annexation of new territories had not constantly added to the extent of ground to be covered. At about the same time with this progress in our knowledge of the geography of India, an impulse was given to the study of the literature of India. In 1776, an extract from the most important native codes, then for the first time translated under the title of the Code of the Gentoos, was published in London. Footnote. Gentu was the name given by old English writers to the natives of Hindustan, and is now obsolete, having been superseded by that of Hindu. End of footnote. Nine years later, the Asiatic Society was founded in Calcutta by Sir William Jones, the first who thoroughly mastered the Sanskrit language. 
in Asiatic Researches, published by this society, were collected the results of all scientific investigations relating to India. In 1789, Jones published his translation of the drama of Sakuntala, that charming specimen of Hindu literature, so full of feeling and refinement. Sanskrit grammars and dictionaries were now multiplied, and a regular rivalry was set on foot in British India, which would undoubtedly soon have spread to Europe, had not the continental blockade prevented the introduction of works published abroad. At this time an Englishman named Hamilton, a prisoner of war in Paris, studied the oriental manuscripts in the library of the French capital, and taught Frederick Schlegel the rudiments of Sanskrit, which it was no longer necessary to go to India to learn. Lassen was Schlegel's pupil, and together they studied the literature and antiquities of India, examining, translating, and publishing the original texts, whilst at the same time Franz Bopp devoted himself to the study of the language, making his grammars accessible to all, and coming to the conclusion, which was then startling, although it is now generally accepted, of the common origin of the Indo-European languages. It was proved that the Vedas, that collection of sacred writings held in too universal veneration to be tempered with, were written in a very ancient and very pure idiom which had not been revived, and whose close resemblance with the Zend put back the date of the composition of the books beyond the time of the separation of the Aryan family into two branches. The Mahabharata and the Ramayana, dating from the Brahminical or the period succeeding that of the Vedas, were next studied, together with the Puranas. Owing to a profounder knowledge of the language and a more intimate acquaintance with the mythology of the Hindus, scholars were able to fix approximately the date of the composition of these poems, to ascertain the numberless interpolations, and to extract everything of actual historical or geographical value from those marvellous allegories. The result of these patient and minute investigations was a conviction that the Celtic, Greek, Latin, Germanic, Slave and Persian languages had one common parent, and that parent none other than Sanskrit. If, then, their language was the same, it followed as a matter of course that the people had also been identical. The differences now existing between these various idioms are accounted for by the successive breakings up of the primitive people, approximate dates enable us to realize the greater or less affinity of those languages with the Sanskrit, and the nature of the words which they have borrowed from it, words corresponding by their nature to the different degrees of advance in civilization. Moreover, a very clear and definite notion was obtained of the kind of life led by the founders of the Indo-European race, and the changes brought about in it by the progress of civilization. The Vedas give us a picture of the Aryan race before it migrated to India, and occupied the Punjab and Kabulistan. By the aid of these poems we can look on at struggles against the primitive races of Hindustan, whose resistance was all the more desperate in that the conqueror, of their caste divisions, left them only the lowest and most degraded. Thanks to the Vedas, we can realize every detail of the pastoral and patriarchal life of the Aryans, a life so domestic and unruffled that we mentally ask ourselves whether the eager strife of the modern peoples is not a poor exchange for the peaceful existence which their few wants secured to their forefathers. We cannot dwell longer on this subject, but a little that we have said will be enough to show the reader the importance to history, ethnography and philology of the study of Sanskrit. For further details we refer him to the special works of Orientalists and to the excellent historical manuals of Robiou, Lenormand and Maspero. All the scientific results of whatever kind obtained up to 1820 are also skillfully and impartially summed up in Walter Hamilton's large work, A Geographical, Statistical and Historical Description of Hindustan and the Neighboring Countries. This is a book which, by recording the various stages of scientific progress, 
marks with accuracy the point reached at any given epoch. End of section 17「Section 18 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3 」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in November 2014. « Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 3, The Great Explorers and Travelers of the Nineteenth Century, by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 3, The Oriental Scientific Movement and American Discoveries, 2. After this brief review of the labors of scholars in reference to the intellectual and social life of the Hindus, we must turn to those studies whose aim was a knowledge of the physical character of the country. One of the most surprising results obtained by the travels of Webb and Moorcroft was the extraordinary height attributed by them to the Himalaya mountains. According to them, their elevation exceeded that of the loftiest summits of the Andes. Colonel Colebrook had estimated the average height of the chain at 22,000 feet, and even this would appear to be less than the reality. Webb measured Yamunavatri, one of the most remarkable peaks of the chain, and estimated its height above the level of the plateau from which it raises as 20,000 feet, whilst the plateau in its turn is 5,000 feet above the plain. Not satisfied, however, with what he looked upon as too perfunctory an estimate, he measured, with all possible mathematical accuracy, the Devalagiri, or White Mountain, and ascertained its height to be no less than 27,500 feet. The most remarkable feature of the Himalaya chain is the succession of these mountains, the ranges of heights rising one above the other. This gives a far more vivid impression of their loftiness than would one isolated peak rising from a plain and with its head lost among the clouds. The calculations of Webb and Colebrook were soon verified by the mathematical observations of Colonel Crawford, who measured eight of the highest peaks of the Himalayas. According to him, the loftiest of all was Tumulari, situated near the frontiers of Bhutan and Tibet, which attains to a height of 30,000 feet above the sea level. Results such as these, confirmed by the agreement of so many observers who could not surely all be wrong, took the scientific world by surprise. The chief objection urged was the fact that the snow line must in these districts be something like 30,000 feet above the sea level. It appeared, therefore, impossible to believe the assertion of all the explorers that the Himalayas were covered with forests of gigantic pines. Finally, however, actual personal observation upset theory. In a second journey, Webb climbed the Niti Ghat, the loftiest peak in the world, the height of which he fixed at 16,814 feet, and not only did he find no snow, but even the rocks rising 300 feet above it were quite free from snow in summer. Moreover, the steep sides, where breathing was difficult, were clothed with magnificent forests of tapering pines and firs and wide-spreading cypress and cedar trees. The high limits of perpetual snow on the Himalaya mountains, says Despro Cooley, are justly ascribed by Mr. Webb to the great elevation of the tableland or terrace from which these mountain peaks spring, as the heat of our atmosphere is derived chiefly from the radiation of the Earth's surface, it follows that the temperature of any elevated point must be modified in a very important degree by the proximity and extent of the surrounding plains. These observations seem satisfactorily to refute the objections made by certain savants respecting the great height of the Himalaya mountains, which may be, therefore, safely pronounced to be the loftiest mountain chain on the surface of the globe. We must now refer briefly to an expedition in the latitudes already visited by Webb and Moorcroft. 
the traveller Fraser, with neither the necessary instruments nor knowledge for measuring the lofty peaks he ascended, was endowed with a great power of observation, and his account of his journey is full of interest, and here and there very amusing. He visited the source of the Jumna, and, at a height of more than 25,000 feet, he found numerous villages picturesquely perched on slopes carpeted with snow. He then made his way to Gangutri, in spite of the opposition of his guides, who represented the road thither as extremely dangerous, declaring that it was swept by a pestilential wind which would deprive any traveller who ventured to expose himself to it of his senses. The explorer, however, was more than rewarded for all his dangers and fatigues by the enjoyment he derived from the grandeur and magnificence of the views he obtained. There is that, says Despero Cooley in reference to Fraser's journey, in the appearance of the Himalaya range, which every person who has seen them will allow to be peculiarly their own. No other mountains that I have ever seen bear any resemblance to their character, their summits shoot in the most fantastic and spiriting peaks to a height that astonishes, and, when viewed from an elevated situation, almost induce the belief of an ocular deception. We must now leave the peninsula of the Ganges for that of Arabia, where we have to record the result of several interesting journeys. That of Captain Sadler of the Indian Army claims the first rank. Sent by the governor of Bombay in 1819, on an embassy to Ibrahim Pasha, who was then at war with the Mahabis, that officer crossed the entire peninsula from Port el Katif on the Persian Gulf to Yambo on the Red Sea. Unfortunately, the interesting account of this crossing of Arabia, never before accomplished by a European, has not been separately published, but is buried in a book which it is almost impossible to obtain, The Transactions of the Literary Society of Bombay. At about the same time, 1821 through 1826, the English government commissioned Captains Moresby and Haynes of the Naval Service to make hydrographical surveys, with a view to obtaining a complete chart of the coasts of Arabia. These surveys were to be the foundation of the first trustworthy map of the Arabian Peninsula. We have now only to mention the two expeditions of the French naturalists Oche Iloy in the country of Oman and Emil Botta in Yemen, and to refer to the labours in reference to the idioms and antiquities of Arabia of the French consul at Jeddah, Fulgence Fresnel. He was the first, in his letters on the history of the Arabs before Islamism, published in 1836, to explain the Himyarite or Homeric language and to recognize that it resembles rather the early Hebrew and Syriac dialects than the Arabic of the present day. At the beginning of this volume we spoke of the explorations and archaeological and historical researches of Seetzen and Burckhardt in Syria and Palestine. We have still to say a few words on an expedition the results of which were entirely geographical. We refer to the journey of the Bavarian naturalist Heinrich Schubert. Schubert was a devout Catholic and an enthusiastic student, and the melancholy scenery of the Holy Land with its wonderful legends and the lovely banks of the mysterious Nile with its historic memories had for him an extraordinary fascination. In his account of his journey, we find the deep impressions of the believer combined with the scientific observations of the naturalist. In 1837, Schubert, having crossed Lower Egypt and the peninsula of Sinai, entered the Holy Land. The learned Bavarian pilgrim was accompanied by two friends, Dr. Erdl and Martin Bernatz, a painter. The travellers landed at al akaba on the Red Sea and went with a small Arab caravan to El Khalil, the ancient Hebron. The route they followed had never before been trodden by a European. It led through a wide, flat valley terminating at the Dead Sea, a valley through which the waters of the Dead Sea were supposed at one time to have flowed towards the Red Sea. 
This hypothesis was shared by Burckhardt and many others who had only seen the district from a distance, and who attributed the cessation of the drainage to an upheaval of the soil. The heights, as taken by the travellers, showed this hypothesis to be altogether erroneous. In fact, from the lower end of the Persian Gulf, the country presents a continuous ascent for two or three days' march to the point called by the Arabs the Saddle, from thence it begins to sink and slopes down towards the Dead Sea. The saddle is about 2,100 feet above the sea level, at least that was the estimate given a year later by Count Bertou, a Frenchman who visited those localities at that time. On their way down to the bituminous lake, Schubert and his companions took some other barometrical observations, and were very much surprised to find their instrument marking 91 feet below the Red Sea, the levels gradually decreasing in height as they advanced. At first they thought there must be some mistake, but finally the evidence was too strong for them, and it became proved beyond a doubt that the Dead Sea could never have emptied its waters into the Red Sea, for the very excellent reason that the level of the former is very much lower than that of the latter. The depression of the Dead Sea is very much more noticeable when Jericho is approached from Jerusalem. In that case, the way lies through a long valley with a very rapid slope, all the more remarkable as the hilly plains of Judea, Perea, and El Haran are very lofty, the latter rising to a height of nearly 3,000 feet above the sea level. The appearance of the country and the testimony of the instruments were in such contradiction to the prevalent belief that Messrs. Erdl and Schubert were very unwilling to accept the results obtained, which they attributed to their barometer being out of order and to a sudden disturbance of the atmosphere. But on their way back to Jerusalem, the barometer returned to the mean height it had registered before they had started for Jericho. There was nothing for it then but to admit, whether they liked it or not, that the Dead Sea was at least 600 feet below the level of the Mediterranean, an estimate, as later researches showed, which fell one half short of the truth. This, it will be admitted, was a fortunate rectification, which would have considerable influence, by calling the attention of savants to a phenomenon which was soon to be verified by other explorers. At the same time, the survey of the basin of the Dead Sea was completed and rectified. In 1838, two American missionaries, Edward Robinson and Eli Smith, gave quite a new impulse to biblical geography. They were the forerunners of that phalanx of naturalists, historians, archaeologists and engineers who, under the patronage or in conjunction with the English Exploration Society, were soon to explore the land of the patriarchs from end to end, making maps of it, and achieving discoveries which threw a new light on the history of the ancient peoples, who, by turns, were possessors of this corner of the Mediterranean basin. But it was not only the Holy Land, so interesting on account of the many associations it has for every Christian, which was the scene of the researches of scholars and explorers. Asia Minor was also soon to yield up her treasures to the curiosity of the learned world. That country was visited by travellers in every direction. Parot visited Armenia, Dubois de Montpereux traversed the Caucasus in 1839. In 1825 and 26, Eichwald explored the shores of the Caspian Sea, and lastly, Alexander von Humboldt, at the expense of the generous Nicholas, Emperor of Russia, supplemented his intrepid work as a discoverer in the New World by an exploration of Western Asia and the Ural Mountains. Accompanied by the mineralogist Gustave Rose, the naturalist Ehrenberg, well known for his travels in Upper Egypt and Nubia, and Baron von Helmersen, an officer of engineers, Humboldt travelled through Siberia, visited the gold and platinum mines of the Ural Mountains, and explored the Caspian steppes and the Altai chain to the frontiers of China. These learned men divided the work. 
Humboldt taking astronomical, magnetic and physical observations and examining the flora and fauna of the country, while Rose kept the journal of the expedition, which he published in German between 1837 and 1842. Although the explorers travelled very rapidly, at the rate of no less than 11,500 miles in nine months, the scientific results of their journey were considerable. In a first publication which appeared in Paris in 1838, Humboldt treated only the climatology and geology of Asia, but this fragmentary account was succeeded in 1843 by his great work called Central Asia. In this, says La Roquette, he has laid down and systemized the principal scientific results of his expedition in Asia, and has recorded some ingenuous speculation as to the shape of the continents and the configuration of the mountains of Tartary, giving special attention to the vast depression which stretches from the north of Europe to the center of Asia beyond the Caspian Sea and the Ural River. End of section 18